A Highland Sailor. Highland Heartbeats Book 6. By Aileen Adams. Chapter 1. Brock paused in the act of folding a fresh tunic, holding his breath to hear better the row which was beginning to pick up in another room. If the newlywed McInneses didn't stop their bickering, the trip to Thrushwood would never commence. Marjorie's plaintive cry rang out. But I need to go. I keep telling you, there's no other way. Darling. Don't darling me, Derek McInnes. You always say that when you're trying to placate me, and I am in no mood to be placated. I know better than to even attempt to placate you, lass. 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 That is even worse. The crash which came after set Brock's teeth on edge, though he couldn't help but chuckle. Marjorie McInnes was a fine woman, but sometimes more than Derek could handle quietly. Brock wondered what she'd chosen to hurl at her husband. Likely whatever was closest at hand, as she was confined to the bed. The shouting stopped at that point, which Brock knew meant one of two things. They were either making up and apologizing for making fools of themselves, or Marjorie was vomiting. Based upon the morning sickness which had recently taken hold of her, he was ready to bet on the latter. It was a tragic twist of fate, to be sure. The three of them had been preparing for the journey to Thrushwood for more than a fortnight. Marjorie had champed at the bit the entire time, eager to see her sister again. Almost frustratingly eager. But Brock could understand, and therefore had allowed her to carry on. Beatrice was alone, an unprotected woman on a farm which didn't seem to be easily accessible by more than a few neighbours. And Beatrice had no idea whether Marjorie had even survived the journey to London, where she had not landed, but instead, the Scottish harbour village of Kirkcaldy, much less that she'd wed Derek McInnes and fallen pregnant since. The pregnancy had been a surprise none of them had prepared for. Brock would never forget how stunned his longtime friend had been on hearing the announcement that he was going to become a father. They'd only been married for a month at the time, and mere days away from setting out for England. All joking about the level of ardour he felt for his wife aside, the rest of the Duncans and those who'd pledged their loyalty to the clan had expressed joyful surprise on hearing the happy news. So had Brock. If Derek was pleased, so was he. Until Marjorie had begun becoming violently ill every morning. Only the illness didn't pass once the morning had, but instead extended itself throughout the day. This was what made Heather and Sarah, wives of the Duncan brothers, first take note of there being a complication. The babe should be fine, Sarah, a skilled healer experienced in midwifery and with a child of her own, had assured Derek time and again. It isn't unusual for a woman to experience this type of sickness in the early stages of carrying a child. In fact, she had trailed off, biting her lip. In fact what he pressed. She was accustomed enough to the fiery, unpredictable nature of Highland men to weigh her words carefully, Brock noted. In fact, in some cases, severe illness extends throughout the course of the pregnancy. It isn't common, but it is possible. Did you go through this? Derek had demanded. Brock had only seen Derek like this on a small number of occasions. Before meeting Marjorie, his worst moods had to do with unforeseen storms while his ships were at sea or setbacks with a major shipment. Now, his worries all had to do with morning sickness and setting up a house for his wife. Sarah had shaken her head. Not to this extent, no. Nor did Heather. And Alice is regularly spotted out and about, Derek had added in a tight voice, referring to McKay's wife who was five months into her time, and busier than ever, involved in tending her gardens and participating in work in the manor house. She is. I'm sorry. This is simply the way it happens sometimes. But not to worry, Sarah had urged him, patting his shoulder with a sympathetic sigh. She is a young, healthy woman, and the babe is fine. That had seemed to settle Derek's nerves. But not Marjorie's. What does this mean? she demanded, looking around the room. Her skin was a strange greenish tinge, and she looked as though she might be ill at any moment. The windows in the set of rooms which she shared with Derek 
rooms the Duncan wives had insisted they take in order to keep Marjorie close at hand, were flung open to air the space out after her repeated retching. Her husband had winced, eyes sweeping from one ally to another. None of them, Brock included, had felt as though it was their place to speak. Derek McInnes had married the stubborn, fiery woman. It was up to him to break the news. I'm sorry, lass, but it means you won't be able to go with us to bring Beatrice back. And the war had begun. It was absurd, all of it. Marjorie was foolish to insist she was well enough to take the trip. She could hardly get out of bed, and barely went half the day without losing the contents of her stomach. Much of Sarah's and the cook's time was spent making nutritious, soothing broths, which would still deliver what mother and child needed for their health, while ideally settling Marjorie's stomach. If she were to go with them, she wouldn't make it more than a day or two. The child would certainly suffer and eventually die. It only made sense for her to stay home. Brock could never say these things aloud to Derek. He didn't need to, either. His friend was well aware of what hung in the balance of the trip and his wife's pregnancy, and the stress this put him under left his forehead permanently creased in deep frown lines. A knock at the open door to his room garnered Brock's attention. Hugh McInnes was there, with a rueful smile so like his twin brother's. It's going well in there, eh? By far one of their more interesting fights, Brock observed, shaking his head. How she has the strength to put up such an argument is beyond me, beyond everyone, Hugh murmured as he entered the room. Brock wondered if he kept his voice low for the sake of discretion, or if he was afraid his sister-in-law might overhear. She wasn't exactly behaving rationally, and none of them wanted to be at the receiving end of her ire. I think there's only one reasonable answer to this problem. Hugh glanced at the canvas bag which Brock had spread out on the bed prior to packing. What's that? I'll go with you instead. The three of us will go on one last adventure before Derek settles down to a life of domestic boredom. Brock snorted. I didn't think your life was so boring. It hasn't changed as much as Derek's now that he won't be actively involved in his business anymore. I'm still in the Laird's service. I haven't changed much since marrying Dalla. You're better kept than you were when we first met. You're clean-shaven for one, and you no longer stink like an unmucked horse stall. I'd also been travelling and sleeping out of doors for days when we first met. He laughed. Just the same. I'm sure you've improved. As has your brother. And I'm certain he'd enjoy the voyage if it weren't for his concern over Marjorie and the babe. Hugh's eyes darkened, his smile faded. Of course. Perhaps he shouldn't come along at all. Oh, is that what you think? They both turned in surprise at the silent entrance of Derek himself, who stood glowering at the two of them with arms folded across his chest. Brock had seen him like this before, when a merchant was clearly trying to cheat him. We didn't realize your fight had ended. Hugh grinned. Or else you wouldn't have been talking about me. At least, not with the door wide open. Don't take it out on us, Brock warned. He felt for his friend, truly, but domestic squabbles were not something he'd signed on for when he'd originally taken his place as Derek's first mate. They had learned to work together, had taken their time in feeling out the other's habits and personal quirks, and Derek was difficult enough to deal with on a good day. After having the sawdust knocked out of him by his sharp-tongued wife, he was even more of a challenge. We weren't sitting around the fire with our knitting whispering and laughing over you, Brock pointed out. We were merely discussing whether it was a good course of action for you to come with us. Perhaps it's best you stay here with Marjorie. Your brother and I know you well enough to know you'll eat your heart out with worry over her and the child. It seems cruel to take you away from her now. Marjorie has already tasked me with protecting her sister, he argued, or else I might take you up on your offer. We just had it out, as you well know. Hugh and Brock exchanged a glance. Derek cleared his throat with a sharp look in his eye before continuing. If she can't make the trip, she insists I go. This is no reflection on you, he added, looking at Brock. I take no offence. She feels that if her sister's husband arrives to fetch her, 
Beatrice will be more likely to agree to the journey. I suppose we need to put ourselves in the lass's shoes, strange men from a strange country, insisting they have nothing but her best interests at heart. Would you come along with us if you were a young, inexperienced lass? Remember how ill-prepared Marjorie was to face the realities of life when we first met her. She'd hardly ever held a conversation with more than two men, and one of them a man of God. Brock looked down at himself then at his friends. They looked rough because they were rough. Men who lived their lives outdoors, who made it their business to conquer all nature placed in their path. I see the point. What if she writes a message for us to give to the lass? She can explain herself in it. What other reason would there be for any of us to carry a letter from Marjorie? She's already written to Beatrice in hopes we'll take the message along with us. I hope it's enough to convince my sister-in-law to join us or else we'll have made the trip for naught. Could it wait until after the babe comes? Hugh suggested. Derek sighed heavily, which Brock knew meant he'd considered this and had been promptly turned down. Nay, and I do understand the logic. Beatrice is alone, unprotected. And it's like as not she believes by now that her sister is dead or came to some unfortunate end. Let's not forget how easy it would have been for just such a thing to happen. It was true. Had Derek and Brock not arrived in Kirkcaldy at the same time as the ship on which Marjorie had stowed away, she would have faced a rather grim future. Derek had come between her and certain tragedy more than once before convincing her to leave the village and return to Duncan Lands with them. The longer we wait, the worse it is, Derek surmised. And there's no telling what she's facing all alone. A single woman holding down a farm. Frankly, he added, lowering his voice, if the farm is still in her hands I'll be deeply surprised. But Marjorie has assured me time and again that for all her stubbornness, her sister is ten times more stubborn and sharp as a newly forged Dirk. More stubborn than Marjorie? Brock asked, rubbing his chin with a rueful smirk. I'll remind you, sir, that you're speaking of my wife. The gleam in Derek's eye gave away his mirth. Brock knew he could get away with making such comments because of the unspoken understanding between them. He'd laid down his life for Marjorie, in spite of the rather rocky start they'd gotten off to. Any dislike he'd ever held for her had stemmed from his own frustration at wanting to move on from Kirkcaldy. Derek had lingered for days in the village thanks to her, and Brock had resented the inaction. But he'd never truly resented the lass who, when she wasn't behaving in an utterly irrational manner, was a good, true, loyal woman. A fitting match for Derek, who was one of the finest men Brock had ever known. What do you think of my idea? Q asked. Coming along with you too. I think we could use all the help we can get, once we're out on the open sea. There was no missing the edge of excitement in Derek's voice when he described it. He would miss the freedom of it, Brock knew, though the trade-off was worthwhile in his eyes. It left Brock wondering how many men left behind that which made them feel free and alive, in favour of domestic life. And how many of those men ever lived to regret it. Had he been a praying man, he would have prayed that this not be the fate of his friend. Even though I'm hardly as skilled as either of the two of you. Hugh grinned. We'll leave you below to care for the horses, Brock suggested with a wink in Derek's direction. Hugh's jaw clenched. Any little thing I can do, he muttered. The three of them burst into laughter, and Brock thought it would be a most enjoyable trip indeed. If only they were going anywhere else in the world but Thrushwood. Chapter 2 The first rays of golden late spring light were stretching and unfurling themselves over the horizon, when Brock, Derek and Hugh exited the Duncan Manor House the following morning. It was a beautiful morning which promised to extend into a beautiful day, and Brock was glad for it as he surveyed the landscape. In all directions as far as the eye could see there stretched the colour green, dotted in some places by the blue of running water reflecting the sky, or the riotous splashes of colour indicating fields of heather or wildflowers. So long as the weather held out over the following days, during which they'd make their way to the coast to meet up with the ship which awaited them, Brock didn't care if it rained all throughout the sailing. He loved sailing in the rain. 
He did not, however, enjoy sleeping in the rain or riding astride a gelding which couldn't travel at more than a slow crawl thanks to thick sucking mud which Scotland seemed to entirely turn into after a dose of wet weather. The others said goodbye to their loved ones. Hugh and Dalla, still aglow after the better part of a year of marriage, stared longingly into each other's eyes. For a couple whose beginning was as rough as theirs, with Hugh purchasing Dalla from the man who'd kidnapped her and a group of other women, they made a good match. Hugh then clasped the hand of his closest friend, Mackay, whose wife stood by his side to bid the men goodbye. Sarah had suggested Alice might be carrying twins, she was so heavily pregnant at only halfway through. Brock knew nothing of such things, but even he had to wonder how she would be able to walk once a few more months passed. Her pressed her hands to her back, her mouth twisted in a thin line of discomfort for a fleeting moment before she extended best wishes to the travellers. Sarah held her daughter in one arm as she kissed Hugh's cheek, then Derek's. She went to Brock last, smiling widely as she handed over the satchel full of fresh healing tonics, poultices and tinctures, which she created especially for their journey. Keep these two in line, would you? Sometimes I think you're the only one of them with any sense, she whispered, her eyes sparkling. The babe, a wee lass named after Derek and Hugh's mother, smiled and cooed as though she understood her mother's joking. He cleared his throat, pleased beyond measure and uncertain why. Sarah was the sort of lass who commanded respect and attention. She was no nonsense, hardly the giggly, wide-eyed, simpering type. He had no patience with lasses of that ilk. But Sarah was something else entirely. And it warmed him throughout to know that she held him in high esteem. He didn't know until then that he craved her respect almost as much as that of her husband, Laird of the Duncan clan. But then, they all were solid, honest lasses, all of the women who'd come under the protection of the Duncans. Heather, Sarah's younger sister, waved goodbye from the doorway, while the infant against one shoulder bawled his protests. She assisted her sister in keeping the villagers healthy, and had been the one to first suggest Marjorie live in the manor house while Derek went for Beatrice. That had been another minor war, but Marjorie had quickly assessed how vastly outnumbered she was after her husband Sarah and Heather had surrounded the bed on which she'd rested. Brock had observed from the doorway, keeping his thoughts to himself, he wouldn't have admitted it for anything, but he didn't wish to attract Marjorie's wicked sharp tongue, which had only worsened once her illness had come on. I'll not have you living on your own in the village, Derek had insisted. I would feel much better knowing you were here with us, Sarah had agreed. Either you come here or one of us stays with you at all times, Heather had warned. That had decided Marjorie, who valued the privacy and peace of the little house she'd shared with Derek since their marriage. Most likely, because she'd never had anything that was truly her own, Brock supposed. He understood that feeling all too well. And so, with the blessing of the laird, Marjorie's belongings had been moved to the rooms prepared for her. She had continued to protest, but weakly, until there was clearly no point in arguing any further. The horses stomped and whinnied, anxious to be on their way. Brock understood the sentiment and shared it, but took the time to accept the best wishes of the Duncan brothers before mounting the gelding which would be his to use throughout the journey. Jake and Philip Duncan both looked as though they envied the men about to depart. They were both pleased with their lives, their choices, but they were cut from the same cloth as the rest. They longed for action from time to time. On the other hand, there were nights when Brock was alone in his vast, comfortable bed, one of many signs of the laird's generosity, envying the warm bodies they had the luxury of sleeping beside. It was a matter of compromise. A man could live the entirety of his life alone, free, making his own decisions and answering to no one but himself, but he'd have to accustom himself to being alone during the times when a man didn't want to be alone. The dead of night, in the darkness, with nothing to do but stare up at the canopy above his bed and think. And remember. The three of them rode away on horseback, all of the many supplies they'd need packed and hanging from their saddles or tucked into the bedrolls which sat across the back of the saddles. There would be more loaded onto the ship in the day or two it would take to get things ready for sailing. Tucked into a special pocket sewn into the inside of Derek's tunic, 
for just this purpose, was the letter Marjorie had written her sister. The only way any of them could prove the truth of who they'd claimed to be. Brock cast a look over his shoulder as they made their way from the manor house, his eyes seeking out one particular window. There she was, her hair like a flag which waved behind her in the breeze coming out of the east. He lifted a hand in acknowledgement and saw her nod in reply, but it wasn't him she was hoping to catch the attention of and he knew it. Derek knew it too, but he didn't look back. Brock had overheard the two of them talking before dawn, and while Marjorie had wept and expressed once again how much it pained her to stay behind, Derek had stayed firm. Firmer than he'd been up to that point. He'd all but commanded her to take care of herself and obey Sarah's orders in his absence. It was too painful for Derek to look back and remember what he was leaving behind. Only Sarah's great skill was enough to ease his mind and make the trip possible. Otherwise Brock was certain Derek would never leave. Brock kept his focus on the trail carved into the ground, worn smooth and free of grass after years of hooves and feet having travelled along its length. It was only wide enough for them to ride single file. Hugh took the lead, having the most experience with the terrain, with Derek in the middle. Brock was glad to bring up the rear, even if it meant having to smell what walked in front of him. It didn't matter. He was outside, in the fresh air, even if there were several days of riding horseback ahead of him. He knew what that meant, though he'd spent hours riding in preparation for the journey with the discomfort of the past in mind. He'd still walk bow-legged by the time they stopped to set up camp for the night. I envy you at times like this, Hugh called back, glancing over his shoulder at Brock. Why? Because you don't have anyone to leave behind. He was glad neither of them could see him wince. He knew Hugh meant no harm, but it was a clumsy thing to say nonetheless. He didn't know Brock well enough to throw jabs like that one, didn't know how Brock felt about having no woman of his own. What if he'd suffered disappointment in the past? What if he'd experienced loss, as Hugh had, prior to meeting Dalla? He'd heard the story from Derek of Hugh's first love, how she'd been go red by a boar and died a horrible death. Just because Brock had never told such a story of his own past, didn't mean there was no pain there. Derek spoke up. Brock has never lacked for the company of a woman when he's been in the mood for it. The twins chuckled knowingly. Not much to choose from in the last months, he admitted, more than a little rueful. It had been worse over the winter, with no one but himself to keep him warm during the long frigid nights. There are a number of likely lasses in the village. Don't pretend you didn't notice the looks Millicent gave you every time the two of you crossed paths. Hugh laughed. And don't pretend you didn't notice the way she made it a point to cross paths with you every chance she got. Brock chuckled. He'd noticed all right. The housekeeper's daughter had done little to conceal her interest. It was an interest which he didn't share, however, not that she wasn't a comely girl with a sweet nature. He simply wasn't interested, even in the ways a man could be interested in a woman he otherwise wanted little to do with. She simply didn't inspire his ardour. I'm beginning to worry about you, my friend, Derek joked. If it hadn't been for his anxiousness over the health of his wife and child, Brock would have reminded him that not everyone was as insatiable as he. The evidence was back at the manor house, bedridden for the time being. Brock was a man of few words and always had been. He shrugged with a good-natured grin, and Derek knew enough to let the matter drop. He turned his attention to Hugh, and the two of them launched into memories of their boyhood exploits through the highlands. The relative solitude was welcome. Brock surveyed the trees, thick with leaves and full of the sounds of birds and scampering squirrels. They were welcome, too, a distraction from the disturbing memories which insisted on playing in the back of his mind. The horses are secured, Hugh reported, climbing the ladder which led up from below deck. The last of the supplies had been loaded by a handful of lads Derek had favoured, with a few pence for their service. The tide was high and the wind was calm. The sky, which had looked as though it threatened rain throughout the previous night, had since cleared up to reveal a brilliant sun. After four days of riding, and another of waiting for the ship's preparation, Brock was fairly jumping out of his skin with anticipation. 
This was the part of the trip he'd most looked forward to. There was nothing like being out to sea, riding the waves and standing tall in the face of the wind and salty spray. It was when he felt the most alive. Even as a boy on his father's fishing boat, he'd always dreaded the announcement that it was time return home. To him, home was that boat on the water, not in a cottage so far from shore. His father had understood at least and had encouraged him. When the time had come for him to strike out on his own, there had been little time spent in deciding what to do with the rest of his life. It wasn't even a question as far as Brock was concerned, and he'd already spent far too much time away from the ship's deck. What say you, Captain? Brock asked, looking Derek's way in anticipation of the order to depart. His friend merely smiled. I don't know who you're referring to, seeing as how you're captain now. Remember? Brock warmed at Derek's words, his blood flowing faster than ever. Yes, he was the captain of the ship, just as he was of the other two ships which Derek had left in his care. It was his business, free for him to run as he saw fit once Beatrice was safe in Duncan hands. That had been the final caveat he'd agreed to on his acceptance of Derek's offer. He'd agreed gladly too, as he'd still been wrestling with the guilt over being unable to keep Marjorie out of enemy hands during their journey from Kirkordy. She might have been killed, and all because some villains had snuck up on him and knocked him out cold. The least he could do, he reasoned at the time, was agree to bring her sister to safety. Funny how he hadn't considered that until the moment Derek had reminded him. It was his ship, his command. He raised his chin, looking out over the ship's bow. Let's take her to sea then. Chapter 3 When the rooster crowed its shrill song, Beatrice wondered as she did every morning why she hadn't yet strangled the wretched beast. Be quiet, she moaned, pulling the feather pillow over her head in a pointless attempt to block out the piercing call. Please. Just be quiet. Nothing could hold back the dawn of course. Nothing could hold back the endless amounts of work which constituted her lonely days. It was something to do, anyway. Anything to drive out the constant aching loneliness which pressed in harder and harder as each day progressed. Why did she have to start so early though? It felt as though she'd only just closed her eyes moments ago. Perhaps the beast was confused. Hope sparked in her chest, as she lifted the pillow just enough to peer in the direction of her bedroom window. No. The sun was already on the rise. She tucked the soft thick pillow more firmly around her head and resolved to ignore the burgeoning day. She would go back to sleep and pretend she hadn't heard the rooster's penetrating cry that she had slept through sunrise in complete innocence of the facts. For once, she would rise from her bed feeling well rested and ready to face another day. But then, poor Bess would bellow mournfully in her stall, udders full of milk. Her bawling would upset the chickens, who would run around and fret, and generally cause noisy commotion as a result. Old Cecil would become agitated over this, and a horse of his advanced age didn't need the aggravation. Beatrice squeezed her eyes shut, willing all of this perfectly rational imagery out of her mind so she could go back to sleep. She deserved sleep. Of all the little pleasures of life she'd been denied, sleep was the one whose absence she felt most acutely. It was no use. The animals depended on her, even if no one else did. She couldn't let them down. And so she tossed the pillow to the floor in an attempt to rouse herself. If there was no pillow to block out the light which slowly crept in through the window, there was less chance of her falling asleep again. The same with the thin blanket she used at that time of year, she kicked it off before the sleepy, lazy part of her mind convinced her to pull it over her head. When her feet hit the floor, she was already well awake and determined to face another day. Would there ever come a time when something would happen to her? For her? Something to break up the monotony of life? To break through the ever-present grief which she wore about her like an invisible cloak? Another day without Marjorie. She'd stop counting a few days hence. It didn't seem worthwhile to continue the count, what with each day only increasing her loneliness and the certainty that her sister hadn't lived through the journey to London. 
She splashed her face with cool water from the basin near the window and dried it on the linen strip folded on the surface of her dressing table. What would Marjorie think if she knew how her sister worried? She'd probably laugh herself sick before teasing Beatrice, calling her a silly old woman for allowing fear to get the better of her. But it had been so long. So long with no word from her. Anything could have happened. Beatrice surveyed the fields beyond her window, as she unwound the long dark braid with hints of red and gold over one shoulder and combed it out with her fingers. It was a big unknown world out there. Marjorie might not even have made it to Sillith. Her hands shook as she ran a wide-toothed comb through her tresses. She noted the tremor and chided herself for it. What had become of her? In such a short time, she'd gone from being the mistress of the household and a bit of a nag, her sister's chief complaint, to a trembling frightened old maid. There was work to be done. She squared her shoulders and quickly rewound her braid before slipping out of her nightdress and into one of two everyday kirtles she owned. Both were in need of replacement, worn thin in the elbows and the seat, but there was little she could do about that in the immediate future. What was Marjorie wearing in London? It was easier to imagine her being there, living a vibrant life in a vibrant town. Better than the alternative, that she died weeks earlier. Did Marjorie ever miss the fresh clean air of the farm just after dawn? Beatrice filled her lungs with all the air she could as she walked to the barn, using the footpath that had long since been worn between the house's rear door and the long ramshackle building. It needed work. Everything needed work. But there was no one on the farm to do it. Good morning Bess, she murmured to the tawny cow as she entered the barn. It had once been full of life, every stall occupied. There had been young men on hand to do the milking, to clean the stalls and feed the animals. It was the same with the stables. Theirs had been a thriving enterprise, one her father was proud of. But pride was a sin. Mother had reminded her and Marjorie of this nearly every day of their lives. She'd held up their very father as an example of the sin of pride, of what it could do to an otherwise God-fearing person's life. If Papa hadn't been so proud, hadn't always wanted to expand his land holdings and grow the farm's prosperity, God would not have struck him down. Even as a child, this hadn't made sense to Beatrice. She'd always questioned things, silently, rarely including Marjorie until she was certain her sister was old enough to keep a secret. It made little sense that a man who only wanted to provide a secure future for his daughters would be struck down for it. What was so sinful about working hard and taking pleasure in the results? From what she'd heard in the years after her father's death, mostly from friends such as old Cedric, he'd been a fair man. Modest, kind, generous. He hadn't built wealth for sake of his pride. He wasn't like the nobleman, including the one whose land abutted her own. He hadn't merely bought up all the land around him, in a show of power. And he hadn't forgotten the good of his soul, either. Deacon Eddard had assured the sisters on more than one occasion of their father's godliness, how he had always placed his duty to God above all else. Just slightly above his duty to his family, who were granted to him by God and therefore deserving of the remainder of his devotion. Beatrice sighed over this as she finished milking Bess, who let out a deep moo. Beatrice wondered if this was the cow's way of thanking her for relieving the pressure in her udders. And thank you my friend, she whispered, running a hand over the silky flank. Thank you for the cream and milk and butter. Mother had been wrong. Beatrice was certain of it, more certain every time she remembered all the whispered admonishments and warnings of an eternity spent in hellfire. Papa's sin wasn't pride. If anything, he had worked too hard and compromised his health in order to assure his daughters that they would have enough to their names when it came time to find husbands. What a laughable prospect that was. She chuckled over it as she carried the full milk pail to the house and left it just inside the door before fetching the bucket of dried grain for the chickens and the basket for the eggs. A husband? Where exactly? Perhaps when she reached London. The chicken coop was alive with activity when she stepped through the creaky wooden gate which enclosed the birds. Good morning ladies. She scattered grain over the ground. The half-dozen surviving hens pecked at their meal, 
chattering among themselves as always. She liked the sound, liked feeling as though someone on the farm wasn't painfully lonely. Not like her. The sound of hoofbeats reached her ears as she finished gathering the eggs. Stepping out of the coop, picking straw from her hair, she recognized the deacon on the back of his old gray mare riding up the road. Good morning Deacon Eddard, she called out with a wave. It was nice, seeing another person so early in the day. It didn't take long for her to realize he wasn't smiling. She hurried down the dirt path leading from the yard to the trail leading to the road, and met the horse at her front gate. The man's thin face looked markedly more pinched and sallow than usual, as he gazed down at her from above. As always he wore dark clothing and kept his head covered. She wondered what his graying hair was like underneath. Thin most likely. As the rest of him. Would that I were bringing you better news, my child. His mouth drooped at the corners, as though something was weighing him down. An icy hand closed around her heart and she realized she couldn't breathe. No, it wasn't possible. Not Marjorie, not the only other person she had in the entire world. It was one thing to convince herself of her sister's death, in an effort to prepare herself for what seemed like the inevitable, but another to face it as a fact. Her hands closed around the worn old fence posts as she fought to remain on her feet. When she squeezed, the splintered wood sent a jolt of pain from her palms to her arms and revived her somewhat. No. Not Marjorie. Swallowing back the panic rising in her throat she whispered, What is it? I'm afraid I'm on my way to Cedric Brown's. Word has it, he went to his heavenly reward last night. It wasn't Marjorie. Relief nearly took the knees out from under her, even as her heart ached for the loss of her friend. Marjorie would be crushed. The two of them had become quite close, with her sister looking at the older man as a father figure, in the absence of her own father. I'm so sorry to hear of this, she whispered her voice shaking. The narrowing of the deacon's eyes told her he mistook her deep relief for sorrow. It comes to all of us, my dear. Cedric was a good man, an honest and true servant of the Lord. He is undoubtedly in the heavenly kingdom this very morning. I have no doubt. Her voice was stronger, clearer, even if she had merely rattled off the words she knew he expected her to say. He wasn't there to tell her about Marjorie. Her senses returned. Would you like company on the ride to the mill? No thank you. I understand the miller's daughter has come in from the village, and there is no telling whether she would appreciate the additional company. But I will extend your sympathy to her. Yes please do. Winifred Bowman was a rather unpleasant woman on a good day, the two of them having crossed paths several times. Always going on about her husband and their bakery and their children, then remembering aloud how Beatrice would have no knowledge of such things. As though she needed the reminder of her loneliness and the fact that she was past marriageable age. She'd wondered to herself on these occasions, as she'd ridden home on the back of old Cecil, if Winifred thought the visits between her father and a young unmarried woman were improper. Only a woman with a nasty, cunning mind such as hers would come to such a conclusion. Better Beatrice stay home, for certain. As the deacon lifted his reins about to continue on his way, Beatrice added, If you would please join me for a cup of tea on your return. I'm always grateful for the company. I look forward to it, he assured her before continuing his ride. She sighed heavily, leaning against the fence for another few minutes as the mare and her rider grew smaller and smaller in the distance. Another loss, one which she hadn't imagined hurting as much as it did. Her heart clenched when she called to mind the pleasant hours she'd spent with the miller, sitting in front of his hearth as he'd regaled her with memories of her father. They were young men together, and he seemed to sense her unspoken craving to know more about the father who'd left her far too soon. As unpleasant as Winifred Bowman was, Beatrice was moved to offer up a silent prayer for her sake. They had both lost their father. Except Winifred was a full-grown woman with a husband and two children. Security. And memories of a kind father which didn't need to come by secondhand, through his old friends. What did Beatrice have? She thought it over as she walked to the house, 
no longer in the mood for the morning meal she'd planned to prepare for herself before spotting the deacon's horse on the road. There was nothing but the remnants of what was once a thriving farm. She would never cease expressing gratitude for the roof over her head and the land which was still theirs, even if it went unused. It was still considered prime land, and would have gone for an attractive price had she decided to sell. But she couldn't. It would mean letting go of the last bit of her father and her family. And there was no telling how Marjorie would feel about it. Imagine finding out one's land was sold out from beneath them. Even though Beatrice would share the proceeds evenly, it would feel as though she'd stolen something from her sister. And there were no buyers. This was an important factor, one which had sealed Marjorie's decision to forge a new destiny for the two of them. No one wanted to buy the farm, and neither woman knew how to arrange such a deal. There would be no telling whether they were receiving a fair offer, even if someone were to express interest. She sank into a chair at the table in front of the kitchen hearth, and the silence stretched out around her yet again. The silence that had become her life, and would be her life until it ended. One word pierced the silence, whispered by a broken-hearted sister. Marjorie. Chapter 4 England Brock pushed his qualms away and hoped for no difficulties. A sentiment he couldn't share with his travel companions. Have you been here before? Hugh asked as the three of them strode down the dock, having rowed from the ship only minutes earlier. England? Brock asked. Hugh nodded. Brock scratched his jawline. When business called for it, yes. Before you came to work with me, Derek clarified, then turned to his brother. I never could convince him to accompany a shipment anywhere along the English coast. Always claimed to prefer France. Which I do, Brock pointed out. I see. Hugh chuckled. So which is it? A lover in France or a jilted woman here in England? He laughed along with Derek. Brock didn't laugh. I can't speak for either of you, but I could use a decent meal and something which passes for a bed, he growled, surveying the town which sat beyond the harbour. In many ways it wasn't unlike Kirkordy, though it wasn't as raucous and seemed considerably better kept. Derek noticed too. No wonder Marjorie had no idea what she was in for on landing in Kirkordy, he observed with a wry smile. From what I understand, Silith is the older of the two and better established, while Kirkordy has grown beyond all expectations in a much shorter amount of time. The village hasn't had the chance to establish itself well, whereas this has. And it had. Brock spied no fewer than three steeples which rose up over the thatched roofs of the homes and businesses which comprised the village, meaning religion had taken hold there. That alone spoke of what one would find on closer inspection. There were taverns, too, and Brock would have wagered the clothes on his back that there was more than one brothel in the area. They were a necessary evil in the eyes of the many. Men had needs which needed to be met. He'd visited brothels before, as a seaman, and knew how to spot them almost the moment his feet hit dry land. But that wasn't his concern. Those early, lusty days were behind him. Not that he'd stopped thinking of women entirely. A rather comely lass exited a spinster's shop as the three of them explored, favouring him with a smile which he returned in kind, but he had stopped looking for quick pleasures in dark corners. That was for young, untested men, men with more pent-up energy than was good for them. No one would dare call him old, not at the age of seven and twenty, but he'd gotten such activity out of his system years hence. Derek spotted the inn first and pointed to it. That's where Marjorie spent the night before stowing away. She said the place was clean and reputable. If there's one person whose opinion I respect when it comes to such matters. Brock chuckled, and the others joined in. She had all but lectured the two of them on propriety several times after they'd first crossed paths, and he would never forget the stricken look on her face when Derek recounted how he had found her staring open-mouthed, at a man and his paid companion as they coupled in the shadows of a narrow street. Beatrice would be the same way, no doubt. Sheltered, innocent of the world's many evils and vices, stunned beyond belief at what people were willing to do when they knew they could get away with it. 
with very high standards for herself and others. Marjorie was correct. The inn was downright cheerful, spotlessly clean and owned by a jolly older couple who seemed to find humour in everything. Come, come, the owner exclaimed, chuckling as he led the way to the second floor. His flushed cheeks flushed even darker when he laughed, and his round belly shook from the effort. Brock found his mood lightening as a result. Hugh and Derek would share a large room while Brock would have a room of his own. It was a treat for him, never before having been afforded the luxury of privacy while he was travelling. The room was small but serviceable, with clean linens covering a tick stuffed with clean straw, and a small window which allowed fresh air to circulate. He breathed deep of the sea, just beyond the wide street before him. They were fortunate to find such an agreeable establishment. So unlike some of the cramped, filthy places in which he'd spent the night in the past. More than once he'd chosen to row back out to the ship and sleep on board, rather than spent a sleepless night breathing in the foulness of human and animal waste. It was pleasant enough to make him regret having to leave in the morning, but there was no time to waste. They had to get to Thrushwood and convince Beatrice to come with them. He had his doubts as to the ease of the task ahead, but he didn't wish to share his misgivings with the others for fear of being regarded as a problem. They had no idea of his true hesitations, and he had no intention of revealing them. A knock on the wall which separated their rooms tore Brock from the dark path his thoughts had turned down. He stepped out into the corridor where Hugh was waiting. We'll go to the stables to see about securing horses for the trip. I'll go along. He preferred to choose his own mount, and needed to move about and find other things to think on. The liveliness of the village would do nicely, he was certain. Give me a minute to wash myself. Hugh snorted. Why? Do you wish to impress the horses? Brock glanced in the direction of the room the McInnes brothers shared, where Derek waited in the doorway. No. I wish to remove as many reasons for the owner of the stable to refuse us as possible. Or have you forgotten that we're in foreign territory? How could I forget, with these accents all around me? He wiggled a finger in his ear, as if to clean it out. Derek stepped back into the room. He's right. We're too travel-weary to think straight, but Brock isn't. We should do everything in our power to make a good showing in the village, even if we'll only be staying a single night. After all, we're relying on help from the villagers to get us through our journey. The innkeepers didn't seem to mind our being Scottish, and rather rough from travel. Hugh looked down the stairs, and the sounds of laughter from the ground floor drifted up to meet them as if someone had been listening for just the right moment. Brock scratched his stubbled chin shrugging. I'm beginning to wonder whether the two of them are quite right in the head. No one is that jolly for no reason. Brock had been right, as he knew before they'd ever stepped foot outside the inn. There were certain things in life he'd come to depend upon, as he'd made his way from harbour to harbour over the years. One of them was the distrust Englishmen held for Scotsmen. Especially Highlanders. Is it my imagination? Hugh muttered as they walked down one of the wider village streets in search of the stables, or did that woman just cross to the other side of the street after catching sight of us? I, Derek grumbled, teeth clenched. Though by the looks of her, even from a distance, I'm thinking she may have done us a favour. Indeed, the pinched-faced woman was no pleasure to behold. She made sure to give them a dirty look before going on her way. As I warned ye, Brock reminded him. I. It's been a while since I've stepped foot outside of what's familiar, Hugh admitted, before sidestepping two dogs fighting over a bone in front of a butchery. Brock thought to himself how much the dogs reminded him of the McInnes twins, down to the colour of their hair, but kept the comparison to himself. A group of men stood outside a tavern, laughing and conversing in the sort of easy manner men had after they'd enjoyed their share of drink. It was barely midday, but not uncommon for men with a love of drink to find time to indulge no matter the sun's position in the sky. Their demeanour changed as they caught sight of the three Scotsmen approaching. In the time it took to blink an eye, they fell silent, all eyes on the trio. Two of them moved a hand to their belts, where Brock was willing to bet existed the presence of weapons. 
as if the three of them were merely looking for a fight. Was that what the English thought of the Scots, that they roamed the streets in search of someone to attack? Or was it Highlanders in particular? Brock knew the reputation men from the Highlands carried. And it was based in little more than rumour and half-truths. Yes, they were rough, from the way they carried themselves to the way they dressed and spoke. Yes, they were good in a fight and never backed down from a challenge. Brock had certainly come to appreciate these truths. But they weren't beasts. They weren't animals intent on raping any woman in sight. He was particularly sensitive to the misgivings people had toward those unlike themselves, because he too had been an outsider for so long. Men from the Highlands weren't necessarily all they were rumoured to be. He was careful to make eye contact with each and every man they walked past, and just as careful to keep an even neutral expression on his face. They were merely going about their business, as any other man in Silith on that warm, pleasant day. Only when the tavern was well behind them did Derek let out a deep breath. Well, if there was any question as to how we'd be received here, I believe we found the answer. I don't understand it, Hugh grumbled. There are bound to be countless men wandering these streets on any given day, thanks to the presence of the harbour. Why is it such an occasion for us to be here? Perhaps there was recent trouble with Scots in the village, Brock mused, his mind going back to earlier times. The memory is fresh enough for them to remember. Aye, Derek agreed, latching on to this theory. And we'll be the ones to pay for it. Mark my words. When they reached the stables, the owner proved Derek right. I've nothing to give ye. The stalls were full, the sound of neighing horses filling the space. Brock and Hugh exchanged a look and Brock cleared his throat. We've no wish to start trouble with you, and have more than enough silver to cover the cost. If we could bring the ship closer into harbour, we'd be able to unload the horses we sailed with, but the water is too shallow. How is that a problem of mine? the man asked, spitting near their feet as if to add further insult. He reeked of horses and manure and his own sweat, yet somehow considered himself better than the three of them. The twins looked as though they were ready to prove the man right and start a fight, so Brock stepped in front of them. The problem is, if we don't have horses, we can't leave your village. We have quite a lot of riding to do, and would like to get started at first light. As charming a village as you have here, we would like to get out as soon as possible, and it seems as though you share that opinion. I do. I don't like your lot. Coming to our home, dirtying the place up, starting trouble. The man's eyes narrowed until they were nearly closed. We're here to start no trouble, Brock assured him. We're merely passing through on our way elsewhere, and we'll come back through before boarding our ship and sailing home. He had guessed correctly. There had been trouble in the past, whether it was the recent past or not made no difference to the villagers. Like as not, their memories were long, and stories found their way down through generations until the truth of them was nowhere near the version told. The owner eyed them. It'll cost ye, he decided before spitting again. We had expected nothing less, Brock replied, managing a half-hearted smile before the man led them inside to choose from the animals. He didn't want to bring voice to his doubts, but the experience was enough to make him wonder once again how receptive Beatrice would be to their sudden appearance at her door. Chapter 5 The funeral arrangements were simple and sombre, as she had expected. The memory of Winifred's wailing would live in Beatrice's memory for years to come, she was certain. While there was no doubt as to Cedric Brown's qualities as a good honest man and friend to all who knew him, his daughter's show of grief seemed a bit overmuch. Even her husband and small children had appeared embarrassed by her nearly hysterical weeping. Beatrice promised herself she would offer extra prayers on Sunday, as penance for wondering if Winifred would begin tearing at her hair and clothing in abject grief. Daniel Bowman was a kind man, if a bit cowed by the much stronger personality of his wife, and Beatrice had offered her sympathies to him on her way out of the church. Cedric would rest not far from where her father and mother rested, she could visit all three at once. Everyone who'd ever cared about her was right there, in the little graveyard. All except. She shook her head, 
willing away the tears which prickled behind her eyes at the thought of her sister. It did no good to dwell. If she had no choice but to get on with her life, that was all there was to it. The only question was how to go about that. She was deliberate in turning her attention to the cowslips and bluebells which lined the fields on either side of the road home. How long had they grown there? Had they been planted and tended to and loved by someone long before she was born, or had they naturally taken over the land and turned it into a profusion of deep blue and yellow? Their sight normally cheered her when she wasn't in such a dark mood. They were enough to give flight to her imagination, and she'd spent many long walks and rides to and from the church deep in thought about the men and women who had once called Thrushwood home, long before it was ever called Thrushwood. Perhaps that was how old the flowers were, just as old as the towering trees with their thick trunks, thick enough to crush a man or even a cottage if they were to fall. But the flowers renewed themselves every year. That was the difference. They were never the same, just as the leaves which grew then fell from the trees changed from year to year. Whatever kept the flowers coming back was deep beneath the grass and soil, just as the trees were what kept the leaves budding into life after winter passed. The trees had watched her over the years as they had watched so many others, keeping silent vigil over the road and its travellers. How many had they seen? And what difference had any of those lives made? Were people meant to only live and die? To eat and sleep and do chores until they were too old to do them any more? Was that the entire purpose of life? She didn't think so. Neither had her sister. That was why they had dreamed. That was why Marjorie had left, so the two of them might build a better life elsewhere. Look where it had gotten them. Perhaps it was better to be one of the nameless, faceless people the trees had outlived. Whoa Cecil. She pulled in the reins, halting the horse. He wasn't walking at a very fast pace, and she doubted he even could at this stage of his life. There was a thick patch of grass, studded with clover at the edge of the road. She left him there to chew to his heart's content, while she wandered off to pick a handful of flowers for her table. Anything to bring a little life to the otherwise empty, sad little house. It had never been empty and sad when Marjorie was there, even while their mother was alive and demanding so much of their time. They had been each other's consolation for so long, sometimes thinking as one. They even used to finish each other's sentences. The tears came up again, and this time Beatrice allowed them to flow unfettered. What difference did it make? She had already cried against Cecil's neck more times than she could count, sorrowful to the point where she had needed to rely on an old, mute horse for comfort just to have something to hold on to. Do you feel this is a wise decision? Her head snapped up at the sound of the strident male voice. An unfamiliar one, she knew so few men, and one of them had been buried that very day. It certainly wasn't Deacon Eddard, who called out to her from the road. She might not have known his voice but she knew him by sight. And she was hardly impressed. Lord Geoffrey Randall sat astride an enormous beast of a horse, black as soot and shining in the midday sun. Lord Randall shone too, from his golden hair to the sleek fur-trimmed cape about his shoulders all the way down to his polished leather shoes. He smiled, and she knew he thought he was being chivalrous and charming. Had anyone ever found the nerve to tell him he wasn't? That he looked for all the world like a wolf about to pounce on his prey? She swallowed back her tears, ashamed that he'd found her in such a state. What decision would that be, Lord Randall? To leave your noble steed unhobbled on his own, while you pick flowers. She forced a smile. I assure you, old Cecil is far past the age of running away, especially when there's clover to be enjoyed. His laugh was deep rich and strangely out of place. Mirthless as well. His blue eyes were cold and empty, as he favoured her with another smile. Pardon my intrusion then. I felt it my place to assist a young lady when I saw the possibility of her being stranded so far from home. She blinked. You know how far I am from home. It seemed unlikely. The only explanation was his desire to seem helpful, to engage her in conversation, though she had no idea why he'd deign to converse with her. He was at least fifteen years her senior, and a far more important personage than she could ever hope to be. His eyebrows arched. 
Why naturally Beatrice, daughter of Eric Woodson? I know where your farm is located. It shares a border with my own land. Yes. That is correct. The Lord's land stretched over many leagues, including forests and a lake. His family had been purchasing parcels and expanding for as long as she could remember. It was only upon the death of Geoffrey's brother, who'd been the oldest son, that the expansion had ceased. Once Lord Randall had taken over the title and with it the land, he'd stopped expanding. No one knew why, but then again, no one had known why his older brother had been obsessed with buying up every bit of land in the vicinity either. And yet we have never met before now, he marveled, shaking his head. His hair seemed to glow. She had never seen hair so lustrous before, not even her sister's. Marjorie's hair had always been so beautiful. No. Not was beautiful. Not past tense. Marjorie was still alive. She had to be. Beatrice struggled to remain in the conversation, rather than allowing her thoughts to get away from her. This is true. But you're a very important person, and I... You flatter me. His smile was genuine this time. Good thing she'd chosen her words carefully, for she might otherwise have accused him of caring nothing for his neighbors. Never once had he paid them a call, not even on the deaths of her parents. But he'd been through enough tragedy of his own. It was uncharitable to hold a grudge against him. He looked down the road, in the direction from which she'd come and in which he headed. I was passing through with the intention of paying respects at the church. I understand old Cedric Brown has passed on. The Randall family milled their grain with him for as long as I can remember, and with his father before that. This was a surprise, the idea that a nobleman would attend the services of a lowly man such as the miller. Yes the family might still be present. Winifred would never allow anyone to forget the fact that Lord Randall had come to pay his respects to her father's memory. She would take it as a personal compliment. There's another prayer this Sunday, if not more, Beatrice reminded herself. Ever since Marjorie's departure, she'd been far less charitable. And much less patient. I ought to be on my way then, before I miss them. He touched his heels to the horse's sides and took off at a trot. Until we meet again Beatrice, daughter of Eric Woodson. She nodded mutely, lacking anything of substance to offer in reply. Why would they meet again, when they'd never once met in her entire life up to that moment? She had seen him several times, normally in the village on market day. He seemed to like riding through the throngs of villages, pretending not to notice as they admired his beautiful horse and fine clothing. Perhaps she was being uncharitable again. As she mounted Cecil and clicked her tongue, signaling him to continue on, she reflected on the fact that he was paying his respects to the miller's family. He didn't have to do any such thing. And he'd experienced great loss in his life too. She hadn't heard many of the details in the murder of his nephew several years earlier, it wasn't the sort of thing a young woman should discuss, but she knew it led to the decline and eventual death of his older brother too. Those two deaths coming within months of each other had passed the lordship on to him but at what cost? It was little matter. She hardly expected to see him again. Hours later, she was just about to sit down to a simple dinner of vegetable soup and fresh bread when the sound of approaching hooves caught her attention. Instead of passing and growing quieter, the horse came to a stop. For one wild breathless moment, she imagined her sister being just outside. She had returned home with money to get them started on a new life, somewhere far away. It mattered little that this fantasy made no sense. How would Marjorie have come into so much money in such a short time? The sight of the deacon as he approached her front door caused Beatrice's hopes to blow away like dried leaves on the wind, but she didn't allow her disappointment to show. Have you come to share supper with me, she asked with a smile. I have more than enough soup, and would greatly enjoy the company. He offered an apologetic smile. It was not my intention to disturb your evening meal. I received news earlier today, which I didn't feel could wait until morning. Please come in. She had never seen him look so off balance, even when he'd announced Cedric's passing. 
He sat at the table across from her, as yet untouched Neil, his hands clenched on the tabletop. He waited until she took her seat before speaking. Lord Randall paid a call on me earlier today. Oh yes. She nodded. Our paths crossed while on the road. Did they? One corner of his thin mouth quirked up in a half-hearted smile. That seems fitting. Why? His eyes met hers, and for the first time she noted the apology in them. I've tried to dissuade him. This is not the first time we've spoken of what he wanted to discuss this afternoon. Cold certainty flooded her. She didn't want to hear what he'd come to say, for there would be no unhearing it. She wanted him to leave and not come back. She wanted to go to bed, and perhaps not get up in the morning, regardless of what her absence would do to the animals. Anything to avoid hearing what she was suddenly certain, she was about to hear. She drew a deep breath, letting it out slowly before nodding. You can tell me. He wrung his hands, taking a deep breath of his own. Lord Randall has wished to acquire your land for quite some time. Ever since your mother's passing, since before then honestly. This was news to her. Why did you never share this with me? Because the land is all you and your sister have to your names now. A home of your own, land of your own. It is unusual for women to be in this unique position, and I didn't wish to complicate matters for you. She blinked, unable to speak for a long time. When she did, her words came out in a thin whisper. I do wish you had shared this with us. Marjorie might never have left, if she knew we had a possible buyer who was interested in purchasing from us. Inside she screamed. How could he not tell them? Who did he think he was? And why would Lord Randall go through him and not through her sister and herself? Marjorie need never have left. They might have sold to him and gone on with their lives elsewhere, anywhere else. Some place where they'd have a future. Homes of their own, husbands and babies. Instead, the deacon had decided for them that they didn't need to know there was a possibility of a future in store for them. He'd made their choices on their behalf and most likely expected thanks for it. Deacon Eddard's forehead creased even more deeply than usual when he frowned. You don't understand my child. He does not wish to purchase the land from you for any price. The screaming in her head stopped. He thinks we'll give it away? Is that what he expects? It is not only the land he wishes to acquire. In fact, he behaves as though it is a secondary concern. There was that certainty again, spreading through her, making her head throb. Her instincts had been correct the first time. And she finally understood why Geoffrey Randall had been so kind to her on the road. He shook his head. No, my child. He wishes to take you as his wife and absorb the land into his holdings. He intends to marry you. She nearly choked on fear, disgust and the brief mad impulse to laugh. To laugh and never stop laughing because surely this was a terrible joke. No one could seriously make such an offer. He asked to marry me, she breathed, struggling to make sense of it. The deacon winced, now wringing his hands. No, Beatrice. He announced to me that the two of you will marry. Chapter 6 It's been a fortnight since we left home. Brock thought he'd never heard a more miserable announcement in all his days. Derek rode beside him. Hugh just in front, through a densely wooded area between Silith and Thrushwood. They travelled east, and the sun was at their back. The day would end soon, and they would have to make camp within the hour. He left the scouting up to Hugh, who kept watch on the condition of the would-be road and the safety of their mounts, and turned his attention to the miserable man to his left. It has already. He feigned ignorance. It doesn't seem as though so many days have passed. They have. I've kept count. His normally laughing bright eyes had dimmed a bit more with each day away from his wife. We'll reach Thrushwood tomorrow, Brock reminded him. Every day that passes moves us one day closer to your being reunited. Remember that. Not knowing, he growled. It's the not knowing. That's the worst of all. Do you trust Sarah? Of course I do. She's one of the most trustworthy people I've ever known. 
that trust does not extend itself to her care of your wife and child, however. For the first time in days, Derek laughed. A quiet laugh, but a laugh nonetheless. You'd understand if you were in my position. Brock turned his face away just enough to conceal the rolling of his eyes. If he had two pence for every time he'd heard either of his travelling companions make that very statement comparing themselves to him, he'd be a wealthy man. Was that what happened to a man once they wed? Did they suddenly believe themselves above the petty concerns of the unmarried, even if they'd harboured such concerns in earlier days? Then he replied, I understand what it is to put another's welfare above my own. I do not need to sign a marriage contract in order to place myself in your position. Fair enough. Though it still isn't the same. He raised his voice. What do you think, Hugh? A laugh similar to Derek's rang out as Hugh called out over his shoulder. I think his time is coming. One day. And he'll know. Unlikely, seeing as how I'll go back to living as we once did. Remember those times? It wasn't very long ago. I, Derek murmured staring out into the woods as he thought back. Never being home for more than a few days at a stretch, during good weather of course, not the winter months when the waterways clogged with ice. Even then, you were always busy, keeping track of the shipments and their arrivals and collecting from the merchants. Securing new shipments. Making new contacts, expanding the routes the ships travelled. Collecting payment and keeping track of the records. Derek nodded in acknowledgement. You don't have to remind me. It was all of that and much more. Brock spread his arms in a shrug. You expect me to find a lass of my own who'd be willing to suffer through such an existence? Or who would remain steadfast when her man was away for so long? Derek snorted, shaking his head. Remember old Angus? Brock's face fell. How could I forget? Who's this Angus? Hugh asked. Brock exchanged a pained look with Derek. He was an old seaman who worked aboard one of your brother's ships. A good man, trustworthy, as skilled as though he'd been born at sea. Very likely he was, Derek murmured. A bit of a drifter as well. He never stayed in one place very long, but I suppose there comes a time in every man's life when he decides he made a mistake and wants to make up for it. He wanted to make up for never having settled down. He wanted a good woman waiting for him when he came home, someone to tell his stories to. Someone to care whether he made it home at all. He married a lass far too young for him, Brock remembered, rubbing his chin as he thought back. None of us considered it a likely marriage. I don't believe there was ever a question in any of our minds of whether it would end well. But he made a good living, and faithfully sent the money he'd earned home to his wife. Who spent it on herself and nothing else, Derek growled. Herself and the man she took up with, Brock amended. Which Angus learned all about on a surprise visit. He thought she'd be happy to see him. He actually believed that. I suppose she wasn't alone. Hugh guessed. Not only was she not alone, Derek murmured. She was in bed with the man. When neither of them finished the story, Hugh prodded them. What did he do? Derek looked at Brock. Brock looked back at him. He killed them both. Split the man's head open with a log from beside the hearth, then strangled her before hanging himself, Brock concluded. Now, ask me again why it's never been a priority for me to find a wife. The three of them fell into silence for a time, there being little to say after such a tale was shared. Brock remembered the shock they'd all gone into at how violently the sordid situation had ended. While no one in Angus's acquaintance believed he'd married well, they hadn't seen such a terrible conclusion coming. It wouldn't have to be that way for you, Derek insisted after a while. As you said yourself, everyone knew it was doomed to failure from the start. I, Brock muttered staring straight ahead. Everyone but Angus. The conversation ended there, which was just as well. The sun had nearly slid behind the foothills, and the sky was darker by the minute. Hugh pointed to a group of trees whose branches seemed to grow together, they were so closely intertwined. The effect was that of a roof under which they could bed for the night. 
Hugh tended the horses, while Derek shook out the bedrolls and Brock built a fire a short distance from the canopy of branches out in the open. The McInnes twins joked back and forth, Derek's mood having improved with the promise of food and sleep. Good thing that, since Brock wasn't certain how much more of his friend's brooding he could stand. His own mood, on the other hand, had darkened at the recounting of Angus McGuinness's terrible tale. He'd been a good man, a solid one, one Brock had always been able to count on whenever they manned the same ship. They'd enjoyed more than their share of close calls on stormy seas, had shared more than a few mugs of mead. All it had taken for him to break was one unfaithful woman. He'd wondered at the time what had gone through Angus's head in those final brutal minutes. When he'd seen his wife in bed with another man. Had he suddenly realized how wrong he'd been all along? Had he remembered all of their tender moments in a single rush of understanding? Had he questioned her sincerity? Had he felt like a fool, the sort of pathetic man neighbors whispered and laughed about? No doubt they'd laughed too, watching men parading in and out of the home he'd purchased for his unfaithful wife. She'd used him and flaunted her using of him. Had any of the unthinkable pain in his head, and his heart eased once he'd split the bastard's head open? Had that made him feel any better? Had there been any love left in his heart for her, even as his hands closed around her slim throat and he choked the life out of her? Had he felt vindicated as the light in her eyes faded to nothing? Had he hanged himself from the rafter out of guilt? Had he come out of his blind rage, blinking fast and wondering who had caused the death all around him? Or had he done it as an alternative to what was surely to come? Had he done it because he was embarrassed by the fool she'd made of him? The fire leapt to life, shooting flames upward into the air. Brock fed it a handful of dry twigs before standing and wiping his dirty hands on already dirty trousers. They would all need to change into clean clothing and wash up before visiting Beatrice. Like as not, the presence of three strange men would already have a jarring effect on the lass. They didn't need to frighten her any further with the roughness of their travel-weary appearance. At the rate we've managed to progress to this point, we should be able to make Thrushwood tomorrow evening, Derek mused, skewering the last of their roasted rabbit on a stick before placing it over the fire to warm through. Brock wouldn't mind a day without rabbit. He'd eaten enough of it on this trip to last him a lifetime. And we'll set out for the farm at first light, he asked, perhaps more hopeful than he should have sounded. Both of his companions noted this, if the way their eyebrows arched meant anything. Why so eager? Hugh asked, uncorking his flask and drinking deep of the water inside. No reason. I'm only concerned for Derek, reminding how close we are to turning around and starting for home. It was a lie, an inexpert one, but it seemed to do the trick. Derek's eyes lit up at the prospect of getting home quickly, back to his wife. This was enough to shift the tide of the conversation away from Brock. Which was all he needed. The horses were fatigued close to the point of collapse by the time they reached the outskirts of Thrushwood, nearly a solid day later. How that lying bastard could look us in the eye and tell us these beasts were up to the challenge of such a journey is beyond me, Derek grumbled as they walked the exhausted animals past the first few outlying buildings. Light glowed in the windows, the glow of fires and lanterns and candles. Brock's stomach growled when the scent of roasted meat and stewed vegetables and fresh bread floated from home after home. He hoped there would be food available at the inn, or at least a tavern nearby which would provide sustenance. If he never saw Rabbit again, it would be too soon. We won't do much riding tomorrow, Hugh reasoned, patting his gelding's neck. It will be a good rest for them. I ought to give the man a piece of my mind when we return, Derek grumbled, brows drawn close together. Thinks just because we're Scots he can push these three off on us. Well, he did push them off on us, he observed with a wry smile. Perhaps it would be best not to start a fight when we reach the harbour. No need to complicate things further. If the horses get us there, they get us there. If, Derek barked. If they do. I've half a mind to switch them out for fresh here in the village, and tell the man where to stick his complaints when we reach Sillith. It was all background noise to Brock, as they continued to ride farther into the village. 
Memories pressed in on him from all sides as they passed the blacksmith, the bakers. A row of small, modest cottages. They were all still there, in the same place as before. Was everything the same? What about the filthy, rat-infested pit in which criminals were held? Marjorie described the location of the inn, Derek reported, breaking through the chilling images which fought for control of Brock's mind. It should only be a few minutes' ride down the main street, which she said is twice as wide as any of the others and impossible to miss. Other things impossible to miss, Hugh noted, his sharp eyes scanning the area around them. Three strangers riding into the village. Sure enough, they had attracted attention. This was no surprise. They'd be distrusted simply because of who they were. Thrushwood was rather removed from the rest of the world too, surrounded by woodlands on all sides, so one couldn't blame the villagers for their suspicions. Even so, the utter contempt on the faces of those watching from doorways and windows as they passed was unnerving. An old woman, busy sweeping her doorstep, spat in their direction before stomping back inside without finishing the job she'd started. Perhaps it would be best for us to hurry about our business, Brock observed in a low voice after a pair of young men snarled in their direction, then continued walking past. Things will be better when we reach the inn, Derek promised. How can you be so certain? Brock asked, glad for the presence of a dirk at his hip. They'd been careful to conceal their weapons so as to avoid trouble, even so his was just beneath his tunic and could be freed in a matter of moments. Isn't that the sort of thinking that nearly ruined your life? The voice in his head was clear, sharp, knowing. He tried to ignore it, to no avail. Defending oneself wasn't a crime. If any of the villagers decided to react to their visitors with violence, the three of them would have no choice but to fight back. The problem would lie in convincing the rest of the village that they didn't deserve to hang for it. Chapter 7 Beatrice didn't need the rooster to wake her the following morning. That would mean having slept at all, which she had not. How could she when her life was over, or as good as? She had wept for hours after the deacon revealed his terrible news, well past the point where her soup was cold as ice. Her appetite was long gone, anyway. Deacon Eddard had been thoughtful enough to empty the untouched bowl back into the pot on the dwindling fire. What am I going to do? she'd asked until her throat was raw but there had come no answer. She had no choice, so there was no sense in stating the obvious. She had to marry the man. Was there no one who could speak for her? No one who would protect her from what would surely be a sad and empty life? Emptier than now, she whispered to her otherwise silent bedroom. There was no one to hear. No one but her. Would marrying Lord Randall be worse than spending endless days and nights on her own? Wandering around the house, performing the same tasks day in and day out? Milking the cow, feeding the chickens, collecting the eggs? Tending the garden, harvesting more than she could ever possibly eat on her own? Sweeping the floors, washing her few dishes, cleaning the hearth? Going into the village to trade for the goods the farm couldn't provide? She couldn't trade for companionship, could she? There was no way to fill the emptiness which weighed on every bit of her life. Even so, it was her life. Hers alone. She had spent so much of it, almost the entirety, living under her mother's rule, to the point where she devoted what were supposed to be the carefree, sunny years to caring for the woman when she was an invalid. She had lived for nothing more than her mother's comfort, and her own meager existence. While she did not enjoy the aching loneliness of her days, especially in Marjorie's absence, she preferred it to the thought of living under the Lord's roof. She'd never seen the manor up close, only from a distance as she travelled the road into the village on market day. A sprawling, intimidating sort of place, even from the road. How would she ever learn to live in a house like that, when all she'd ever known was around her right at that very minute? She'd never wanted more. Well, perhaps a new kirtle now and again, and the ability to purchase new shoes when the soles of the only pair she owned wore out. She wouldn't have begun riding sweet old Cecil if it hadn't been for the wear and tear on her shoes otherwise. What would it entail, being the lady of the manor? Because she would be the lady. Nobility. She, 
the daughter of a farmer who'd been the son of a woodcutter. Was she honestly entertaining the idea? No. It couldn't be. It simply couldn't. She knew what marriage meant. She knew what men expected from their wives. She would have to bear children, heirs to the family name. Boys naturally girls couldn't inherit anything. She would be little more than a broodmare to her husband, until she could no longer bear children. And then? What would she be then? Only darkness followed that question, darkness and blankness. Because she had no idea what would come after her childbearing years were over. She had no experience to draw from, and no older woman in her life to provide guidance. Not everything would have to be so bad, she reasoned in an attempt to soothe herself. It would be nice to have servants about, wouldn't it? She might be able to sleep in the morning, rather than living at the mercy of the rooster and his incessant crowing. The skin of her hands would no longer feel so rough. She might be able to eat enough food that her body would fill out a bit, instead of its current scrawniness. At what cost, however? Marriage to man nearly old enough to be her father? One who she had never held in high personal regard, and who hadn't given her a good feeling when they'd met on the road? There was something empty about him. Hollow. Cold. She stretched, her sore muscles protesting after a night of tossing and turning, then settled back into the pillow with a sigh. It wasn't dawn yet. She might get up, but to what purpose outside of tending the animals? They didn't expect her yet. Memories of Marjorie teased at the corners of her mind. Oh, the many adventures the two of them had dreamed up for themselves. How silly it seemed in hindsight. How childish. Like any young girls, they had spent hours giggling late at night over the sort of men they would marry one day. They had been too young and untested to understand how unlikely it was that they'd ever find the men they dreamed of, or any men at all. They hadn't understood what it took to find a husband, more than just knowing a man. It took money from a father. Something to bring to the marriage. Such as land. There was no such thing as romance for girls such as they, poor girls with no living father to provide for them, or even ensure they made a good match with a decent man. To think, she had once feared living the rest of her life alone. Going to bed alone every night until she died. Never knowing love, never hearing the laughter of children as she went about her housework. She hadn't considered the existence of something much sadder. Darker. Lonelier. Of course once she had children, she wouldn't have to be alone. She would have them. Yes and then what? She wouldn't make them responsible for her happiness, that was one lesson she'd learned from her mother. One of the few things she would carry with her, out of the many warnings Mama had passed on. It wasn't fair to a child, having to carry the burden of an unhappy parent's misery. And that was what she'd done for so long. She and Marjorie both. It seemed that no amount of thinking would help her. No matter how many times she went back and forth, she never reached a satisfactory conclusion. Getting out of bed seemed the logical thing to do, though her heart wasn't in it. Facing the day meant facing her fate. Even so she went through it, just as she'd likely go through with the marriage. What would Marjorie think? What if she were alive out there somewhere, planning on sending for her? What if she was on her way home? What if she expected her home to be intact, still in her name? It would break her heart to know that they'd lost their farm, even though it had become little more than an anchor weighing on them. Beatrice knew her sister all too well, she would blame herself for not having succeeded in establishing them elsewhere. She dragged her heavy feet across the room, splashing her face with cool water out of habit and drying it on the back of her arm. What did it matter? The water did soothe her sore eyes though, after so much crying. She was certain there were no more tears in her. She had cried enough to fill a lake. Like the lake on Lord Randall's property. Perhaps she would drown herself in that lake one day. No. She stood by the window, looking out over the still dark farm. No I won't. I won't do anything of the sort. Not only was it a sin, but it would be tantamount to giving up. She didn't give up. 
she never had, never once in her life. Even if she had to marry the man, she held out hope otherwise, but it was always a possibility, she would find a way to be happy. She owed it to herself. Didn't she? It wasn't until the sky began to lighten, that she turned away from the window, dressing quickly, and with much greater purpose than she'd felt since the visit from the deacon. There had to be something she could do. And she thought she might have an idea as to what it might be. If she could find someone in the village interested in purchasing the land, anyone at all, she might be able to get around Lord Randall's demands. Let whoever bought the land argue with him over a good price. She hardly cared anymore. It was a matter of desperation at this point. While she didn't much enjoy the feeling that she was trapped in a corner, she was reasonable enough to do what needed to be done without much regret. Bess would be waiting for her milking. Beatrice was lost in thought as she stepped outside. She knew she would have to get to the village early, as soon as she had the chores finished. The time couldn't come soon enough. It wasn't until the three riders were nearly close enough for her to make out the color of their eyes, that she even noticed their presence on the road. Rough-looking men, large and muscled. All of them looking at the house, the farm. They weren't merely passing through. Her instincts screamed at her to run, to throw herself on Cecil's back and take off in the other direction. To take sanctuary in the church and throw herself at the deacon's mercy, to beg for his protection. But they would catch her, for certain. Their horses were large, young, unlike the old farm horse who could barely make it to the market and back. She felt sorry for even forcing him to make the trip. How could she hope to outrun them all the way to the church? Instead, she dashed inside the house, and did the only other thing she could think to do. In the bedroom, which had once belonged to her parents, in the trunk at the foot of the little bed they'd shared before her mother had taken it over and made it her sanctuary for years. Beatrice's hands shook as she worked the old lock, but she managed to open it on the third attempt and withdrew the sword her father had carried as a member of King Henry III's army. It was heavy, requiring both of her hands just to heft it from the chest and carry it to the front door. The horses were approaching, their riders dismounting. She saw them through the window, only peering out at them with one eye to keep the rest of herself hidden. Just the sight of them would have frightened her in any circumstance, watching as they walked from the front gate to the door left her uncertain as to whether she could hold her water. Had Lord Randall sent them? Would they forcibly remove her from the house, and take her to his manor? Would he force her? The very thought of such a thing sent fire racing through her, the fire of rage and desperation, and a determination not to be his possession, his thing to do with as he wished. It was enough to make her fling the door open, and take the sword's hilt in both hands. You're on my land whoever you are, she announced, throwing her head back. I would leave it if I were you, unless you've a mind to feel my sword slicing into you. Chapter 8 That was a surprise. The three of them stopped in their tracks, feet from the front door of the modest farmhouse. It looked like a pleasant enough place, if a bit run down and remote. Brock understood how two young lasses could feel removed from the rest of the world in such a house. His eyes darted back and forth, from Derek and Hugh back to the dark-haired warrior standing in the doorway. She wore a worn-out kirtle which had obviously seen better days, and strands of long hair embellished with gold and auburn streaks had worked their way loose from the braid which hung over one shoulder. Did you hear me, or are you all unable to understand English, she demanded, her chin high. Blue eyes flashed fire as she glared at them. I'll not be coming with you so you might as well leave this land and never come back. The land belongs to me, as well as everything on it. Be gone. Was it possible that she knew why they were there? No. It couldn't be. They hadn't told anyone in the village of their plans. How could she know then? That they'd come to take her with them. Unless she thought they were a threat. Which meant she was in fear of such a threat. It would explain the sword she tried valiantly to heft as she stared them down, her feet spread shoulder width apart so she nearly filled the doorway. She was magnificent, even in her worn clothing, even struggling to lift a sword he'd be willing to wager she wouldn't be able to swing. 
His brain clearly worked faster than that of the others, for he found his tongue before they did. We mean you no harm, Beatrice. No harm? She laughed, tossing her head back. You mean to take me with you? Isn't that it? Why don't we come out with it and say what we mean? How do you know that? He asked, glancing at the other two. We shared knowledge of our plans with no one, lass. Her forehead creased slightly. Lass, where are you from? Scotland, he replied, taking pains to keep his voice low and soothing, as though he were calming a skittish animal. She was little more than that very thing at the moment. A dangerous animal. Though the only one she posed a danger to was herself. She would slice into her own leg or arm with that blasted sword, like as not. We've come to take you to your sister, Derek explained, finally coming to the heart of it. She is my wife. My name is Derek McInnes, and we were wed not long ago. Her expression softened, her mouth opening slightly as she absorbed his words. For a moment Brock had hope. She would thaw in light of this turn of events, and they would be on their way within the hour. So he told himself. Her jaw tightened. I don't believe you. Why would my sister be wed to a Scotsman when it was London she was intending to sail to? It's a very long story, he explained as he reached into his tunic for the letter. Stop right there, she ordered, lifting the sword a little higher. It shook slightly as her arms weakened. She wouldn't be able to hold on to it for much longer, but from what he'd already seen of her, Brock had the feeling she'd find a way to fight through her weakness. I have a letter from her, Derek murmured, holding his hands out to show her he meant no harm. I am not here to harm you. None of us are. I don't believe you, she spat. Her eyes were wide, wild, moving from one of them to the other. She was close to panic. What had happened to her during her sister's absence? Marjorie had said nothing of Beatrice being unstable or quick to jump to irrational conclusions. In fact, everything she'd said up to that point had praised her sister's cool head, her deeply rational mind, her clear sense of reason. Who was the lass standing before them? What happened to a woman to drive her half mad? Just read the letter, Derek urged, his voice low and soft. I have it here, in my tunic. Marjorie made me keep it here at all times, so as to ensure I didn't lose it. It was so very important to her that we make it here, to you, and that we tell you she's well and she wants you to join her. All of us, in fact. Why didn't she come for me then? Beatrice demanded. If she's so well, why did she send three men in her place? She's with child, Derek explained. And she could not be away from home for so long. Her eyes softened, lost some of that half-crazed look. A child, she whispered. Yes. She longs for you most desperately. You are all she's been able to think about. That was the wrong thing to say. Beatrice tensed once again. Why hasn't she contacted me prior to this time then? Why did she lead me to believe she was? No. I want you off this land immediately. Or else. Somehow, perhaps panic granted her strength she wouldn't otherwise possess, she lifted the sword and managed something close to a fighting stance. We'd better go for now, Hugh muttered. It's clear there's more to this than we knew. Brock disagreed but saw no other choice. He turned to Derek. Leave the letter. Of course. Derek slid his hand into the pocket, retrieving Marjorie's letter. I'll leave this right here. On the ground. You can get it once we've left. None of us mean you any harm, Beatrice. Leave. Now. She glared at them all the way to the gate as they mounted their horses. He dared to glance over his shoulder to see what she was doing, and caught sight of her bending to pick up the letter. She has it, he announced, but with little satisfaction. She'll read the letter and know the truth. Would it help? The question lingered on his mind as they trotted away, three abreast on the wide road. We can return later in the day, or even better in the morning, Derek decided. That will give her time to think things over and calm herself somewhat. Waiting another day. An entire day. Brock bristled at the idea, hands tightening on the reins. 
Do you really feel it necessary to wait the entire day? Marjorie told us she was nothing if not intelligent. I'm certain that once she reads the letter, she'll understand. The lass is obviously unhinged, Hugh muttered, shaking his head. A shame. I hate to think of what Marjorie will. She's not Rockbart. The other two turned to gape at him in surprise. They weren't alone in this, as he had no understanding of why he'd reacted so strongly. He managed to calm himself only by sheer force of will before speaking again. She's not unhinged, he began again. What she is is frightened half to death. She accused us of trying to take her somewhere with no knowledge of who we were. The lass greeted us at the door with a sword in her hands. That's not the action of a woman who feels safe. I assumed it was because we frightened her, Derek mused. Three of us coming to the door all at once. And her never having spent much time with men. Even so, to fetch a sword. Brock asked, shaking his head. Something about it didn't seem right. No. Something's happened here since Marjorie left. She's been all alone, fighting some battle. The thought of a small, weak little thing like her, fighting all alone. But she wasn't weak, was she? The defiant tilt of her chin, and the fury in her voice as she'd ordered them off her land, spoke of an inner strength he couldn't help but admire. Even if she had held up their progress. It simply couldn't wait another day. If they were lucky, and she agreed to leave with them, she would still need to gather her things. She wouldn't simply step out the door without so much as a look behind her. And by then, they would likely need to wait until the following morning before starting back out for Silith. That was too long. He couldn't wait all that time. There had to be another way. I'm going back. What? Derek pulled his horse to a stop. What do you have in mind? I only want to speak to her, but it might be best for only one of us to go at a time. I'm of a mind to believe we frightened her. Three against one. Hugh and Derek exchanged a look. And you're certain you're the one? Hugh asked. Why not? I'm Marjorie's husband for one, Derek pointed out. Which means nothing to her, since she only just found out her sister was wed. No. That won't matter. You two return to the inn. I'll come back on my own. You're certain of this? Hugh asked, but Brock had already brought the horse around and was on his way back to the farm. There had to be a way to convince her to accompany him. He simply had to do it. She was frightened. Of what? He might manage to offer protection, a way out of whatever terrible threat she had been facing. He was certain of there being something. Someone. Someone willing to take advantage of a lonely young lass all on her own with no man to look after her. Yes, there were men such as that. It had to be a man too, for no woman would wield such power. Not in a small village such as Thrushwood. His heart warmed toward her the more he thought about her being all on her own. He imagined the frightening loneliness, the sense of having no one to turn to. Not even her sister, who for all she knew could have been dead. Another burden for her to carry. The farmhouse came into view once again, with the land stretching out well beyond it. It was all her land, hers and Marjorie's. They would have to find a way to settle the sale without being present for it. Perhaps there was an ally somewhere who could act on their behalf. Marjorie had spoken of a miller and a deacon. One of them might be able to help. As long as they could leave, and soon. Right away. Immediately. He hesitated at the front gate, wondering if she would still have the sword when he approached the house. There was no sign of her at the window, he'd spied her hair earlier even though she'd tried hard to keep herself hidden. Hello, he called out looking about the place. When there was no response he dismounted and took slow cautious steps down the path which led to the door. No sound came from inside, no dragging of iron against the floor as Beatrice hauled the sword behind her. Daring courageous daft lass. He peered through the window beside the door. A small, nearly bare kitchen, with only a handful of blue and yellow flowers sticking out from the mouth of a jug, to cheer the place up. 
Something about those flowers spoke to him. They said the person who lived there still held hope. Otherwise, the house looked empty. No fire in the hearth, no sounds of movement. He went around the house then, the clucking of chickens growing louder as he did. There was a cow penned in the old barn, a building greatly in need of repair. There was no man on the property to perform such repairs. No horse. He'd noticed it near the chicken coop, on the other side of a fence which enclosed the birds. It was gone now, and the stable was empty. It used to be filled, he noted, with stalls lining either side of the impressive space. This used to be a thriving farm. It was little more than a memory any more. She was gone. He went back to the horse which he'd tied off at the front gate, and reflected on the fact that they hadn't crossed paths as he returned, which meant she'd gone in the other direction. She was fleeing somewhere to someone, asking for help. It looked as though he had to find her. Chapter 9 She staggered her way up the short stony path, which led to the front door of the deacon's modest home, after hobbling Cecil by the low stone wall which ran along the road, separating church grounds from the rest. Deacon, she gasped, leaning against the door as she banged on it with the side of one fist. Poor Cecil would likely need a good long rest after being ridden so hard. She could barely breathe, panic and fear sitting on her chest as they were. Old Frances opened the door, squinting her faded, failing eyes. She had served as the deacon's housekeeper and cook all Beatrice's life, and likely for far longer than that. Beatrice, he asked surprised. You look all a fright. I'm certain I do. I feel all a fright too. Is the deacon in? I must speak with him. He's in the church, sweeping up before services in the morning. Are you quite well? Do you need to sit down? Perhaps a cup of tea? The kindly old woman stepped aside, as though to leave room for Beatrice to enter the house. No thank you. She managed to smile. I'll meet him in the church. It's quite urgent that I speak to him now. She trotted off down the path which connected the two buildings, without another word to Francis, for fear of having to answer more questions and waste even more time. As it happened, Deacon Eddard was leaving the church as she approached. When he saw her taking in the full sight of her flushed face and sweat-stained kirtle, his expression registered his surprise. What is it, my child? I don't know. I just don't know. She sank onto the stone steps which led up to the door, holding her head in her hands. She was so tired, not just from a sleepless night but from the strain of carrying so much on her shoulders for so long. How was one woman supposed to carry so much all alone? To her surprise he sat beside her, and didn't force her to speak. She collected herself enough to stop shaking, before apologizing for arriving in such a state. I didn't know where else to go. I suppose there is nowhere else. I have no other friends. What happened? Three men came to the house. I hurried here as soon as they left. Three men. He rose, and the surprise at the anger in his voice went a long way toward shocking her out of her panic. They didn't cause harm, she assured him, shaking her head. But they claimed to come from Scotland, bearing a letter from Marjorie. Your sister is in Scotland. I don't know. She looked up at him, the confusion in his face reflecting her own. That isn't where she was supposed to go. How can I believe them? I didn't know what to do, I didn't know who they were or why they came. I'm afraid I was rather rude. How so my child? I threatened them with father's sword. There was silence as the deacon's face went blank. Then to her eternal shock, he chuckled. You did. I could hardly lift it and my arms ached terribly but yes. I had to at least make it appear as though I could defend myself. He threw his head back and laughed, warming her from the inside out. Even the brilliant sunshine streaming down on them hadn't managed that. Before long, she was laughing too. Three Scotsmen and one young woman with a sword. I can only imagine what they must have thought. He wiped tears of mirth from his eyes. I haven't laughed this way in many years. As for her, the laughter helped wipe away the panic she had suffered through all the way from the house. 
They left without much fuss, she explained, but they did leave a letter. Have you read it? I didn't take the time. The moment they were out of sight, I took Cecil and headed here as fast as I could. I didn't feel safe there anymore, all alone. I thought they were there to take me away, to the manor. My dear. Deacon Eddard sat beside her again, patting her arm. I do not believe Lord Randall would behave in such a brutish manner. He seemed quite intent on creating a happy home life for you both. Yes, he would when speaking to you about our marriage, wouldn't he? She noted the stricken expression on his face, and relented out of guilt. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be difficult. I'm so unhappy. Perhaps you should read the letter from your sister, he suggested. It may help you understand. Oh yes. She had folded it in half and tucked it into her sleeve before fleeing, and slid it out at the deacon's suggestion. He was discreet, looking away in order to give her some privacy. Her hands trembled as she unrolled the piece of linen. Dearest. I regret I'm unable to fetch you myself. My husband, Derek, will explain why I was unable to be with you. Our plans did not turn out as we'd expected, my sweet sister. I boarded the wrong ship and landed in Scotland. I can tell you more when you join me, or you can ask Derek and he will explain. Derek is a good man, as are the others. I trust these men with my life and with yours. I miss you terribly and hope this finds you well. Forgive me for taking so long to get word to you. It's a story I will relish sharing with you when we're together again. We always said we wanted adventure, did we not? I love you very much and pray for you every day. I pray you'll have a safe journey to my arms. I know we will be happy here together. Marjorie. Tears blurred the words as she read them again and again. It didn't reveal much, this letter. It told her nothing, which others would not want her to believe in order to lure her elsewhere. My child. Deacon Eddard expressed his interest. What does it say? Is she well? I simply do not know, she admitted. I do not know. There is nothing personal. Nothing to tell me that it was my sister who wrote it, or if she wrote it of her own will. Many people want adventure in their lives. That means nothing. What is it you're fearful of? That these men forced her to write to you. Hearing it spoken aloud made her feel quite foolish, but that did little to ease her fears. I simply do not know, she said again, shaking her head mournfully. They both looked up at the sound of an approaching horse, and Beatrice sprang to her feet when she recognized the man on horseback as one of the men who'd come to the house. He's one of them, she whispered, wiping away her tears with the back of her hand. The deacon tilted his head to one side. I feel as though I've seen him before. Impossible, she hissed. He's Scottish. He did seem to be the kindest of all of them. The man didn't make a move to descend from his horse, who seemed interested in Cecil. The two of them touched noses and sniffed at each other as the man gazed their way. He was quite tall, dark-haired with kind dark eyes set deep in his face. He wore a plain grey tunic over plain trousers. Nothing like Lord Randall's fine clothing, another sign that he had nothing to do with the nobleman. She might even have considered him handsome, had she not been so afraid of him, and had he been a bit neater. His thick hair was not too long, and his firm jaw bore dark stubble. He'd been away from home for a while, she surmised. What do you want, she called out. I thought I asked you to go away. Ah, you did. And I did. We are no longer on your farm. This was true. She took a step toward him, ignoring the hand Deacon Eddard placed on her arm. Why are you here? Why did you follow me? He cleared his throat, shifting in the saddle as though he were uncomfortable with his mount or with what he was about to say. Perhaps both. I was concerned for you, lass. You seemed quite upset and not with us. I felt as though I should return and ask why it is you thought we were coming to remove you from your home. I don't believe it's any of your business. My friends and I have travelled a fortnight to bring you back to lands protected by the Clan Duncan, where your sister waits for ye. I believe that makes your business my business, lass. 
The two of them stared at each other, and Beatrice regretted the deacon's presence. He prevented her from saying the things she wished to say to this impertinent foreigner. She would have liked nothing better than to tell him exactly what she thought of him in that moment. The deacon spoke up standing beside her again. What proof have you that the person who wrote this letter is Beatrice's sister? The Scotsman frowned. Her name is Marjorie. She is a rather stubborn lass. We met her in Kirkcaldy, Derek and I. Her mother passed away over the winter, and she and her sister here came up with a plan for Marjorie to go to London and send for Beatrice when she settled down. Beatrice blinked hard. This only tells me you've met my sister and she might have written this. She raised the letter in her hand. But not that she didn't write it under duress. The Scotsman nearly growled, his eyebrows knitted together over eyes which flashed with anger. I knew this wouldn't be as simple a task as the others thought it would be. She was going to come along with us, was all set to do it, until she... Was it her imagination, or did his cheeks darken in a blush? Until she what? Again he shifted in discomfort. She a as her husband told you she's with child. And she's very ill, every day. Too ill to travel or even leave her bed most days. Beatrice's heart clenched in response to this. Poor Marjorie. Discovering she was to have a child must have been a thrill, her illness would only mar that joy. If it was true, why would he lie? She wanted desperately to believe him. To leave forever, to not need to worry about marrying a man she didn't love or even like. To be with Marjorie again, who she had feared dead for so long already. I want to believe you, she replied after some thought. But it isn't as simple as packing up and leaving with you. I do not know you. There would be no chaperone. There are arrangements which would have to be made. And the young lady is to be married. Beatrice's head whipped around, her eyes burning into the side of the deacon's covered head. It wasn't his place to announce such a thing, and the way he did it too. As though her marriage were agreed upon, and a date had been set. Is this true lass? The man sounded surprised to say the least. I was under the impression, there were no men worth speaking of in the area. Marjorie made it sound as though the two of you were alone, and it looked as though you were alone, certainly. She ignored this. It's not as simple as that. But it is one of the arrangements I would need to put in place before I left for Scotland. I suppose. We would need to leave soon. Immediately, if possible. That's impossible. She shrugged. I'm sorry, but if you wish to take me back with you, I must arrange the sale of the farm at least. Couldn't you take care of it for her? He looked at Deacon Eddard. She could trust a man of God surely. She glanced at the deacon, and shook her head ever so slightly to signal her feelings about this. I feel it would be best for me to be here, while the matter is settled. I want to go with you and be with my sister again, but I can't simply leave with you because you tell me to. You can share that with your friends. Including your brother-in-law, the man reminded her in a dangerously quiet voice. Don't you think you should share this with your brother-in-law in person? I don't know him. You tell him yourself. My mind is made up. In reality, nothing could have been further from the truth. Her knees nearly knocked together as she faced him. He was so very big, with hands that could easily bruise or break her if she angered him. And yet he'd been the kindest of the three men. And he had come back to speak with her. That meant something. He sighed as though he were the most put-upon man in the world. I suppose I should meet up with them then, and let them know. Do you need an escort back to your home? The thought of this Scotsman with his strange accent and rough ways escorting her was nearly laughable, but not so when she considered the possibility of finding Lord Randall on the road, as she had before. He had made his intentions known, and was less likely to keep his distance. Yes? Please. I should go back and tend to the animals. She looked at the deacon who she'd never seen so surprised and disconcerted. I will call on you soon, he promised as she mounted Cecil and brought him around to face the direction of the farm.
She nodded in response and gave him what she hoped was a convincing smile. Who was she trying to convince? Him or herself? Chapter 10 I must apologize. Beatrice rode beside Brock on her slow, tired gelding who looked as though he'd just as soon take a long nap in the hay than carry a rider. They kept an easy pace as a result, but Brock didn't mind. It would give him more time to understand her and convince her, possibly. For what, he asked. She clicked her tongue to signal the horse, who kept trying to wander off the road and into the banks of clover which lined it. Brock found it difficult to keep from laughing at the animal. For forgetting your name. Did you ever introduce yourself? I was a bit distraught when you arrived. You don't greet all visitors with sword in hand. And you seemed so experienced too. Her cheeks flushed nearly dark enough to match her hair. I don't appreciate being laughed at. Something you share with your sister, he observed. My name is Brock. Brock, she murmured, chewing her lip. You do know my sister, then? She gets very angry when she feels as though someone is laughing at her. Or when someone tells her something she doesn't want to hear. Such as when her husband informed her she wasn't well enough to make the journey with us. He winced before chuckling quietly at the memory. Was she very upset? She threw nearly everything she could reach. That sounds like Marjorie. The depth of emotion in her words surprised him. When he looked over, he noticed her quivering chin and tear-filled eyes. I didn't mean to upset you. Sarah, who's a skilled healer, assured us it's not unheard of for a woman to experience such illness while carrying a child. It's not that, she replied, her voice thick with tears. It's that I feared the worst. Why didn't she try to reach me before now? I don't know. I wish I did. Something the two of you will have to talk about when we arrive. Did you really think it would be as easy as telling me to come with you and leaving the same day? She asked, watching him from the corner of her eye. He kept his gaze focused on the road ahead as he replied. When she put it to words like that, the journey sounded somewhat ill-planned. Your sister made it sound as though you were merely waiting for word. I was. Every day, I hoped to hear something. Every time I went into the village, I hoped there would be word waiting for me. Every rider on the road past the farm I hoped carried something for me. Have you ever waited like that, Brock? Every day, waiting for something to happen. Something which meant more than anything to you. Your entire life, or so it seemed. He was quiet for a moment before answering. Yes, I have. Rather than asking what he'd waited for, she continued, then you understand. I wasn't preparing so much as I was simply waiting. Holding on to hope because it was all I had. Now you know, do you not? There's nothing holding you back. You're a free lass, able to go as she pleases. Even so, I can't leave Bess and Cecil with no one to care for them. I thought you lived alone. She chuckled, patting the horse's neck. This is old Cecil. He's been a good friend to me during these lonely fortnights on my own. As has Bess. Our cow. He smiled. Ah. I see. I'm certain you could find someone to care for them, couldn't ye? If someone were to purchase the land, wouldn't the animals come along with it? I suppose. She didn't sound convinced, however, and he felt for her. She had a good heart, and had become attached to the only friends she'd felt she could depend upon. The fact that those friends happened to be farm animals only made his feelings for her soften further. You've no business holding any soft feelings for the lass, he reminded himself. He also reminded himself of the deacon, who it was clear had wanted to protect her from the big, frightening, threatening Scott. The deacon was dangerous. Did you hear me? Beatrice's voice held the same note of irritation her sisters did from time to time. Had he not known better, he would have thought it was Marjorie riding beside him down that country road. I'm sorry. I did not. She sighed. I asked what sort of home my sister lives in. Is it a farm? Or someplace grander? She demanded the laird allow her to live in the village near the manor house. 
demanded. Beatrice's laugh rang out, the sort of laugh that brought a smile to Brock's face. When she laughed in such a way she sounded young. Not so troubled. She's living in the manor house of late, with the women keeping watch over her. She was not pleased at being told what to do. I wouldn't expect anything less. Ah, so there are people there who care for her. Brock nodded, and she fairly glowed with pleasure. I'm so glad. I had prayed for just such a thing. And she has prayed for you. I know she has. He suddenly felt embarrassed at having shared such an intimate detail. It wasn't for him to speak in such a way. Silence fell between them, filled only with the twitterings of the birds who sang away in the trees all about them, and the clip-clop of hooves on the road. So long as he'd already made a fool of himself, he thought it made little difference what he said next. Who are you afraid of? She took a deep breath, and the top of Cecil's head suddenly held great interest for her as she stared at it. Who said I'm afraid? The sword ye greeted us with for one. It didn't need to speak in order for me to understand. And the way you accused us of being there to take you elsewhere, when we hadn't so much as spoken a word of going anywhere, led me to believe there's somebody, somewhere, who wants to take you away. I was foolish. I acted before I thought. There was nothing to be so afraid of. She glared at him, indignant. What would you think if three strange men rode up to your home looking as you do? As we do. You're Scottish, she replied slowly. And the twins, I suppose they are twins, appeared rather rough. Derek and Hugh, Brock explained. And Derek's a sight good enough for your sister. I don't know that she would appreciate your jumping to conclusions about him. He half expected her to fly into a temper, as Marjorie would have. Instead, she appeared to take his words to heart. You are correct. Of course. I shouldn't make judgments based upon such trifling things as appearance or the place from which a man hails. None of that matters when compared to one's character. The sort of mature, rational thing he would have expected her to say, based upon what Marjorie had described. But you were already very frightened. Most people do not think clearly when they're frightened. That is so. What is it you were frightened of? Or whom? Her jaw worked as though she wanted to speak but was too frightened to do so. Or too angry. He sensed the deep vein of temper which ran through her, as it ran through Marjorie, even if she was better at managing it than her sister, Beatrice was just as full of fire and fury. Deacon Eddard spoke of my marriage, she whispered, sounding almost as though she fought not to choke on the words. I. The mention of it filled him with displeasure, though he didn't know why. It is not a marriage of my wishing, she explained, speaking slowly, choosing her words carefully, as though she were only just deciding how she felt about the marriage in that moment. Why did you agree to it then? Her head whipped to the side, her eyes flashing. I didn't agree. I've never agreed. I've never spoken to the man about a marriage to him or anyone else. I see. No, I don't think you do. I don't think anyone does. The lord of a noble family wishes to take my family's land. I suppose that isn't enough. I would sell it to him and gladly if that were the case. He could afford a good amount of silver. He wants more than that, Brock mused. He wants a wife. A family. Heirs, she agreed. Something about this made his blood fairly boil. Why did it matter what happened to this stranger? Why did it make him want to hit something or someone as hard as he could? It isn't fair. I've never believed such arrangements to be fair. I agree with you. You won't go through with it then. He had to give her credit for bravery, for even thinking she was in a position to refuse a powerful man's wishes. Was it possible? Would the man, whoever he was, allow her to turn him away and leave the country? Doubtful. Absolutely not, she snarled. Now, I have another option. I can go with you, I can be with my sister. I will merely tell him I've made other plans, and offer the farm and everything it entails up to him. Although? She cleared her throat when her voice broke, then went on. 
Although it pains me to consider leaving behind my home, that which my father worked hard to build, I must consider my own life now. A remarkable woman. A strong one and intelligent. And incredibly foolish. What he was thinking as a result was incredibly foolish too, but that didn't stop him from speaking the words aloud. You would need protection. If you were to face this man. You should not go alone. You think not? She tried to affect an air of calm, of mere interest rather than fear. But he saw it in her, the gnawing worry. She had feared so many things already, and had been all alone. He hated the way he didn't want her to be alone anymore. He cleared his throat feeling awkward and tongue-tied. A man who would decide to marry a woman simply because he wants her land and her womb, begging your pardon, should not be taken lightly. There is no telling for certain what such a man would do if disappointed. You speak as though you know of such men. I knew of one such man. A long time ago. He gritted his teeth against the memory, which seemed to be bubbling up more and more unbidden. The farmhouse was coming into view, with its weathered walls and thatched roof which looked as though it needed repair in more than one place. There was no one there to help her with even that task. He had to speak quickly, in order to make her turn her thoughts in the right direction. You know, there's something else you could do. Another choice you could make. And what is that? You could simply come with us. Leave word with the deacon that you place the land in his hands, to do with as he sees fit. Donate it to the church if you wish. Anything. Only shake yourself free of the burden and come with us. First thing in the morning. You might even come with me now, and stay the night in the village. We'll make the trip to Sillith and sail from there. She chewed her lip, looking out over the land which was now hers, the two of them having crossed the borderline. He understood how she felt. She wanted to agree with him, to accept his invitation and run away. She had been bearing the burden for far too long, and yearned for freedom, or at least the chance to do something for herself to protect her life and her interests. But damn the lass's stubbornness when she shook her head. I can't do that. It isn't so simple. They reached the rough-hewn log fence which separated the house from the road, and she slid from the back of the horse before tying him off to one of the logs. Why not, in the name of all that's holy? He didn't mean to raise his voice, knowing how it would upset her, but she pushed him to it. He'd only once or twice in his life met anyone who made his temper flare outside the reaches of his control. And that was all it took for her temper to flare in response. She stood there glaring at him, hands on her hips and eyes flashing fire. He threw his right leg over his gelding's back and hit the ground. For one thing, she spat, if I were to run without facing the Lord first he might follow me. Which would mean he'd be following you too. Would I put three innocent men in danger, simply because I was foolish or frightened enough to run from my responsibilities? You think he would do that? You said it yourself, she retorted, throwing her head back. A man such as that, after having been denied, might be capable of anything. If we leave at first light, we could be far away by the time he even knows you've left. It isn't as though you'd ask the deacon to make an announcement for ye. It might even be better if he behaved as though he didn't know. It would buy you more time. I will not run away, she decided. It doesn't matter how you try to force me into it or try to talk me into it. I won't go with you until I'm good and ready. He let out a deep sharp breath, his nostrils flaring like an angry boar's. He understood what it meant to fly into a rage because he was nearly there. If ye intend on waiting until you're good and ready, ye won't be going anywhere at all. Ye can rot here on this pitiful farm or marry your lordship and be his broodmare for all I care. The sharp stinging slap of her hand across his face was more surprising than it was painful. She didn't hurt him, not really. Not one as small as she. If anything, she'd hurt herself. Her eyes flew open before she fell back a few steps, holding her right hand in her left. Get off my land, she ordered. Now Brock. He didn't need to be told twice. Chapter 11 Beatrice's hand throbbed horribly. 
her wrist too. She'd never hit another living being before, not ever. It hurt. But it didn't seem as though it had hurt him very much. Or at all. She waited until he had ridden out of sight, before she untied Cecil's reins from the fence and led him to the stable to feed and water. Poor old Bess mooed pitifully. I'll be right there, she promised, hurrying through pulling a bucket of water from the well before she could milk the cow. Always the same chores. Always the same life. She could run away. She had the chance. Bess mooed again, louder this time. Beatrice shook away the selfish fantasy of running away with the three Scotsmen, in favor of taking care of what was in front of her. Her palm and fingers were stiff, as she attempted to curl them around one of the cow's udders. She'd put all of the force of her arm behind that slap, and he had barely flinched. He looked surprised. Deeply, thoroughly. And angry too. Even so, as angry as he'd been, he hadn't struck back. He hadn't even raised his voice any louder than he had when they were arguing. She hadn't been afraid of him. Astounded at herself, perhaps. But not afraid of him. How was it possible? She had never known more than a handful of men, all of whom had been kind to her, but her mother had told her tales of violent men. Angry men. Men who would gladly hurt a woman, or worse. Mother had sown so much fear. So much distrust. There were times when Beatrice wondered if she had deliberately set out to render her daughters unable to function in the world, out among other people. Perhaps she had, out of her own fear of being left alone in her illness. Her illness. Beatrice disliked herself for smirking at the thought, her cheek pressed against the cow's flank while she worked the udders. The stinging in her hand was less, her fingers working more easily. Mother's illness. Was she ever truly as ill as she made out? What good God-fearing daughter would question such a thing? She hated her questions. And yet? There were times when she thought she'd heard mother up and about. Times when there had been footsteps from a woman who swore she couldn't rise from her bed. Times when items on the other side of the room were out of place from where Beatrice had left them, while Marjorie was visiting with Cedric or in the village to go shopping. She'd never voiced her concerns to her sister, and certainly never to her mother. She had merely gone on caring for her, preparing her food and drink, washing and brushing out her hair, helping her bathe. Every day for years. Endless prayers. By firelight, by candlelight, by the light of dawn. Throughout the day, nearly non-stop. And at those times, especially when the strain of caregiving became too much, Beatrice had asked herself what she would have done in her mother's place. No husband. Two daughters who would one day grow up and leave her. Who would find lives of their own, while she was on her own for the rest of her life. No security, no companionship, no guarantee of anything. Beatrice had only been alone for several months, and knew the pain of loneliness. It was the sort of pain her mother had feared. Along with so many other things. In the end, it had been a sudden illness which had taken her mother's life. Something other than that which had supposedly kept her bedridden for so many years. The inability to breathe, a sort of gurgling in the lungs which the local healer had suggested could result from lying in bed for so long without movement. If that were true, mother had played a role in her own death. Perhaps by then it hadn't mattered to her. What did she have to live for? At the time, she had forgiven her mother and would continue to forgive her until her final breath. She'd been so unhappy, superstitious and fearful, always anxious in regards to the unknown. It was no way to live. She carried the milk pail to the house, leaving a much happier cow in the barn, reflecting as she did on her own fears. The icy pit of fear in her stomach when she considered travelling with three strange men. Fear at the thought of what Lord Randall might do to her, if he found out she'd run away when he expected them to marry. Was it enough to hold her back? to keep from joining her sister. Marjorie hadn't allowed such fears to keep her planted on the farm. If she'd backed down, she wouldn't have met her husband. She wouldn't be with child, the way Beatrice knew she'd always wanted to be one day. As she herself did. 
Marriage to Lord Randall would make that possible, but at what cost? It was all too much to make sense of. The more she turned the situation around in her head, the greater her confusion. Marjorie's letter was still tucked in her sleeve, and she withdrew the folded linen in order to read it again and again. There was so little shared. So many questions. Would there be room for Beatrice there? What might she do with her life once she'd become settled? Would Brock be there? What did that matter? The thought of ever facing him again made her face fairly burn with embarrassment. She had struck him, and he didn't seem the sort of man to take kindly to such treatment. Though he hadn't harmed her, it was like as not that he wouldn't be kind to her. And there she was, needing his kindness. The kindest of all three men, if she were to travel with them over rough roads and sail to Scotland. How long would such a voyage take? How long would she have to be in close quarters with the man she'd slapped? She was not proud of what she'd done, and knew she should apologize, but he had been cruel with his tongue. Telling her she might just as well rot. Why did it seem more important to him, than to the others that she go with them immediately? Why had he been the one to return for her? Why not Derek, her brother-in-law? I'm on my way ladies, she assured the chickens on passing the co-op. There were so many things to consider, so many responsibilities. When would there ever come a time for her to face the responsibility to herself? Chapter 12 The ride back to the village inn seemed longer than it should have. Much longer than the ride to the farm had seemed. Because Brock had more on his mind. Bees floated here and there over the flowers to either side of the road, great bursts of white and blue and yellow, which sent a heady sort of scent into the air. Now that the sun had fully risen in the sky, and the air had warmed as a result, the heady sweetness was nearly intoxicating. Twittering birds sang musically, their wings beating against the late spring breeze as they sailed from tree to tree. Larger animals cavorted in the woods too. The horse's ears twitched this way and that as it registered the sounds, picking them up on both sides. Brock wasn't concerned about the animals or the bees, which occasionally buzzed around his head. It didn't matter that the day was turning into a sparkling beautiful one, with a cloudless sky of the deepest blue. The sort of day he loved spending on the sea, when the horizon stretched out before him and the water in all directions. None of that mattered, when it appeared as though he was helplessly stuck in Thrushwood. Stuck there with no way out until the stubborn, stupid lass saw fit to leave with them. There'd be no living with Marjorie if they left Beatrice behind. That much he knew. Derek would never allow it either, knowing how much it meant to his wife to have Beatrice at her side. Especially with the child on its way. Brock didn't particularly enjoy the idea of leaving her behind either. He wouldn't wish the sort of lonely, frightened existence she'd fallen into on anyone. Not on his worst enemy. The lass had nothing to do but perform chores every day, and confess her troubles to a horse and a cow. What sort of life was that? Even so, what sort of life awaited him if those who would see him in a cell found him in Thrushwood? He remembered that cell, the one he'd broken free of. The rank stench, the dankness the constant cold and damp, the darkness. Prisoners weren't allowed access to the light, as it might give them hope. And hope was terribly dangerous. The night he'd broken free, even the light of the moon had been a shock to his eyes. It was a mistake, coming here. And you knew it. Why did you do it? He'd been a fool, yes, but what reason could he have given? Derek didn't know, and never would so long as Brock had anything to do with it. He'd lied at first because he'd needed the position, and no one would accept into service a man who'd been charged with a crime. Lucky for him, the owner of McKinnis Shipping hadn't done any inquiring into the story Brock had dreamed up. A past with no mistakes, no sour memories, no running. There was no way Brock could have refused Derek's final request before turning over the running of the business. Travelling with him to Thrushwood hadn't been a question. It hadn't even really been a request, though he preferred to think of it that way. There hadn't been a question as to whether he was expected to accompany the others. In any other situation, 
if the destination had been any other, there wouldn't have been a moment's hesitation. They could have lingered at the inn for days, as they had while in Kirkcaldy, and he wouldn't have cared, aside from a sense of impatience. He would have wanted to get on with it, so he might get back to work, back to visiting new harbours. Would that were the case? Would the deacon Beatrice relied on were any other man? He'd known Eddard instantly on first sight, and it had taken all of his sense of self-control to keep from racing the horse back down the road through Thrushwood and on to Silleth. And Eddard had known him. The man had a long memory, it seemed. There had been no words or knowing looks between them, but he'd sensed the recognition just the same. He'd warned Beatrice, wouldn't he? Once he placed Brock's face and connected it to that terrible night, and all the terrible nights which followed. Brock tied off the horse beside the low-slung long building they'd spent the night in. The only night they were supposed to stay. He had battled irritation on their arrival, silently angry that Derek would even consider the possibility of their needing more than one night in the village. His friend had insisted on expressing this to the innkeeper nonetheless. It looked as though he'd made the right decision, as there was little chance of them leaving yet with Beatrice in tow. They were waiting for him in the great room which served as a dining area for lodges, though the food offered by the cook was hardly worth the extra cost the innkeeper added to the price of a room. Brock had to wonder if this was a ploy to empty the purse of a foreigner, offering subpar food which might just as easily be thrown out for stray animals, and more than likely should be. It was fortunate that the three of them had enough silver between them to leave them with options. Without waiting to find out what had happened at the farm, Derek and Hugh joined Brock just outside and walked down the wide street on their way to the nearest tavern. After the day he'd had up to that point, he thought a large mug of wine wouldn't be out of the question. So, Derek asked, once they were out of earshot of any interested parties. While the farm was far from the village, it was doubtless most people who called Thrushwood home would recognise Beatrice's name. It was best they keep the nature of their visit to themselves, which meant not speaking about it while in the presence of others. She's just as stubborn as that sister of hers, Rock grumbled, wishing there was something nearby for him to kick. And she's got quite a strong hand too. She hit you. Hugh asked, barely concealing a laugh. She did. As hard as she could, I wager. Why would she do that? Derek asked. What did you say to her? Ah, so you think it's my fault, is that it? The lass greeted us at the door with a sword in hand, and you still assume it was my fault she slapped me. The twins snorted behind his back, and he could only guess at the cause of their mirth. They hadn't been there. They didn't know how impossible she was to reason with. The facts are these, he continued, as though he took no notice of their chuckles. Someone, a nobleman, expects her to marry him. That silenced his companions as he'd known it would. Derek took his arm, stopping him in his tracks. And she's going to go through with it. She doesn't want to, Brock explained, sighing heavily. She's appalled at the notion. I've an idea it was him she was so afraid of, the reason she greeted us as she did earlier today. She thought he was coming to take her away, Hugh Mew's teeth gritted. It seems that way, Brock agreed. She doesn't want to leave with us until the situation is settled. Fears that if she were to leave today or any time before speaking with him first and explaining her refusal, he might come after her, which would place us in danger. She's a smart lass, Derek murmured, frowning. He might do just that. Men such as him simply take what they want. It matters little whether what they want wants to be taken. It's easy to forget that not all nobles are like Philip. Philip Duncan would never order a woman to marry him. He'd never force a lonely, frightened lass into handing over her property, simply because he wanted it for himself. I've half a mind to find this man and settle things for her, Derek growled. She's the sister of my wife, and therefore under my protection. He has no right to force her into anything. He'll be quite surprised to find she's not as alone in the world as he thinks she is, he observed with a snarl. Brock, meanwhile, held a far different opinion. I say we take the lass whether she wants to go or not. Tonight. And get out of this place. 
The two of them stared at him, unblinking. Why not? he asked, eyes darting back and forth to ensure their ability to speak freely. He lowered his voice. We can go to the farm tonight and pack a few of her things. I'll ride with her. It isn't more than two days on horseback to Silith. The twins looked at each other, having a silent conversation. It unnerved Brock to no end when they did this, and they knew it. You might as well say what you have to say aloud, rather than discussing it in your heads, he muttered. All right then, but I'll think a lot more clearly once I have a little food in me. Come. Derek jerked his head in the direction of the tavern, still several buildings down from where they stood. Brock had no desire to discuss what he had in mind, while in the presence of strangers who'd more than likely pay more attention than normal to a trio of foreigners, but he followed nonetheless. The way Derek and Hugh looked at him, anyone would think he'd suddenly begun speaking another language. The tavern was larger than the one he remembered from Kirkcaldy, larger even than some he'd visited in thriving harbours and towns throughout his travels. A good thing, since the extra space meant a better chance of finding a table away from the handful of patrons currently enjoying a hot meal and friendly conversation. Conversation which came to a halt once all eyes fell on the newcomers. Derek nodded, smiling, as they snaked their cautious way between tables which seemed to have been placed with no real scheme in mind. No scheme as to the size and appearance of them either, nor to that of the chairs. It appeared as though the owner had simply taken whatever was available, whether it was scarred, cracked, large or small. Like as not, most of it had been cast off by neighbours. They found a round table near the rear corner of the room, closest to the fireplace and therefore left empty on a warm day such as this. In the winter, it would be the most popular spot in the tavern. The three of them arranged themselves, and Brock noted how much warmer it was back there than elsewhere. So, Derek whispered, leaning across the table to be better heard. You've actually gotten it in your head to take her. Aye. He might as well own up to it, now that they knew what had been going through his head. We've already been far too gentle with her. What have we become? Women. Watch yourself, Hugh warned, not without good humour, but there was an edge to his voice. I'm merely pointing out that we've already given the last space in which to think things over. It's silly for her to be afraid, she'll be under our protection as we travel. What happens if she screams her head off the moment we reach Silith? Derek asked. We can't keep her bound and gagged once we've reached the harbour. By that time, she'll see it was for the best. Derek chuckled. You don't know women very well. Brock growled in frustration at this tired argument. And you do, naturally, because you have a bride, and I haven't. I've spent more time speaking with the lass than either of you, and I tell you she wants to come with us. She does. She's merely frightened. By all means then. Hugh smirked. We should sneak out to the farm and kidnap her. That will set her mind at ease. Neither of you see this for what it really is, Brock insisted, feeling more and more with each passing moment that he was fighting a losing battle. Two against one. They simply didn't understand. Derek's brows knitted together when he frowned. What is it then? Tell us. It's clear you know something we don't. A nervous-looking young woman joined them, glancing wide-eyed over her shoulder before speaking. What is it you'll be needing? she asked, looking down at the scarred stained wood of the table rather than at any of them. Roasted chicken, if you have any, Derek suggested. We only have boar, she whispered, shifting from one foot to the other. That will do, he replied, his voice low. Bread and cheese, and a tankard for the table. She merely nodded and darted away, as though even being near them was too much for her to stand. They don't like us here, Hugh observed as though it needed to be said aloud. I wonder why. Outsiders are rarely tolerated anywhere, Brock mused. Especially Highlanders. Highlanders don't have a good reputation, and you know it. All a bunch of lies and myths, Derek muttered, sounding very much unlike the way he'd sounded just moments before while speaking to the lass. And if she wanted to climb into your lap and wind her arms around your neck then? Hugh chuckled, giving Brock a good-natured shove. No, thank you. 
He laughed. I've already dealt with one last today, and we saw how that went. My cheek stung the entire way back from the farm. I'm not of a mind to repeat that. Hugh's smile faded. But you wished to frighten her even worse by taking her from her home. And you never did explain why this matters so much to you, why we need to be so quick about it, Derek added. And he hadn't wanted to, in fact he'd blessed the presence of the young woman, the fact that she'd provided a distraction. How could he explain himself without telling the entire truth? The last thing we need is entanglement with a noble, he whispered, careful to avoid the attention of eavesdroppers. Her fight is not our fight, not when there are three of us and no telling how many on his side. It's not just the land he wants, so offering it even for free won't be enough to satisfy him. You speak as though you know the man, Derek observed. She never revealed his name, but I've known a noble or two in my time. I know how vengeful they can be. The twins exchanged a glance. And yet you think it wrong for the English to think poorly of all Highlanders, simply over the actions of a few. It isn't the same thing, Brock insisted. I've known them personally. I haven't merely known of them or heard stories. English nobility, they're of another breed entirely. Nothing like you're accustomed to, knowing Philip as well as you do. The complete opposite. There's still no way of knowing for certain that this man is of the same sort, Derek insisted. I say we find out for ourselves, then go on from there. I, I second that, Hugh agreed. Brock marveled at the fact that he'd thought it necessary to express agreement with his brother, with whom he would naturally have taken sides. It was clear to Brock what he'd need to do. The food arrived, giving them all an excuse to let the matter drop for the time being. Not that Brock could stop turning it over in his mind. But he was on his own at that point, and he knew it, so it was just as well the others couldn't read his thoughts. The meat was hot and far fresher than that which the innkeeper had tried to pass off as edible, and the three of them ate heartily of it. Until a new presence made itself known. Chapter 13 Brock knew him immediately, just as he had known the deacon. It had been seven years since he'd last set eyes on the man, but nothing had changed. The same golden hair swept high off his forehead. The same cold eyes. The same sneer and the clothing. Rich, sumptuous, trimmed in fur even in such warm weather. The man had always believed in displaying his wealth. That hadn't changed either. Those cold eyes swept over the tavern, and Brock knew it wasn't his imagination, that the room had indeed gone deathly quiet. There was an important gentleman present, after all. A terrible thought occurred to him. Something beyond what he'd already imagined. Was it possible? Could this be the nobleman Beatrice was so frightened of? No. It would be far too great a coincidence. The sort of coincidence which simply didn't occur. Incredible how the sight of a person could bring back memories he'd fought so hard to push down, to lose in the depths of his mind. It was bad enough that the sight of the deacon had stirred up so much he'd tried to forget. This. This was like being thrown into a cell all over again like fighting off the rodents who took every opportunity to bite him as he slept, like fighting off sleep, because he knew he'd be their victim the moment his eyes closed. He could almost hear their paws on the hard dirt floor as they darted here and there, all around him. A shudder ran through his body, and he reminded himself that was the past. Not the present. He was no longer a prisoner. When the man's eyes fell on their table, Brock noted the way Derek's hand drifted down to where the dirk was hidden beneath his tunic. Leave it, he whispered through clenched teeth. Brock knew it wouldn't end well if Lord Randall so much as suspected one of them was armed. You must be the three foreigners who've been visiting my intended, he announced in a loud voice, looking around to gauge the reactions of the other patrons. I understand you've paid a visit to the farm of a young woman living on her own, with no chaperone to speak of. Brock's hands curled into fists, a block of ice taking the place of his stomach. It was true. This was Beatrice's nobleman, the one who demanded her hand in marriage. The one she might have been forced to marry, had it not been for their arrival. 
because he would lay down his very life if need be, if it meant her freedom. He wouldn't leave her in the clutches of a monster. The tavern's owner came running from a back room. Lord Randall, it's an honor to have you here. What brings you to my establishment? These men, he replied, glaring at them. They took the liberty of stepping foot on the property belonging to my intended. Brock's fists tightened hidden by the table. What he would have given for the privilege of smashing his fists against the man's face. Derek spoke first in a carefully measured voice. Has the young woman asked for your protection against us? Did she give you a reason to find us? She didn't need to, Randall scoffed, tossing his head so the golden strands of hair glowed in the firelight. The ears had been kind to him, but then why shouldn't they have been? He need only wake in the morning at whatever time suited him, and find a way to fill his days with leisure. If that had been Brock's lot in life, he might appear ageless too. Then you're here to accuse us of calling on a young lady. Hugh asked, a hint of humour in his voice. There's no reason for a filthy Highlander to call on a young Englishwoman, especially one who is betrothed to a lord, Randall retorted, eyes narrowed. Derek stood slowly with his hands in plain sight. He was no fool. He'd do nothing to lure the man into a fight. The young lady to whom you refer is the sister of my wife, sir. We were paying a visit at my wife's request. She was unable to make the journey on her own, or she would explain all to you. Randall's surprise was evident, as was the shock of those seated elsewhere. You're wed to the young woman who once shared the house, he sputtered. Derek nodded. I am, sir, and she's half-owner of the farm as well. Which places her sister under my protection, and I regret to request it, but I'd prefer we no longer speak of her in such an establishment. It is improper for gentlemen to refer to their womenfolk in a tavern. Silence then snide laughter. I see no gentlemen before me. Only Highlanders who have no business being here. Now that you've paid your visit, you can find your way out of the village. I'm well aware of the arrangement you've made with the local innkeeper, but that arrangement will no longer be honoured as of dawn tomorrow. You are to leave this village and this country if you know what's good for you. Who will see to it that this happens? Hugh demanded. Randall merely shrugged, the shoulders of his silk cape shimmering. I'll leave it up to you, gentlemen. He smirked. I see no reason why I shouldn't take you at your word. Granted, if I hear you've lingered around the village or along the outskirts, you will leave me no choice but to catch up with you again. The tavern's owner finally spoke up. I don't wish to see any trouble here, my lord. And there will be no trouble, Randall replied without taking his eyes from the three of them. Isn't that correct? Derek fairly shook with the strain of holding himself back. That's correct. My lord. Pardon? Randall let out a tiny sigh to signal his exasperation. It's typical for a lord such as myself to be addressed as such. Your mistake is understandable, I suppose, since you Highlanders aren't accustomed to the way civilized people conduct themselves. Derek spoke not a word in reply. Nothing to defend himself, nothing to argue the point, and no apologies. He didn't even correct himself for leaving out the man's title. He merely glared at him with hatred he didn't bother to disguise, eyes unblinking, nostrils flaring, muscles jumping in his jaw. And Lord Randall saw it for what it was, or else he wouldn't have backed down. Enough of this. I'm a busy man. If you know what's good for you, you won't pay any further visits to my betrothed. While she may have been under your protection as you call it, she is now mine. The cape he wore swirled around him when he turned. Brock recognized the gesture, one the man had likely studied. What else did he have to do with his life, except practicing how to make an entrance and an exit? The tavern remained silent once he was gone, all eyes on the trio near the fire. I suppose you wish us to leave, Derek said, eyes shifting from the empty doorway to the owner of the establishment. The bald, short little man's face turned deep red. Yes, and quickly too. I didn't like the looks of you when you entered, and now I understand why. We don't need any trouble from your sort in here, and certainly no trouble from the likes of Lord Randall. 
We did nothing to cause trouble, Hugh began, his voice no longer carrying a note of humor, but Derek held up a hand to silence his brother. Never mind. Let us settle our debt and be gone. I don't want your money, the bald man spat, pointing to the door. Get out. Brock stood surprised. Since when did a man refuse payment? He dropped a few pence on the table nonetheless. If any of you would like this then, he muttered, looking at all of them before following his companions out into the night. Let it never be said that he left debts unpaid. He hadn't risen from his chair while the nobleman was in the tavern, as Hugh and Derek had. And he hadn't spoken. Anything to avoid Randall's attention. Anything to keep Randall from recognizing the man who'd killed his nephew. Hugh had noticed. Why did you say nothing in there? he asked as they walked to the inn, all three of them keeping a fast pace. There was no telling how many of the villagers knew of Lord Randall's orders, how they were to leave Thrushwood at dawn. News travelled fast in small villages, Brock knew. It was likely most of the people up and down the street were already aware. What was there to say, he asked. It was him against us, which meant the entire tavern was against us, and I've already warned you about men such as him. You see now that I was right all along. He has no intention of treating us fairly. I only wonder how he knew of our visit. You don't think Beatrice would have told him, do you? Derek asked. He seemed to take Brock's silence better than his brother, most likely because they'd known each other for so long. He knew his longtime first mate was no coward. She hates him, Brock muttered. And with good reason. She wasn't alone in that. She'd never go to him. She might not entirely trust us, but she fears him. There's the difference. How would he know then? Word travels, Brock reminded the two of them. Just as it had travelled after that terrible night, the night he first made the acquaintance of Henry Randall and later his uncle Geoffrey. What are we to do? Hugh wondered. We can't simply leave without her. Marjorie would never get over it. Nor would Beatrice, Brock muttered. We cannot leave her here. I'm still of a mind to go out to the house tonight. You'll do no such thing, Derek snapped. What if someone is there, waiting? Watching the house? After having made the acquaintance of Lord Randall, I can easily imagine him leaving one or more of his men by the road to watch out for us. Damn the bastard soul to hell. He would never let them take her. Why hadn't Beatrice agreed to leave with them? They might already be on their way if things had gone according to plan. They would have to go according to Brock's plan then. He didn't wish to cause the lass any further strain, but what would be worse than the strain of being forced into marriage with a brute? In the end she would thank him for it. He only needed to get to her. That would be the greatest challenge. The three of them gathered their belongings in silence when they reached the inn, having avoided the innkeeper on the way to their room. Or perhaps it was he who avoided them, the coward. There was nothing else to do but discuss among themselves what was to be done next. Brock knew what had to be done and saw no reason to waste time, but he couldn't leave without explaining himself. I'll sit in the great room for a while, he declared, standing. I need to think. To straighten out my thoughts. Derek fixed him with a knowing look. You like the lass, don't you? It disturbs you to leave her to that man. As if he needed another reason to want to kill Lord Randall. It was true, and he knew it when Derek voiced the words. He did like her, more than he should considering that they'd only met that very day. He liked her strength, appreciated her intelligence and courage in the face of that which terrified her. Yes, he admitted. I do, and it does. More than I can explain. He left the two of them behind, going straight to a small desk which he'd spied earlier in the day. It was customary for innkeepers to prepare a place for their patrons to write messages before sending them on to loved ones or back to those they'd left behind. It would be easier to explain himself this way, he decided, pulling out a piece of linen on which to write. The faster he wrote, the easier it would be. So he hoped. Writing had never been his strong suit, 
and he took great pains with the lettering to be sure Derek would be able to understand. Derek. I've had to move ahead with the plan I discussed with you. I did not wish to call attention to all of us, nor to expose you to danger or added trouble. I must confess now something which I didn't wish to confess before now. I'm certain you will understand when I explain. He drew a deep breath, steadying his nerves and wishing he had a mug of ale at his side to aid him. Then again, he would need full control of his faculties in order to accomplish what he had in mind. Our meeting with the Lord tonight was not the first time I've met the man. It didn't seem as though he recognized me, but I knew him instantly. You see, seven years ago I killed his nephew. It was accidental. The young man, Henry Randall was the name, was attacking a young lass outside a brothel. It seemed as though she had refused him, or he had demanded something she didn't wish to grant him. He began beating her without mercy, while tearing at her clothes and forcing himself on her. Images from that night came rushing back all at once. The lass's blood on the ground, the tooth she had lost lying beside her after Henry Randall had punched her mouth. Bruises around her neck where his hands had closed around her throat and squeezed over her eyes where he had struck her. He torn her kirtle from top to bottom, leaving her plump body exposed to all, and was moving sharply on top of the unconscious woman when Brock had found them. I pulled him from her and throttled and hit him until he was dead. I did not mean to do it. I would not have gone so far if it hadn't been for the way he'd hurt the lass. She was nearly dead herself, covered in blood and bruises. Every time I looked at her, I hit him again. Until it was too late to stop. They put me in a cell, were going to hang me for what I did. Lord Randall visited me more than once. He demanded I be put to death, no matter what had brought on the attack on his nephew. It did not matter that I was only defending a woman the Lord's nephew had nearly killed. She was nothing to them. I do not know if she lived through what he did to her. They wouldn't tell me. I couldn't tell you of this, nor could I tell you of my escape. One of the men in charge of looking after the prisoners came to bring me gruel and water one night, the night before I was to be hanged. I hit him, knocked him out, and escaped on foot. I feared that this would come to pass, that Lord Randall would somehow find out I had returned to Thrushwood. Or that someone in the village would know me on sight. Refusing you would have meant confessing to my crime, which I could not bring myself to do. I did not wish for you to think less of me, for what I did years ago. I do not wish for you to think less of me now, and would rather have never confessed at all. I tell you now, just as I tell you that I've gone through with my plan. She cannot marry him. I won't leave without her. I will meet you in Silleth, the ship will be ready when you arrive. Do make haste. It was the entire story, barring some of the more gruesome details, and as much as he needed to know. So long as Derek was aware that Brock hadn't meant to kill the young man, much as he deserved it, there was little else he could do except hope his friends hurried to Silleth to join him and Beatrice. He rolled up the letter and took it with him to the room where Derek and Hugh had already fallen asleep. It was for the best that they had. The more time before anyone noticed he was missing, the better. He left the letter lying on the table beneath the basin, where both men would be sure to see it when they awoke. His heart was heavy. There was no turning back after a confession such as his. What would Derek think? Would he ever be able to regain his friend's trust? He worried over this as he stole silently from the inn, nearly tiptoeing until he was outside. The night was a clear one, the sky full of stars and hardly so much as a breeze to stir the air. If only Beatrice would be quiet and go easily, the task would be a simple one. He was wondering how he'd managed to convince her when a sharp pain exploded in the back of his head. Chapter 14 When Deacon Eddard arrived at the front gate, Beatrice didn't pretend to be surprised. Naturally, he would ride down to the farm to ensure that she was safe after being escorted home by a stranger. She had even set out two bowls on the table, in case he was there in time to share her evening meal. It would be a treat for her. She was tired of eating alone. He joined her at the table, 
but did not appear as though he wished to eat. His eyes were troubled, his hands constantly moving as he wrung them in his lap. What is it that has you worried? she asked between bites of stew. You can plainly see that no harm has come to me. I am well, I am safe. Though I'm glad you came to check on me, she added, making certain he understood her gratitude. And I'm happy to see you so well, my child, he assured her. That is not why I have come, however. There is something I need to discuss with you. I fought myself once it came to me, wondering if it were for the best that you know. It explained the ashy pallor of his skin, the way his eyes darted away whenever they met hers. He was a man with quite a lot on his mind. And it had to do with her. What came to you? she asked, leaving the spoon in the bowl, thoughts of eating suddenly less important. What is it you wish for me to know? He twisted his hands together again, shaking his head as he stared into his own bowl. The young man. The one you rode with earlier today. I recognized him at the time, or thought I did. I wasn't certain, until later. He has been to Thrushwood. It's been many years since he was here, but I knew him then. A little. Beatrice frowned, thinking back. I do not remember him. I believe I would remember someone so, large and strange, compared to everyone else in the village. He was passing through, or so I believe. Some of the details of the situation are unclear after so much time. I would not expect for you to ever have made his acquaintance, busy as you always were here. Imprisoned, you mean? How was it that you came to make his acquaintance? The hand ringing grew worse, more desperate. He was being held in one of the cells in the village. For prisoners, you understand. Prisoners. She lost her appetite, though she'd felt terribly hungry only moments earlier. The scent of stewed vegetables turned her stomach so that she pushed away the bowl. I visited, as I normally do, hoping to provide a small measure of comfort to the men being held there. The conditions are even worse now than they were at the time, it doesn't seem to matter how many protests I raise, or how I urge the villagers to treat the prisoners as human beings. What was he there for? She prompted, ready to scream at the way he took his time with things. Oh yes. Of course, the deacon continued. He? It seems he killed a man. Killed? She whispered, breathless, suddenly certain that her stomach would empty itself of its contents. No, not Brock. Brock was good, wasn't he? Gentle, even for a man of his size. He hadn't touched her. He had hardly raised his voice, and even when he had, it had been in response to her temper. I don't believe there was malice in his heart, Deacon Eddard insisted. I didn't believe it at the time, after hearing his confession. After hearing the specifics of what occurred on that evening, the night he killed Lord Randall's nephew. The world began twisting and twirling around her, as though she were lost in a strong wind which had lifted her from her chair and tossed her about. She found herself sliding to the floor, hitting it with a thump. The deacon flew to her side. I shouldn't have told you, he fretted helping her sit up. I knew I shouldn't have. I knew it would be too much for you, such a terrible crime. She shook her head, but wasn't able to speak until he guided a cup full of cool water to her lips. It helped revive her somewhat, cleared her head. It isn't what he did, she whispered as her entire body trembled. It's who he did it to. I'd heard of Henry Randall's death, but never of exactly what happened to him. It was a rather ugly affair, he murmured, helping her up into her chair and hovering over her until she was ready to scream at him to give her air. She didn't need him to flutter about. She needed to hear the truth. What happened? You can feel free to tell me. I'm not a child and I will not swoon again, she promised intending it with all her heart. I feel as though I shouldn't have. Tell me, she snapped, recoiling a bit at the harshness of her tone. But it was enough to stir him to speak again. He began wringing his hands again, overwhelmed. It seems as though the late Lord Randall's son was harming a young woman. I'm sure you're aware of the presence of a house of ill repute on the outskirts of the village. If she hadn't been so stricken, she might have giggled at the way the deacon blushed. I'm aware of it, she whispered. 
The accused, Brock his name was, was walking nearby and according to him, Henry had been in the act of abusing a young woman outside the building on the ground. He had beaten her horribly and was, taking advantage of the fact that she was no longer awake. Her clothing was torn, her face bloodied. Beatrice swallowed back a wave of nausea, forcing herself to stay conscious and in control of herself. Go on. You're certain? he asked with a wince, eyeing her doubtfully. I'm not a swooning fainting weak type, she insisted, glaring at him in spite of who he was. The coincidence of Brock being connected to Lord Randall was what caused me to lose control of myself. Not what he did. Please. Continue. He sighed shrugging. Knowing there was nothing to be done but finish his tale. Brock came across this and pummeled the young man. He didn't stop. Henry Randall died there on the spot. What happened to the young woman, she asked. A sad smile touched the corners of his mouth. Only one with a heart as true as yours would think to ask my child. Sadly she died as well. It appeared as though Randall had strangled her to death before Brock ever arrived on the scene. And yet it was Brock who had been imprisoned for the crime. He had only done the world a favor, ridding it of a monster. She'd never known Henry Randall personally, but had no trouble believing the nephew of Lord Randall to be a violent, murderous fiend. Lord Randall demanded he be hanged for it, the deacon explained. He wanted him hanged that very night, when several of the men who'd been. He cleared his throat, blushing again. Who'd been inside the building at the time brought Brock into the village. Once it was evident who the dead man was, Lord Randall and the late Lord stormed in and all but killed him themselves. What happened? How did he escape with his life? He ran away. Three days after the killing, he overpowered the man who'd been guarding the prisoners and ran. He was never found, as is obvious, seeing as how he's still alive. She took a few deep breaths, striving to calm herself. Her heart raced painfully, her head throbbing as a result. He'd come for her. He had returned to the place where he'd committed murder and escaped with his life to bring her to Marjorie, who was waiting back in Scotland. He didn't have to do it. The man was either a fool or incredibly brave. She wasn't certain which. Once the storm in her head calmed a bit, she looked up at the deacon who still hovered nearby, arms slightly outstretched as though he was ready to catch her. Why did you feel it so important to tell me this? I wanted you to know who he was, in case you decided to leave with him. I don't believe he meant to kill anyone. I believe he wanted only to help the young woman. Perhaps he was angry at Randall for what he'd done. I'm certain he was. And? He turned away, facing the fire, hands balled into fists. When he spoke again, his voice was tight with emotion. I'm not certain that I wouldn't do the same if I were in his place, though I know the severity of the sin. You see, I saw the young woman. I demanded to see her before she was given her pauper's grave. I saw what Henry did to her. Beatrice reached out touching his arm. I'll never tell anyone you said that. He chuckled softly. Thank you. Well? I know one thing, she decided standing. What? He can never meet Lord Randall. Not ever. He offered to visit him, you see along with the others, in order to speak for me. To come to an understanding about our marriage. I must find a way to make sure that doesn't happen. What could you do? I don't know for certain. She chewed her lip, staring out the window as she did. The evening hadn't wound down very far yet. It wasn't too late. It's too far a ride into the village, she mused aloud, twirling the end of her braid between her fingers. Much like the way the deacon wrung his hands, she needed something to busy herself as she pondered. But the ride to the manor house was a matter of minutes. An idea began to form. I know. She turned away from the window, determined. I'll visit the Lord right now and offer the farm to him. I'll tell him I'm going away to see my sister. That she's very ill and needs me. Deacon Eddard did not look convinced. You think he'll accept this? That it will be that simple? No. 
I don't think it will be that simple, she admitted. But I know it needs to be done. And I would be eternally grateful if you would come with me. Chapter 15 It was full dark by the time Beatrice and the deacon reached the manor house. Had it been possible to cut through her fields and into his, the trip would have taken no more than a few minutes. Over the road which bordered her land and that of the Randall family, it was a much longer ride. And it gave her plenty of time to think. Thinking was the last thing she needed to do just then, with so many concerns competing for her attention. It would have been better to simply act before she became overwhelmed. Think about the good which will come from this, she urged herself when her fingers tightened around the reins to the point of pain and her heart began to race. Think about how good it will be when things go your way. Her muscles eased slightly and her jaw relaxed. She only realized then that she'd been grinding her teeth, a bad habit she'd been certain of breaking years earlier. It would be a relief, having the situation with Lord Randall settled and the matter of the farm too. He didn't need to know that she was aware of his ties to Brock, or that she'd ever met the man. With the word of the deacon behind her, there would be no way to question her motives, or the fact that she needed to leave immediately. Who would dare question him? The house was even larger than she'd ever imagined, the walls made of stones held together with dried mud and stretching well above her head. How many rooms could such a house contain? Dozens, she guessed. The windows were tall and narrow, hardly allowing out any of the light from within. A wide path, almost a road, led up to the front of the house, and it too was paved with flat stones, which made their approach louder than she had intended it to be as the horses' hooves rang out against them. A large vaulted door sat in front of the house. Her mouth went dry when she thought of who was just behind that door. This could have been hers, or at least hers in name. Such a grand home, with so many servants working within. She heard them, a smithy worked in a smaller outbuilding to her left just past the main house. Even late in the day, his fire glowed, and the hammer he used sang against the iron he shaped. Farther off was a stable full of horses, she heard them neighing as young boys walked to and fro with buckets of straw. The animals would need to be taken care of for the evening, before the boys had their meal and got their rest. Have you been here before? she asked the deacon. Oh yes. Many times. The late Lord Randall and his late wife often sent for me. They lived by their faith unlike. His voice trailed off. And yet they had born and raised a monster. Just how faithful had they been? She knew Henry Randall's mother had died when he was just a boy, barely much older than she'd been when her father died. Perhaps that was the problem. Perhaps he might have turned out better had his mother lived. If that had been the case, the young woman he'd killed might still be alive. He himself might be alive. And Brock would never have killed him. She needn't have been so frightened for his sake, stomach clenching and knees shaking whenever she imagined him being discovered. The clocking of hooves grew louder, but Beatrice soon realized it was not their horses making the additional noise. There were men approaching behind them. For one brief, heart-stopping moment, she feared Brock and the others had come to meet with Lord Randall on her behalf. She looked over her shoulder, fear widening her eyes, but she recognized none of the four men riding their way down the stone-paved path. There was another horse with them, riderless, led by its reins in the hand of another rider. It carried something over its saddle. Something large, bulky, which hung down over both sides of the horse's ribs and bounced in time with the animal's trotting. The riders had no intention of keeping the stately pace held by the two strangers, and Beatrice had no choice but to fall behind the deacon to leave room for them to pass. When they did, she got a good look at what was hanging over the saddle. Not what but who. By the light of the moon, the only light other than that of the torches held by two of the four men, she caught sight of his face turned toward the horse's rear end. Blood covered half of it, blood which seemed to seep from a gash on the back of the head and darkened the already dark hair to black. She knew him, even though she'd only just met him. He was not the sort of man one forgot easily. Brock. What was this all about? Why? Just as it had earlier at the kitchen table, cold certainty filled her. She knew what had happened, just as surely as if she'd been there to witness it. 
Lord Randall had gotten word of him being in the village, somehow. Naturally. Word spread quickly among the villagers. Either that, or he had learned of the presence of the foreigners and had felt it his place to track them down. Why hadn't she gone to the village to warn them away from speaking to him? They might have hidden themselves. They might even have left in time to avoid Brock's attack. He'd kill Brock. Her knees pressed into Cecil's sides, the reins digging into her hands as she squeezed them. What was she to do? How could she help? For she had to. There was no question that she had to. But the men were riding off toward the right, around the side of the manor house, while the heavy wooden front door was opening, and a tall golden-haired man strode out. To what do I owe this honor? Lord Randall's face bore a triumphant look. If he were anyone else, Beatrice would have thought him handsome. She knew many girls in the village did, she'd seen them gasp and sigh over him on market day, as he flaunted his wealth to all around him. To her he was a leering animal, ready to pounce. His muscles were always tensed, always at the ready, even when he pretended to be friendly. She opened her mouth but no sound came out. This man was able to do something as terrible as what she now knew he'd done. He had ordered Brock's attack. He had brought him back to the manor house for the purpose of exacting his own version of justice. Instinctively she knew she could not let on that she was aware, and even if he knew she was aware, she could not allow him to know she cared. The man was a stranger to her, wasn't he? And a foreigner. If she betrayed her concern, she would be giving away much more. Beatrice? Deacon Eddard prompted, clearing his throat. She'd lost her voice. She'd lost the ability to move. What was she supposed to do? Tell Lord Randall she had no intention of marrying him? It was suddenly clear that such an announcement would fall on deaf ears. He wouldn't care what she wanted, what her intentions were. He was willing to attack and kidnap a man. Most likely he'd have Brock locked away somewhere before enacting his revenge. It had been a long time coming too, which meant he wouldn't be satisfied with anything quick or merciful. How did she know this? She didn't know the man beyond what she'd heard of him, and what she saw of him standing there. She knew nothing of his heart. She didn't know how she knew what he'd do to Brock. She simply did. Because of that, she needed to say what was about to come from her mouth, even though she would never have believed herself capable of such a lie at any other time. I've come to accept your offer of marriage, she announced, all of it coming out in a rush. Deacon Eddard sounded as though he was choking. Beatrice shot him a look from the corner of her eye, which she hoped was enough to make him understand. Had he seen Brock? If not, she could understand how confused he'd be. He remained silent. A small miracle. Lord Randall meanwhile looked neither surprised nor pleased. His face bore the expression of a man hearing something he had already been certain of. As though she had reported that it was night and dawn would arrive in the morning. Good he shouted laughing. I knew you would see what a fortuitous match this would be. Please both of you do not sit on horseback. I'll have my men take care of the animals, while you join me inside. She exchanged a look with the deacon, which she hoped did not betray her panic. Oh no, she demurred, smiling slightly. We could not take advantage of your hospitality this way. I had only decided to come here on a whim, I suppose you might say, and I wouldn't want to take up your time or that of the deacons. It sounded believable, she prayed. Nonsense. Randall insisted, and it wasn't her imagination when she took note of the less friendly tone of voice in which he spoke. She was denying him what he wanted. He was accustomed to his desires being fulfilled without question. Such as his marriage to a girl he didn't know, simply because he declared it would be so. I believe we should drink to our good fortune then, he continued, while his visitors dismounted their horses, making a hand signal to the old man who hovered nearby before leading Beatrice and the deacon farther into the manor house. The two of them handed the reins over to one of the stable boys who'd come on the run and walked side by side. A flash of childish terror came over her, and she wanted more than anything to take the deacon's hand for reassurance. 
Instead, she curled her hands and drew deep breaths in a desperate attempt to tamp down her rising panic. She didn't need to toast with the Lord. She needed to get to the village to warn the other two, Derek and Hugh. They had to do something. She had to do something. I don't think, Beatrice began but Lord Randall spoke over her. I'm sure Deacon Eddard would agree that this is an occasion worthy of a toast, he insisted, assuming this was the reason for her misgivings. Rather than allowing him to continue believing this, she went on, I was about to say that I should go. I don't believe we should stay. I did not wish to wait until morning to speak with you, but now it would be best if I returned home. There is no one there to tend to it but me, after all. He didn't slow his pace, leading them into a grand hall with contained a long table and more chairs than she could quickly count. Her entire home would fit into it five perhaps six times over. The ceiling seemed to stretch up to the stars. She had to crane her neck to see it all, with wooden rafters which spanned the length. Do not tell me you're considering making the ride home at this point in the evening, he said, shaking his head, as he walked to the head of the table, where a jug of wine and three cups were already waiting. It is far too late and too dark. There is no telling just what might decide to come out of the woods and make your acquaintance. His words sent a chill down her spine and made her wonder if she should be more concerned over the animal before her. What was he doing to Brock? Would he kill him that very night, or was he planning to hold him there? She dug her nails into her palms barely fighting off the urge to scream. A man's life was in danger, and she could do nothing but stand there and pretend not to know or care. What alternative did she have? If she confronted Lord Randall with what she'd seen, what she knew of his past acquaintance with Brock, what would happen? He might lock her away, giving her no chance to help Brock or the others. He might do something to silence her, and Deacon Eddard too. At least if he were with her and the deacon, he wasn't torturing Brock. That was a relief, anyway. Even so, she couldn't stay. There had to be a way to get to the village, and immediately. Please, allow me to extend this hospitality to my betrothed. He smiled at least, his lips curved into a smile she observed. His eyes did not reflect happiness, however. They were strangely hard. As though he were only reciting words he knew he had to offer. Custom and good manners dictated that he do so. She exchanged a glance with the deacon, whose face remained blank. Oh and you as well Deacon Eddard, Lord Randall continued. Your journey would take even more time, and I wouldn't want you to come to harm on a dark road. The road wasn't dark. The moon was nearly full, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky, according to what Beatrice could see through one of the narrow windows of the hall. There was nothing she could do. Nothing she could say that would sound innocent enough not to raise his suspicions. She had no excuse and would only anger him if she refused. When she didn't respond, Deacon Eddard nodded. Very well. Your hospitality is much appreciated. Lord Randall rang a small bell which sat at his right hand, and almost instantly a young woman came nearly on the run. See to it that rooms are prepared for my betrothed, and Deacon Eddard, he commanded, not bothering to look at the girl. She meant nothing to him, just as Beatrice would mean nothing once they were married. He didn't even bother to mention Beatrice's name. She was his betrothed. His. Nothing more. Now for our toast. He handed her a cup, then handed another to Deacon Eddard. He raised his own, locking eyes with Beatrice before continuing. To my betrothed and our union. May it be a fruitful one. That was it. Nothing of happiness, or even a hint of him being glad that she had accepted him. It had never been a question for him, naturally. It mattered not whether she'd accepted. He'd planned on their union, just as he'd plan on waking up the next morning and going about his business. She managed to sip a bit of the wine for the sake of politeness, but she'd never developed a taste for it. Would the lady of the manor house have needed to do so? She would never know. The steward will show you to your rooms and one of the girls will take care of your needs, he promised her after drinking deep of his wine, emptying the cup. It clanged on the table when he returned it there. I have no needs, she assured him. 
After all, there are no servants on the farm. Just me. I'm accustomed to caring for myself. It would be the height of discomfort, having someone attend her. Especially when she wanted nothing more than to be alone, so she could think things through. He waved a hand as though this was nothing, a brief frown creasing his forehead as he considered life lived on his own. Or so she supposed. You need to become accustomed to the life of the lady of the manor, he reminded her. Of course. I hadn't thought about it that way. Best not to argue the point. Best to simply allow him to go on believing he was getting his way. Nothing was wrong in the world, everything was wonderful, and Lord Randall was going to have what he wanted. And the rest of her life would have been lived that way if she had married him. Always telling him what she knew he wanted to hear, always lying. Betraying herself, betraying what she knew to be right. Turning a blind eye when his men did something terrible at his command. You know, she continued, thinking fast, I will need to leave at first light. Someone must tend to the cow and chickens and such at dawn. They will become ill if I do not. She held her breath, hoping this excuse would be strong enough. It was the truth, of course, but there was a chance he wouldn't care for her concerns. Will they? he asked before shrugging. I suppose you would know more about that than I would. Of course, do what you must do. I only want to be certain you're safe overnight. One never knows what might occur out in the dark. I wouldn't want any danger to befall you. She stopped short of asking exactly what danger he referred to, deciding she didn't wish to know. They bade Lord Randall good night, and it wasn't soon enough for Beatrice. Only when she was no longer in front of him could she breathe freely. What was it about him that made her feel as though she were choking? Perhaps it was the way he ordered the beating and restraint of innocent men. Brock wasn't innocent though. It was a terrible thing, attempting to make sense of what he'd done. It had been in defense of a defenseless woman, but the woman had already died. If he'd been defending himself, it would have been different. She might have been able to understand, if not condone his actions. Then again, Deacon Eddard had admitted that he would have done the same thing. Did that mean it wasn't such a terrible sin, after all? Was there such a thing as a forgivable sin? One God would understand? The old stooped steward walked a few steps in front of them, leading the way down a long narrow corridor hung with richly embroidered tapestries. Would Lord Randall have expected her to learn to embroider once they were wed? She knew noble ladies were expected to learn such skills from a young age, but there had hardly been time for such fanciful pursuits while she was growing up. She cut her eyes to the side, catching the deacon's attention. You saw Brock, she mouthed. He nodded his face pained. She pointed to herself. Dawn. Village. Warn them. He nodded, still with a pained expression, then pointed to himself with eyebrows raised. She glanced at the steward, to make certain their conversation was unnoticed, before shaking her head. Nothing, she mouthed. Go home. No. His eyes went wide. You can't. I will go. I must do something, he whispered a bit louder than he should have. The steward glanced over his shoulder, but it was an innocent glance. He understood nothing, or so she needed to believe. A man of his advanced age might well have been hard of hearing. She shook her head again. No. Please. He merely sighed, shaking his head, and folded his hands in prayer. She nodded firmly. They would need all the prayers they could get. Chapter 16 Brock could only open one of his eyes on waking. When he did open the left eye, the one not caked shut with dried blood he could smell it. That plus the searing pain in the back of his head told him what he needed to know, he looked about him and wished he had never woken at all. Everything hurt. Not just his head. His hands and feet were bound, the feeling having long since left both. Time had passed then, enough for the blood to stop flowing. Why would it flow there when it could flow out of the back of his head? If the pain was in back he reasoned, thinking helped distract him from the pain, something he had learned long ago, but the blood had flowed over the side of his face it meant he'd been on his face or at least face down. He didn't need to ask himself where he was. 
The scent of manure and pigs assaulted his nose to the point where his eyes watered. A barn, tucked in a corner somewhere. Aside from shuffling feet and occasional snorting, there was silence. They'd left him alone. Why not? He was bound, arms behind his back, with a cloth wadded up and stuffed into his mouth. He was no threat to anyone. He also didn't need to ask himself who had done this to him. It had been too much to ask that Lord Randall not recognize him. The man had known him on sight, as Brock had known him. It was folly, beginning to end. The entire thing. He had no business returning to the scene of his crime. Whatever happened was no less than what he deserved, after all he'd gone seven years without paying for his crime. They had been good years too. He had to Derek to thank for that. And himself. He'd worked hard but it had been work at which he'd excelled, work which had pleased him greatly. Perhaps that was as much as he'd deserved. He told himself not to despair, not to give up so easily, but what was the alternative? Lord Randall, who had most assuredly seen to his capture, wouldn't make it so easy for him to escape again. There wouldn't be a moment in which he'd be left to his own devices. He would be bound at all times. And though he was currently alone, he wouldn't be alone for long. He knew that too. Derek and Hugh didn't know where he was. They would read his letter on waking and assume he had left with the lass. And they would ride out at dawn, as Lord Randall had demanded. There was one hope. Only one. That they would first ride to the farm to confirm that he'd kidnapped Beatrice. When they found her there, never having arrived, they'd know something befell him. What difference would it make? What could they possibly do? He'd seen what they could do. He'd heard the stories too. But there were only two brothers, that was all. None of the men Hugh had trained to fight, none of McKay's men or any of the others. While they both had military training, it would matter little when they were so vastly outnumbered. And Derek wouldn't want to ride to the farm at any rate. He would take Randall's threats to heart, and would like us not assume the man had placed spies along the road, perhaps even near the farmhouse keeping watch for them. Brock felt a great deal of affection for his friend, the sort of affection men developed toward those with whom they'd been through many challenges. He knew that affection was shared. But it wasn't the same as having a wife and a new babe on the way. He wouldn't risk his life to save his friend when Marjorie waited for him. That was simply the way of life, the manner in which things had unfolded. He was on his own. There was little light coming from the window above his head, telling him it was still night. Derek and Hugh would leave at dawn. There were only a handful of hours left before his fate was sealed. If that many. After all, Lord Randall need not keep him alive that long. He might decide to end things quickly, not out of any sense of mercy but impatience. He'd been waiting a long time. Brock tried as best he could to lessen his discomfort, shifting slightly. They dropped him on his backside, judging by the soreness in that area. He was up against the wall, slumped on his right side where his eye was crusted shut. He bent his arms, both of them burning in protest, they'd handled him most roughly, it was clear, and attempted to push himself up to a sitting position. That would relieve the pressure on his ribs, he hoped. It seemed as though he'd been across the back of a horse. That made sense. If he were kidnapping a large, unconscious man, he'd have thrown him over the back of a horse too. On his stomach, where the blood flowing from the wound on the back of his head would run into his eye and close it. Was he actually agreeing with the methods behind the actions of the men who'd captured him? After much slow movement, taking time to breathe carefully against the pain in his ribs, he managed to sit up. They'd at least left him on a bed of straw. A small mercy. What wasn't a mercy was the terrible white-hot pain which screamed out in the back of his head. Sitting up had turned mere throbbing into agony and made the world swim before his open eye. His stomach clenched in revolt. But he was gagged. He would choke to death on his own vomit if he didn't control the nausea which twisted his insides. He couldn't allow it. He wouldn't allow it. Panic would only make things worse, and it was threatening to overtake him. Breathe. Slowly. Deeply. 
He counted to five as he breathed in, focusing on the numbers and on drawing breath in through his nose. Then, he let it out as slowly as he'd drawn it in. Again, in and out. In and out. He rested against the stone wall at his back, closing his eye, fighting to control himself and stave off another wave of nausea. It got easier as time went on, and his insides relaxed somewhat. Strangely enough, he thought of Marjorie in that moment. Poor Marjorie. To think she had to go through that every day. He'd never see her again, either. Any of the people who had welcomed him into their home and their hearts. They'd found their way into his, all of them. He loved them. He had never imagined loving people. There had been his father and mother. Affection at most, but even that had been rare. Theirs had not been a loving home. Perhaps this was why his father never hurried home from his work, from his boat. Perhaps this was why their son hadn't wasted a moment's time in leaving home when he came of age to do so. He had never imagined himself as part of a large, loving family. Like the Duncans. Somehow, they'd all found each other and did everything they could to ensure the comfort and safety of the rest. Such as the way Heather and Sarah had insisted Marjorie live in the manor house so they could care for her. They weren't related by blood. Her husband was a childhood friend of theirs. They owed her nothing, and yet they had demanded the ability to watch over her and the child she carried. He hadn't known there were people in the world such as them. Nor had he known there were lasses as brave and true as Sarah and Heather. Alice. Dalla. Marjorie. Beatrice. His chest ached at the thought of her. Would she marry Lord Randall out of a lack of other options? For there would be none once Hugh and Derek were gone. She'd have nothing to do but go through with the marriage and be his prisoner, as Brock currently was. He hoped she had a longer life than he would. Then again, perhaps he didn't. Perhaps it would be a mercy if she didn't live long at all. Footsteps roused him to full wakefulness, full awareness. Someone was coming. Someone who wore good shoes, who walked with a long shore stride. Only one person on the manor would fit that description. Sure enough, moments later, a lantern appeared. With it, the man who carried it. The golden-haired, cold-eyed man he'd remembered so well over the course of seven years. The man who had remembered him as well. We meet again, he murmured, eyeing Brock up and down. I must admit, they hit you a bit harder than I had requested. I didn't wish to see you covered in blood which I haven't shed. Brock could do nothing but watch and wait, and listen to the foul words coming from the man's foul mouth. Did you really think I didn't know you when I saw you last evening? he asked, raising an eyebrow. Did you think that just because you allowed your friends to do the talking for you, that I would leave you be? I would think you'd know me better than that by now. Brock remained still, barely breathing as he strained to hear the man's low voice. Even the snorting, shuffling pigs had silenced as if in fear. I will have the satisfaction of avenging my nephew's murder, Randall promised, leaving the lantern on the floor near the window before coming closer. I will watch you die. I will think of him as I do, as the life drains out of you. Him and my brother. His father. The man who died of a broken heart without his only son, his only child. You destroyed my family. And for what? He crouched in front of Brock, examining him closely, sneering as he did. For the sake of a filthy, worthless piece of garbage? As if women like her don't die every day. As if they matter. As if any woman matters, aside from what's between her legs. The image of Beatrice's face crossed Brock's mind then. So this was the esteem in which Lord Randall held all women. It wasn't a surprise, of course, but hearing him give voice to what Brock knew was in his rotten heart only solidified his certainty that Beatrice would live a miserable, wretched life under his roof. You killed a man far better than you, he uttered. You had no right to kill one of your betters. You had no right to even put a hand on him. You've escaped punishment for far too long but not to worry. His eyes flashed with the first traces of real feeling Brock had seen up to that point. You will pay for the time you've been granted since then. 
For every one of the last seven years, you escaped the death you so richly deserve. And it will be my pleasure to dispense this suffering. Wait and see. He stood then, spitting on the floor by Brock's feet. But not yet, he whispered, one corner of his mouth quirking up in a smile. Not just yet. I'll let you think it over while I make preparations. He left the lantern sitting there, leaving empty-handed. Brock thought he heard the man chuckling as he walked back to his house. In fact, he was certain of it. Chapter 17 Another long sleepless night. Worse than the one before. Beatrice couldn't possibly keep missing entire nights of sleep and hope to stay alive. Two nights in a row. And both because of Lord Randall. For all that she felt sharp. Her brain moved quickly throughout the night, as she weighed her options and worked out what she felt was the best course of action. The room in which she'd spent the night was a comfortable one, or would have been, had she done more than sit at the edge of the bed, while a young woman had poured water in the basin on the bedside table, then offered to comb her hair. It was the same young woman as before she noticed, the one who Lord Randall had called in to announce the preparation of the rooms for her and Deacon Eddard. She'd looked terrified, scurrying around the room like a rodent. Was this the way her supposed husband-to-be ran his household? For a moment, the very briefest of moments, no longer than the blink of an eye, she'd considered accepting his offer after all. She might bring a measure of mercy to the manor. She might see to it that the people working there, living under the Lord's protection, knew what it meant to feel appreciated. No longer afraid. But no. It made her chest ache when she considered it, leaving this girl and so many others behind. There was nothing she could do for them. She didn't care for them as she cared for herself. She couldn't go on living her life for the sake of others. And she cared too much for Brock. She shouldn't, and she knew it. He was a stranger. A stranger who had killed a man, no matter the reasons why he'd done it. He'd brought to an end the life of another. No matter that Henry Randall had deserved what came to him. Who was to say that poor miserable girl was the only one he'd attacked? Or that she would have been the last? Even so, it was enough to give her pause. The way she cared for Brock and his well-being was entirely wrong and baseless. No matter how kind he'd been. No matter how he'd made the sacrifice of coming to fetch her for Marjorie's sake, though it had meant certain danger for him. It was all too confusing. And beside the point. She reminded herself of this as she paced the floor throughout the night, wringing her hands as the deacon so often did. Grinding her teeth until her jaws ached. She wouldn't have married Lord Randall even if it weren't for Brock, so that mattered not. And no matter what he'd done, he did not deserve the fate Lord Randall had in store for him. Murder did not justify murder. God would see to it that justice was meted out. Whether he believed himself to be or not, Lord Randall was not God. Was he even still alive? And where would the men have taken him? She looked out the window fairly certain there was no one outside in the middle of the night who might see her there. The land belonging to the Randall family stretched on and on, beyond what Beatrice could see in the moonlight. There were a number of outbuildings, a barn and stables. The fire was out in the smithies finally. However, was it her imagination, or was there a faint light coming from a window in the barn? A lantern? A candle? Regardless of the source of the light, it was burning. Who would leave a candle burning in the barn, in the middle of the night? It would certainly set the straw on fire. She wondered about it, her imagination turning over and over. What could it mean? Was there something she could do about it? Could that be where Brock waited? No, it wasn't possible. That would be too simple, too easy and yet it would mean he was close by, where his captor could keep watch on him, so to speak. She might. She might claim if discovered that she'd worried when she saw the light. Thinking there was a fire. There would be questions of course, such as why she'd been awake, looking out the window, but she could make up an excuse for that. Moments later, 
Before she could so much as question what she was doing, Beatrice was fleeing barefoot down the hall which she travelled earlier with the deacon. What was she doing? Was she really so bold? There was no noise coming from the great hall just beyond the vaulted front door, besides snoring. It seemed much of the manor's servants and workers, the men at any rate, slept there on the floor. The sound and smell of sleeping, snoring, flatulent men assaulted her, and she turned away from them before her presence could be noticed. One thing was certain, she told herself as she tiptoed to the door and opened it as slowly and silently as possible. Lord Randall would be nowhere near the room in which his lowly servant slept. A blessing. She dashed to the barn, reminding herself as she ran that she was merely a girl afraid of a fire breaking out. Intending only to put out the light which some careless tired man had left behind. That was all. Nothing more. She wanted to be a help, to protect the building and the animals who lived inside. After all, wasn't that the sort of thing the lady of the manor would concern herself with? Once inside she located the source of the light. A lantern, as she had suspected, placed on the floor in a corner beneath the window. The stall was free from any animals. Why would anyone be in there? Other than that, there was nothing but the sound of pigs who she'd startled with her appearance. As a result she moved slowly, so as not to further frighten the poor creatures. It wouldn't do for them to raise a fuss and alert the others to her presence. She bent at the waist to retrieve the lantern, wrapping the edge of her kirtle around her hand in case it was hot after burning for so long. A sudden movement in the straw on the other side of the stall startled her so, she nearly dropped it on the floor and set the entire place on fire. With a shaking hand, she lifted the lantern higher, lighting more of the space around her. And she saw him. Brock, she gasped, dashing over to him and falling to her knees. Brock, it's me. Beatrice. Only one of his eyes could open, she realized. The entire side of his face was crusted over, the blood having long since dried to an ugly shade of rusty brown. She longed to wash it clean, but knew that would be a grave mistake. Someone would know he'd been assisted. He stank too, reeking of sweat and blood and filth. The stench made her nose wrinkle but she wouldn't leave him. She couldn't turn away. There was something in his mouth. Cloth? She was careful in pulling it free, holding it between the tips of two fingers as she did. Beatrice? His voice was little more than a whisper, and he winced after speaking her name. Your head. It hurts, she asked, looking around to be certain they were alone. I lass. Terribly. What did they do to you? It matters not, he breathed. You must get out of here. Now? Before he finds you. He was right, of course. Her hands trembled at the notion. I have to help you, she insisted nonetheless. We have to get out of here. It's impossible. You could never free me now, they would catch us. He would know it was you who did it. I won't have you sacrifice yourself for me. I want to. I won't leave you here. Lass? You don't know why I'm here. I do, she hissed. I know about all of it. That doesn't matter. I will help you. I won't let him. You must go, he urged. Whatever the reason you're here, you must go back. I came here to sell the farm to him tonight. He made me stay with Deacon Eddard. Why she felt the need to explain this, and to add the fact that she wasn't unchaperoned, she wasn't certain. She wanted to be certain he knew she wasn't there because she wanted to be. Not with someone like the Lord of the Manor. He nodded, then winced from the pain which resulted. Please. Do us both a favor and get out of here. You must before he finds you, lass. He was right. Oh, Brock, she breathed, standing in spite of the deep desire to stay. Leave the lantern. Replace it, he reminded her. He must not know you were here. Of course. She did this then turned back to him. Bound hand and foot bloodied. Defeated, or so it seemed. Hurry, he urged. He smiled ever so slightly. I'm glad I had the chance to see you again, lass. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. 
this wasn't true. She knew it as well as he did. She knew he was lying to her, trying to ease her pain. She wouldn't let him despair. She wouldn't let him die, not if there was anything she could do about it. I'll bring back help for you, she promised. Don't worry. I'll be back. Don't come back, he whispered. She turned away, but then at the last moment remembered the gag. Oh no, she gasped, running back to him and picking up the cloth. I'm sorry. I almost forgot this. As did I. He smiled, his good eye searching her face as his mouth fell open. She was careful not to choke him as she wadded the cloth into his mouth. All right, he whispered. He nodded. She then leaned forward and kissed his almost clean cheek before she could think twice and stop herself. He made a strangled noise in the back of his throat as she ran from the stables and back to the house. The sky was beginning to lighten. A good sign. Lord Randall had left him alive for that long. He was in no hurry. So long as he allowed her a few more hours, she might be able to find the twins and bring them to the manor. There had to be some way to free Brock. At any rate, she couldn't allow them to go on without knowing what had happened to their friend. She did not know the men. She didn't know the sort of men they were, or whether they were brave enough to free him. Or foolish enough, perhaps. Slipping back into the house, she dashed down the hall and into the bedchamber. It was as she'd left it. Empty. Only once she was certain of this did she breathe a sigh of relief and lean against the closed door. But it was a short-lived relief. There was little to be thankful for or relieved over. Dawn would arrive soon enough. She pulled on her stockings and shoes then washed her face and hands. After that, she went from her room and down to the next room, where the deacon had spent the night. Had he slept at all? Or had he walked the floor as she had? Perhaps he had spent the night in prayer. There were stirrings in the great hall, telling her the men inside were beginning to awaken, though it was not yet dawn. Perhaps, she could slip away in the commotion of early morning activity and get a head start into the village. The door opened when she knocked, the fully dressed deacon peering out at her before he opened it farther. He didn't ask why she'd come or what she intended to do. He merely joined her. The two of them walked side by side down the hall to the front door. We'll need our horses, he announced to the first man they found. He nodded, running both hands through sleep must hair and went outside to fetch the animals. The two of them spoke not a word as they waited, Beatrice's nails digging into her palms once again. Just as they had the night before. It would be a strain, holding back old Cecil rather than urging him into a run. If he even could run. Can I use your mare? She whispered when the young man came back into view, leading the pair of horses by the reins. I don't want to push Cecil too hard. Of course, Deacon Eddard replied, so they mounted the wrong horses before bringing them around and starting down the stony path. Beatrice avoided looking directly at the barn as they rode away. He was still in there, perhaps wondering when he'd be killed or how. It broke her heart to leave him, to ride from the place without freeing him first. But trying to escape with him as they were, the three of them riding out in the open, would have been worse than folly. He's in the barn, she whispered as the horses trotted. I saw him earlier. I found him there. You took such a chance? I did, she replied cutting her eyes in his direction. I couldn't leave without at least knowing where he was. And now I'll know where to tell the men to find him. You believe they would take such a chance? What choice do they have? He's their friend, their companion. They wouldn't leave him behind. So she told herself. So she needed to believe. I'll leave you at the crossroads, she announced when they reached the road which ran alongside the Randall lands. I will join you. You won't, and I won't argue about it again, she insisted. Perhaps you can care for the cow and chickens in my place. They'll need it. I will come to you later, once it's finished. When it's finished, he replied his jaw firmly set, you won't be able to do any such thing. You will have alerted the men to their friend's presence, and the danger he is in. You will have no choice but to go with them. 
otherwise what might Randall do to you? It was true, and she knew it in her heart. She had been entirely wrong in her thinking, though she had spent hours taking it all apart and putting it back together again. She couldn't go home again. He would surely come for her, take her, perhaps force her into an immediate marriage. He might keep her prisoner until she gave him children, then dispose of her. If he did not dispose of her immediately after they'd consummated the marriage, once her land was in his hands. It was all he truly cared about, after all. He might always sire an heir with another woman. All right then, she said, lifting her chin. You're correct. I wouldn't be able to go home. I will have no choice but to flee with them. Immediately. You're certain this is the right choice? They came to the crossroads. The road stretching to their left led to the farm, then on to the church. To the right, the village. She nodded, bringing the horse around to the right. I am. I must go. Thank you for everything. With that, tears stinging in her eyes, she urged the horse into a run. The sun was only just on the rise. She prayed more fervently than she ever had before, even harder than she'd prayed for her sister's safety, that she could find the men in time to save Brock. Chapter 18 Only when they reached the outlying buildings at the edge of the village, did Beatrice pull up the reins and slow the mare's pace. The last thing she needed was to draw attention to herself. Anyone who saw her would surely wonder why she'd been riding so wildly, and might draw a conclusion she didn't wish for them to draw. Still every passing second was one second more in which Brock suffered. The village was starting to come to life, the sun's light beginning to creep over the thatched roofs of the cottages which lined the street on which she rode. Doors opened, and out poured the men and women who had chores to complete and work to get to. She nodded in greeting to everyone who acknowledged her. If she ignored them, or behaved as though she was disturbed, they would see through her. Winifred Bowman made eye contact as they passed. The woman walked with a wide basket stacked high with bread, balancing it on one hip as she made deliveries for her husband. Beatrice nodded with a smile, hoping the woman was too busy to think much of her appearance so early in the morning. The only inn she knew of was on the main street, and she brought the mare to a stop in front of it. The door was open, so she tied the horse off to a post in front of the building and hurried inside. The innkeeper greeted her with a wide smile. She recognized him, having seen him in the village for years, even if she had never been inside the inn. It was a rather unpleasant smelling place, musty and full of dust. There was a large room just beyond where she entered, with several tables and chairs. At one of them, a pair of men sat and ate what looked like a rather dry withered roast. She took all of this in with a single glance, her heart sinking when she didn't recognize the men at the table. She'd hoped Hugh and Derek would be easy to find. If only one thing could go easily, she would have been grateful. The key would be to make certain the innkeeper, she didn't even know his name she realized, didn't think anything was amiss when she asked after the two Scotsmen. What can I do for you? He asked. I understand a trio of foreigners were staying here with you, she began. Her palms went slick with sweat as her heart raced out of control. She could almost hear it pounding away. Indeed, he replied, his smile fading to nearly nothing. They paid me a visit yesterday, she continued, perceiving his change in demeanor and wondering what she could do to cheer him again. I was hoping to speak to them, if they were awake and available for a call. Is there any way you could send someone to their room, and let them know I'm waiting for them? He shook his head, and for a moment she was certain he'd send word to Lord Randall that she had been asking around after Brock's travelling companions. There wasn't a doubt in her mind that everyone in the village knew of their presence, and why they'd come. I'm sorry but they left at dawn. They what? She gasped before she could stop herself. I mean so early? I was not of the understanding that they'd intended to leave yet. Well, your betrothed made certain they wouldn't be a trouble to you ever again. He beamed. Lord Randall is a good protector, and you're fortunate to have such a powerful man looking after you. Yes I am, she replied with a sinking heart, a fake smile stretching her lips. 
You don't have to worry about them any longer, he continued, as though he believed she should be proud. She supposed he wanted to feel more important than he was too, and enjoyed being at the center of an exciting story which otherwise had nothing to do with him. Why not? Because your future husband ordered them to leave the village. They were to be on their way, or else Lord Randall would. He allowed himself to trail off, widening his eyes and shrugging. Not that he needed to continue. Which way did they go? I only want to be certain I won't run into them on the way home, she added. You should not. They came in from Sillith, so they should be traveling west. Thank you for your help. She took slow, easy steps outside, taking her time at untying the reins and mounting the gray mare. If she hurried, it might appear as though she was anxious to catch up with the men. Which she was. Would they truly leave without Brock? This was what she couldn't understand. Staying and looking for him would mean sacrificing their safety, but it would mean sacrificing him to leave. Were they truly good, trustworthy men? Her sister's letter had said so. She had married Derek. That meant he had to be a man of honor. Did it not? Men of honor did not desert their friends. Unless. They believed there was another reason for him to not be with them. She managed to keep the horse at a steady walk, until she was outside the village. Then she drove her heels into its sides and took off at a full run. Heading West Chapter 19 Beatrice had to catch them. She simply had to. Come on girl, she urged, tapping the mare's sides. It had been an inspired idea, exchanging horses with the deacon. Cecil never could have ridden as she'd ridden the grey mare, whose name she didn't know. If the horse even had a name. Not that it mattered. She was exhausted, sweaty, soiled and terrified. What if they were too late? What if she never managed to find Derek and Hugh? Brock would think they had deserted him. And she'd promised to bring help too. She would go back all alone if she had to. No matter what it meant for her. The sun climbed higher, a constant reminder of how long it was taking. Time was slipping by, precious time. Please don't collapse on me now, she begged, patting the mare's neck, tears clogging her throat as she struggled to hold on to even the slightest bit of control she had left. If she allowed herself to fall to pieces, Brock would surely die. And he would think she had let him down. He tried so hard to remain brave for her sake. Though he had clearly been in pain, and bloodied, and though he had certainly known what awaited him at the hands of his captor, he had done everything possible to conceal his true feelings. She sat up straighter in the saddle, more determined than ever when she remembered the blood on his face, and the strength he had still shown. And the way his cheek had tasted under her lips, when she'd kissed him. The sound he'd made. He hadn't been able to speak, already gagged. She wondered what he might have said if given the chance. Tears filled her eyes, spilling onto her cheeks when she blinked. He was in so much pain. Halt. She froze, drawing the reins in to halt the horse as commanded. Her eyes darted around, vision blurred thanks to the tears still flowing from them. The voice had belonged to a man, who didn't take well to being trifled with. Where was he, whoever he was? I, I was merely passing through, she explained, breathing fast as her heart took off once again. I don't want any trouble please. I'm in a terrible hurry. A rustling in the underbrush just ahead of her. The mare's ears turned in that direction though she stayed still. Beatrice watched, her breath catching as a figure emerged. Derek. She nearly fell from the saddle in relief, her body sagging. Though he held a knife in one hand, she didn't fear him. Though it did attract her attention. He looked down then grimaced. My apologies lass. We weren't expecting to be followed by you, of all people. Q emerged from her left, also armed. How is this possible, he asked, looking at his brother. She's supposed to be with Brock. What makes you think that, she asked. He told us. Derek cleared his throat. He told us he was going to fetch you last night and leave for Sillith. We'd expected him to already be on his way by now. With you. No. He's at the manor house. 
Lord Randall captured him. The entire story came out in a rush. She was close to sobbing by the time she finished, though it was a relief to know she was no longer on her own. She had help. So you know then, Derek murmured, reaching up and awkwardly patting her arm. I do. It doesn't matter. He doesn't deserve what was done to him. I he agreed. He doesn't deserve it. And even if he did lass, we wouldn't let anyone else decide his fate. Especially not a man such as him, Hugh agreed. What can we do? She asked, looking from one of them to the other. Their presence was reassuring, their strength a comfort. They were both armed too, which would be a help. We? Derek asked. Nay lass. You'll be going home, Hugh decided for her. No. I can't. Lord Randall will know I had something to do with you going for him. Don't you see? Home by myself, anything could happen. He might truly send men to capture me this time. I don't think my sword skills are up to the task if Brock couldn't defend himself against them. Derek surprised her by laughing. You're right at that. Even so, Marjorie would never forgive me if she knew I allowed you to be present for such an event. You'll simply have to stay behind. I won't. And we don't have any more time to discuss this. We need to get back to him, now. Suddenly, another concern occurred to her. But we can't pass through the village. Everyone knows you're supposed to be on your way to Sillith, and if they see you. What other choice do we have? Hugh asked. Do you know of another way to reach the manor house? She opened her mouth then paused. I believe I know of another way to draw Lord Randall away from Brock. Chapter 20 It was early morning, light flooding through the window in the barn wall. The pigs jostled for attention a few stalls over. Brock wondered if the men who cared for the beasts had been ordered to stay away. Randall would either have to move him elsewhere or kill him soon. The poor pigs couldn't go for days without food and drink. And from the stench of it, their stalls or pens or whatever it was they lived in needed mucking. Badly. He wished he could breathe through his mouth. Perhaps being forced to sit in the midst of such stink was his true torture. The manor came to life outside the barn, voices overlapping as men and women got to work. It wasn't unlike the clamour of activity which always surrounded the Duncan Manor house. He'd grown accustomed to it, if anything, the noise comforted him. Except the voices weren't pleasant. There was no laughter, no good-natured joking or taunting as everyone worked together. Was life with the Duncan so special? Or was life with Randall so bitter? He could easily believe it was the latter. Randall likely treated those who worked the land and tended the animals and house little better than slaves. They were miserable, all of them. As Beatrice would be. He imagined her growing old before her time. Her smooth skin would become wrinkled, would lose its healthy color and turn sallow. The corners of her mouth would point down in a scowl and stay that way. Her rich vibrant hair would go gray. Her feisty nature would fade to nothing. She'd be nothing but a shadow of who she had once been, and it wouldn't take long for the change to occur. There had to be a way for him to escape, to take her away. To spare her the pain. What about his pain? His legs had cramped beyond the point of movement. If Randall's men were to haul him to his feet, there would be no way for him to run. Even if they untied his ankles, he would be useless. The same went for his arms. He'd never be able to fight off an attack when he could hardly feel anything from the shoulders down. He was useless to himself, useless to her. Those strident footsteps rang out again, and this time he was ready for them. Only Randall wasn't alone, at least two men accompanied him. The men who had attacked him, most likely. After all, it wouldn't do for everyone at the manor to know who was tied up and left helpless in the barn. One of them, a squat little man with a crooked nose was rough in pulling the gag from his mouth before shoving a cup of water at him. Brock did what he could to swallow some of it, but most ran down his chin and onto his blood-stained tunic. Let no one say I allow my prisoners to go without water. Lord Randall waited by the window, 
his arms crossed as he watched Brock nearly choke. They didn't gag him again. A relief. He took deep gulps of air, relishing the freedom until his ribs ached in response. The other man, tall, wiry, with a nasty sneer and only a handful of rotten teeth, dropped a crust of bread in his lap. How am I supposed to eat this when I can't use my hands? he asked, his voice little more than a croak. I suppose you'll have to work it out for yourself. Randall smiled. Let it not be said I allowed you to go without food. Why don't ye get it over with then? Are ye too much of a coward to do what we both know you're simply longing to do? He dared. Don't think you can goad me into taking action before I'm ready, Randall whispered, nostrils flaring as he did. That would be an act of mercy, and there is no room for mercy here. I didn't wish to extend it seven years ago, and I certainly have no wish to do so now. I've had too much time to imagine what I'd do to you if I had the chance. I. And I've had seven years to reflect on how glad I was to beat that filthy excuse for a man to death. He deserved worse than he got, which you know is true. No matter how little you think of women, no one should do what he did and get away with it. The men in the village certainly didn't believe so, Randall hissed. They were preparing the rope for the noose, which would have broken your neck, you murderous savage. And you'll finish the job for them. You've taken it upon yourself, rather than turning me over to those who'd see me hanged back then. Randall scoffed. Those feeble-minded dolts. I'd be surprised if any one of them could remember what took place yesterday, much less a crime from seven years back. At any rate, this is about satisfaction. Personal satisfaction. I intend to experience quite a lot of it. Don't allow me to get in your way then, Rock muttered. Do what you must. Perhaps I shall die of boredom while waiting for you to screw up the courage to kill me. Randall held up both hands when his men looked as though they'd advance on Brock, then crossed the stall and leaned down until they were face to face. Do you think I've never killed before? he asked in a low whisper, eyes harder than ever. Are you truly that naive? Trust me, it isn't a matter of courage, I'm under no illusions about my late nephew, and I know he was not a courageous man. And yet he killed that nameless wretch, did he not? Ah. So the lass had died after what Henry had done to her. Randall didn't know it, but he'd just given Brock a gift of sorts. The sense that the killing was warranted. The beast had murdered that poor innocent girl who'd done nothing worse than sell herself. Like as not, she'd led a sad life. But nothing she'd done, no sin she'd committed, meant she deserved to die so pitifully. So painfully. Randall's teeth shone even in the shadowy corner of the stall. Perhaps I should thank you, in all honesty. You did what I couldn't do myself. You did me a favor by killing Henry that night and to think he'd been certain Randall could do or say nothing to surprise him. Think about it, he continued, with all the relish of a man finally able to bear his secrets to a confidant. If my nephew had lived, he would have inherited the title. The land, the money, all that goes with the lordship. Once he was out of the way, it was just a matter of time before my brother died. If the rest of the world believes he died a broken-hearted man, so be it. You killed him, Brock whispered, disgusted. You helped, Randall replied. He did truly care about the lad, though I never understood why. The last thing he had to remember his dead wife, that type of thing. Yet another complication I've never understood, the attachment to women, but you and I have already had that discussion, he added. I. We have. The thought of Beatrice made him grind his teeth. So, I suppose I should thank you, Randall concluded. You made it possible for me to live the life I always knew I was entitled to. Why all of this then? Brock asked. Why this determination to destroy me, when I only made it possible for you to have what you wanted? The Lord snorted, shaking his head. You truly do not understand familial loyalty. You see, it was one thing for you to make it possible for me to advance. I do thank you for that. But it's another for me to allow anyone, especially a piece of Scottish scum who looks as though he's never lived a civilized day in his life, to murder a member of my family. 
We're too good for that. Much too good for the likes of you. The man was insane. Brock had always believed it so, after having witnessed his red-faced, blustering screams for vengeance after Henry's murder, but this was something entirely different. This show of callousness chilled him to the bone. No one with a soul could speak with such contempt for human life. An insane man was capable of anything, he knew. No show of cruelty would be too much, no perversion too brutal. His would not be a pleasant end. Mere hanging would not satisfy the Lord's thirst. He stood fixing Brock with a triumphant gaze. I'll give you a bit more time to think it over. Perhaps it's in your favor that I've just sealed the agreement with my intended bride. There are many concerns I'm currently involved in, you're only one of them. Sealed the agreement. Brock took pains to maintain a neutral expression as his mind turned this expression over and over. She had agreed to marry him. He knew she had no other choice, considering the circumstances. It was clear the lass had come to the same conclusion. Commotion outside the barn caught everyone's attention. Randall waved a hand, motioning for one of his men to go to the window. Brock watched as intently as the others, while the raised voices on the other side of the barn's stone walls only grew louder. It seems there's a visitor, the squat man announced. A woman. Dark hair. Brock's body tensed reflexively. Dark hair. Pretty thing with gold and copper in her hair, the man continued chuckling before Randall stormed over and shoved him out of the way. You're speaking of my betrothed, he hissed. You will not speak of her that way, or at all. Ever again. The man's face went white and his throat worked as he swallowed. Begging your pardon, Lord Randall. Take your requests for pardon elsewhere, Randall sneered, pushing past the man on his way from the stall. It's clear my betrothed has need of me, or else she would not have made the journey short though it may be. The three of them left Brock alone, with nothing but the sounds of squealing pigs and overlapping voices outside the barn to keep him company. What was she doing back here? She hadn't taken it into her head to do anything foolish, had she? He prayed not. She'd promised to bring back help, but he'd assumed that was simply the sort of thing people promised in such situations. He'd have promised the same thing if the positions had been reversed. More voices raised, shouting orders. He recognized Randall's as one of them, rising above the others. Excited, agitated. The pounding of hooves on stone, shouting and calling out and cursing. Until it faded to near silence a silence more unnerving than all the rest. What had she done? What had she said? Rapid footsteps, running into the barn. Brock. His heart stopped beating. Beatrice. She rushed into the stall, a triumphant grin spreading across her face. We have to hurry. What are you talking about? Hurry where? To do what? We have to get out of here while he's gone as quickly as possible. If we're careful, we can escape detection. And go where, he asked. His eyes widened when she lifted her kirtle to just above one knee, and pulled a dirk from beneath the garter holding up her stocking. And where did you get that? It doesn't look familiar, she breathed, eyes sparkling. I suppose not. I really don't know how these things work, to be honest. What things? Have you gone daft, lass? She dropped to her knees, breathing heavily as she soared at the rope binding his ankles. I mean, if you men would recognize each other's weapons. I suppose you wouldn't. Derek gave it to me. The rush of blood flowing down his legs and into his feet was no match for the rush of understanding her words brought. Where are they? Move. I must get to your hands somehow. She slid behind him between his back and the wall. Even in his state of exhausted confusion and rising anxiousness, he couldn't help registering the way her breasts pressed against him as she positioned herself. Her hands were sure, strong as she held his wrists in place and soared at the rope which bound them. I asked where they are. What happened to them? His arms swung loose, finally free, and instantly the muscles in his shoulders and back screamed in protest. He winced, an involuntary groan escaping his chapped lips. Did I hurt you? she gasped. Nay. 
I've been in the same position for hours. Oh. Her hands worked those muscles, causing fresh waves of agony to shoot through him. I forgot. They told me to rub you down a bit before trying to get you on your feet. But we don't have much time. He would just bet the men had told her to rub him down. Even in the middle of a life or death situation, he could imagine Hugh barely containing his mirth while delivering those instructions. Even so it helped, and he was soon able to lean forward and rub life into his legs and feet while she continued on his shoulders and back. Within minutes, he was able to get to his feet and hold himself somewhat steady. There was still a tremendous throbbing in the back of his head, and the room spun a bit, but it was an improvement over what he'd already been through. Where are we going? he whispered, while she went to the window to survey their surroundings. We'll cut across the fields to the farm, she explained. It should take no more than a few minutes on horseback. After that, I'm not completely certain. But we'll think of something. Not completely certain, he hissed. Where are Derek and Hugh? How do you think I got Randall out of here? She demanded, shooting a filthy look his way. They're riding about the village, making certain everyone sees them. He threatened harm to them if they were seen about after dawn, did he not? He was struck all at once with a sense of wonder, gratitude, and disbelief. That they would do that for him. Come on, she urged. We must go now. It seems as though our way is clear, but there is no telling how long that will be the case. The mare is just outside here, tied off. I'll whistle when I have her ready, and you'll come on the run. He remembered the warrior woman at the door, holding a sword she could hardly lift. There was a deep core of bravery in the lass, not to mention resourcefulness. She had found Derek and Hugh, and was willing to risk herself to free him. If only there was time to take her in his arms and thank her. She disappeared, darting out of the stall and past the other side of the window. He crept along until he reached the arched opening to the courtyard, holding his breath, listening for her whistle. When it came sharp and clear, he hurried out and spotted her just ahead. A grey mare waited, and he nearly leapt into the saddle, excitement and necessity enabling him to move fluidly in spite of his sore stiffness. He bent his back straining, and took Beatrice under the arms to place her in front of himself. She surprised him by taking the reins, but then she knew where they were going. Come on, girl, she whispered, snapping the leather smartly and pulling the mare about, directing it not down the stone road leading from the courtyard, but instead into the fields running alongside. They took off at a full gallop, and he could have sworn the lass was laughing as they did. Chapter 21 If Beatrice hadn't been so terrified, she might have been able to admit how much fun she was having. Would that she were able to step outside herself and look in on what she was doing, she would have seen the two of them astride a galloping grey mare. She would have seen the mad grin spread across her face as she rode, the sparkle in her eyes and colour in her cheeks. She was alive, fully alive, and thrilled to the tips of her toes in spite of the grave danger she'd only just put herself in. And he was behind her, his arms about her waist. He was real, he was free and he was holding on to her. He needed her. It was a matter of mere minutes before the mare stepped over the crumbling stone wall, which had been built so many years before, to mark the border between the two pieces of land, but had never been repaired since then. Just another thing which had fallen apart with the passage of time. They travelled the unploughed unworked fields which had once grown thick with crops before reaching the stables and barn. She was glad to see Cecil waiting inside. It meant Deacon Eddard had been there. And was still there, it appeared. He burst from the rear door, waving them in. You have no time to lose, he barked, closing the door with a bang once they were inside the house. What's this all about? Beatrice demanded. Get your things together and hurry, he ordered. She had never seen him so stirred, so full of energy. There was actual colour in his normally wan complexion. What do you have in mind? Brock asked. First, Deacon replied, you'll wash the blood from yourself. We cannot risk being stopped on the road, and you covered in blood. There's a bucket by the well, Beatrice instructed them. And you, hurry, 
Deacon Eddard commanded before leading Brock to the well, leaving her on her own to wonder what she had missed. It wouldn't hurt to get her few belongings together. She placed her good kirtle and second everyday one on the center of her bed, along with her comb and a cake of brown soap, then tied the corners of the bedspread together and carried the small bundle to the kitchen. Brock and the deacon were just returning, and both of Brock's eyes were open thanks to the removal of the dried blood from his face. There's nothing we can do about the soiled tunic, Deacon Eddard fretted. What are you thinking? Beatrice asked, hands on her hips. You're leaving. Right now. How, she asked. We could ride, but what if Randall spies us on the road? He doesn't know yet that Brock is no longer captive at the manor. The deacon opened the front door and peered out down the road. Come. Hurry. Come where, she asked, but there was no answer. She could only take hold of the bundle of clothing and follow him out to where a cart overflowing with straw was pulling up at the gate. Old Francis was at the reins, commanding the old mule which pulled the wooden cart, and beside her sat a basket of cakes. What is all of this? Beatrice gasped, stunned at the sight of the old woman at her gate. This is how you'll escape, the deacon announced, taking her by the elbow and all but dragging her to the cart. Inside. Quickly. Inside. She gaped. In the straw? Beneath it, he corrected. Both of you. Have you gone mad, she demanded, planting her feet. Brock saw the plot for what it was. It's the only way, lass he decided, his hands already around her waist and lifting her until she cleared the top of the cart's wooden sides before dropping her rather gracelessly inside. She sputtered, brushing straw from her face before the bundle of clothing dropped close to her head. Moments later, Brock joined her, stretching out as best he could before pulling the straw around both of them. What do you plan on doing? she asked, peering up at where the deacon climbed in beside Francis. Driving you as far as we can, he announced. We'll meet up with the others outside the village, and find fresh horses along the way for you. I don't understand. How do you know of any of this? she asked as they began rolling down the road. None of it made sense, and everything was happening so quickly. She couldn't keep up. I didn't like the idea of you being on your own, going after the Scotsman in the village, Deacon Eddard explained staring ahead. She could just make out the back of his head from where she hid in the cart. I decided to ride to the village, once I'd finished looking after the animals. I saw them right away, riding their horses, attracting attention. It wasn't difficult to see what they were trying to do. I can imagine, Brock muttered with a wry grin. How could he grin? She could hardly breathe. They explained to me what the three of you had planned, or rather, what you had planned, my child. He sounded as though he were chastising her, she noticed. I didn't know what else to do. We had to get Randall away from the house. That was your idea, lass? Brock was no longer grinning. It was. Somewhat. I thought we would meet up somewhere outside the village, and ride as hard as we could to get away. I must admit I didn't think things through past freeing you, she finished in a whisper, her cheeks burning. It was a fairly poor plan. Poor, he asked, grinning again. Far from it, lass. Far from it. I must confess, the deacon continued, that I rode Cecil somewhat harder than he was accustomed to in my haste to make it to the church and secure the cart for your escape. But it seemed as though he understood the seriousness of the situation and didn't complain when he had to run. Good old Cecil. She smiled before tears sprang to her eyes. What is it, lass? Brock whispered, covering one of her hands with one of his. I suppose I'll never see him again, she choked out, ducking her head against one arm to conceal the embarrassing rush of emotion. I loved him. He was my closest friend for so long. I didn't get to say goodbye to him, or thank him. It was all so silly, weeping over a horse. But they had been through so much together. He had listened to her deepest fears, had stood still and strong while she'd cried against his neck all through the lonely days and nights on her own, afraid her sister had died and left her with no one else in the world. Brock's voice was warm, tender as he squeezed her hand. I'm sorry lass. I wish you'd had the chance. 
but I'm certain he knew you loved him. Animals don't know such things. I'm being silly. No, you aren't. And animals do know. I'm certain of it. They feel as we feel. You gave him a good life. Deacon Eddard cleared his throat from his seat above them. I'll see to it he's taken care of, he promised. Thank you. She sniffled, dabbing her eyes with the hem of her stained kirtle. I wouldn't blame you if you laughed at me. So much danger and me weeping over something like this. It isn't easy, everything happening at once, Brock reasoned. You've been taken from your home without the chance to say goodbye to everything you knew. I wouldn't laugh. No, he wouldn't. She knew that. Time to stay silent, the deacon murmured. Beatrice knew without being told that this meant they were entering the village. The cart moved slowly, rocking back and forth as it progressed. She pressed herself tight to the wooden planks beneath her, ignoring the splinters which threatened to lodge themselves in her palms and weave themselves into her clothing. Brock did the same, barely visible to her through the straw which covered them both. You're well concealed, Francis whispered, having been silent all throughout the journey until then. But you must stay still, both of you. Funny how her muscles jumped and twitched just when she most needed them to stay frozen in place. She closed her eyes and willed herself to remain still. Everything depended upon them going undetected. Strange, riding into the village without seeing anything around her. And yet she could see in her mind. The first few cottages, their doors open to allow fresh warm air inside. She heard a few voices calling out greetings to the deacon and his gentle replies. Nothing in the sound of his voice revealed what was behind him, tucked under the straw. Never would she have guessed him to be such a quick, easy liar. Perhaps when what he lied about was important enough, she supposed, and it warmed her heart to know he felt she was so important. They continued on, the sounds of life which surrounded them growing louder as the cart continued its slow, steady, rocking pace. The blacksmith hard at work, hammering away. An argument between two men. The neighing of horses, the shouts of one woman to another as they greeted each other across the street. Laughter coming from what she could guess was the tavern, its door open to draw in patrons the way honey drew flies. She opened her eyes just enough to check for the presence of Brock. He was still there naturally, and had been staring at her. Instead of averting his eyes when discovered, he continued to do so. She could not say a word, could not ask him what was so interesting about her that he felt the need to stare. She could only return his frank straight gaze, so many things left unspoken between them. His hand wasn't far from hers, and she allowed her fingers to creep along the rough wooden planks until they closed over his. That was all she could do to show him how relieved she was at his escape. And her own. But they had not escaped yet. Not truly. The sound of Randall's voice, far off but coming closer, reminded her as much. Chapter 22 Beatrice's eyes flew open, bulging at the sound of Randall's voice. Brock wasn't surprised a bit, he'd expected all along that they would come across the bastard in their escape. All that was left was to hope that no one thought to question a man of God. Good morning to you, Lord Randall. Deacon Eddard called out. The man was a born smuggler, Brock noted silently, biting the side of his cheek to silence the laughter threatening to bubble out. Beatrice looked appalled at this. How could anyone stifle a laugh at such a time? Perhaps she was right, but he was far too exhausted and still in pain. And there was one thing he'd learned on the sea, when things looked worst sometimes all one could do was laugh at the turn of events outside of their control. And a good morrow to you, Deacon, the man returned. It's glad I am to have met up with you this morning, the deacon continued. I had not the chance to thank you for your hospitality last night. It was much appreciated, I'd never slept in such a sumptuous bed before. Take care, deacon. You'll be getting ideas above your station, the old woman beside him grumbled. Once again Brock stifled a laugh. This time it appeared as though Beatrice joined him. It's right you are, Francis. Poverty is my lot in life, which I accept joyfully, Deacon Eddard declared. Still, there is nothing sinful in enjoying the hospitality of a friend. 
the old woman grumbled something under her breath. She was truly doing her part to make things look convincing. What brings you to the village this morning? the deacon asked. Beatrice's hand clamped down over Brock's. He wished he could offer her some comfort. The best they could do was remain still. Looking for someone, Randall replied. Naturally, he wouldn't tell the truth. That would mean admitting to a holy man what he'd done. And you, Deacon. Brock and Beatrice locked eyes again. Delivering some comfort to the ill. I received word today that the Beckett family has fallen ill, and Francis wished to bring food to them. There's never a rest for those who wish to do good for others, is there? Randall asked. Beatrice rolled her eyes. Brock could only agree with the sentiment. He thought his pretense of being a good honourable protector to those living in the village, in the shadow of the manor, was believable. Deacon Eddard agreed, indeed not, your lordship. Indeed not. Lord Randall. A second rider joined them on horseback. There's word of a sighting on the other side of the village, closer to the manor house. Is everything in order here? Deacon Eddard asked, feigning concern. A sighting. Nothing for you to concern yourself with, Randall assured him. Brock heaved a sigh of relief, believing the men close to riding off in the direction of where Hugh and Derek were leading them, before one of the horses began sniffing around in the straw. Beatrice pressed her lips together, her face going deep red as she struggled to remain still and not shoo the animal's nose away out of sheer reflex. He glared at her, shaking his head just enough to signal her to remain still. Not that he needed to. She knew better than to move. Even so, his heart was in his throat and threatening to burst from him as the horse continued its exploration. He was not a praying man. He never had been. Religion was not one of the virtues his mother had passed on to him, though she had tried her best. He was always more concerned with the rough and tumble life of a man of the sea. Though he had not adopted prayer into his everyday life, he remembered enough of what his mother had tried to teach him, and silently recited every word he could bring to mind, eyes squeezed shut. There was little chance God would listen to him, the sinner that he was. A murderer. But he wasn't praying for his own sake. He prayed for her. She had done nothing to deserve what surely awaited her if they were discovered. Come. Let us see what this report is all about, Randall decided. Just like that the horses were gone, the pounding of their hooves fading into the distance and soon swallowed by the noise of the village. Brock opened his eyes to find Beatrice weeping, tears flowing down her cheeks. He wished more than ever that he might hold her, comfort her, whisper tender words into her ear until she relaxed. All he could do was squeeze her hand. She squeezed back. It was enough. Come. Deacon Eddard sounded as though he were muttering through clenched teeth. Let us continue. Quickly. The cart resumed its swaying as the mule continued on its way. It was by far the longest ride of Brock's life, the seconds stretching into lifetimes as they passed through the village and onto the outskirts. If they were on the main road out of Thrushwood, which he assumed they were, there would be a few homes here and there, dotting both sides of the road until the landscape would open up and turn to gently rolling foothills. That time couldn't come soon enough. There was no avoiding the memories of his first escape from the village, years earlier. That had been a far different event. Moonlight had been his only guide as he'd run barefoot from the cell and into the countryside. They had even taken his shoes before throwing him into the cell. His legs and feet had been cut to shreds by the time he'd reached a small winding stream in which to clean his wounds. Strips of his tunic had served as bandages, and he'd followed the stream to a larger body of water which had led to a cluster of cottages. The kindly people who'd called the cottages home had been too far removed from Thrushwood to know who he was or even express doubt at the sight of his ragged appearance. They'd been too concerned with helping care for him, and by that time several days had passed since he'd eaten anything other than berries and plants in the woods. He'd spent nights huddled in a ball beneath any bit of natural shelter he could find, and had walked during the day, taking care to avoid injuring his already damaged feet any further. 
They'd slowed his progress, but he'd managed to put enough distance between himself and the village nonetheless. It seems as though we made it, the deacon murmured after what felt like hours. We're well outside Thrushwood now. Where did you arrange to meet Derek and Hugh? he dared ask from beneath the straw. There is a wooded area a league or more from here. They should be waiting there. Would they? Had they escaped? Brock wouldn't put it past them. Randall believed himself to be clever, inescapable, but he had nothing on a pair of clever Highlanders who had spent much of their lives fighting to get out of scrapes. The threat he'd posed to them was nothing compared to some of the stories they'd told around the fire back at the Duncan Manor House. Even so, there was no telling. Villagers could be vicious, especially when it came to foreigners such as themselves. They'd already witnessed such treatment. If any of them had managed to corner the McInneses. The cart came to a stop. Beatrice let out a long sigh, as though she'd been holding her breath. Are we concealed? You are. You can sit up if you wish. They did, both of them taking great gulps of air after spending so long breathing stale dusty air beneath the straw. It's apologies I'm owing ye lass. Brock grimaced. I canna smell very fresh after the treatment I've received. She must have been ready to choke on the stench coming from him. It's no matter. She beamed. I'm too happy we managed to get away. He looked around, noting the slim young trees which surrounded them and the sun-dappled ground, the rays of light shining between the leaves which grew thick and green above them. It was like something from a dream beautiful and serene. And the lass beside him, picking straw from her hair with a rueful grin. She was like a dream as well. He shook himself with the reminder that their journey was far from over. He wouldn't feel safe until they were aboard the ship, on their way from Silith. There was still another day or more of travel before they reached the harbour, and like as not a day to prepare the ship for sailing. Beatrice tensed at the sound of approaching hooves, her hands trembling. Brock wished he'd thought to take the dirk from her after she'd freed him, but she'd only tucked it beneath her garter once again. If the approaching horses carried a threat, he would take it from her, whether or not the gesture was entirely proper. She would have to understand. He didn't need to worry. When the horses emerged in the clearing, he smiled from ear to ear. What took the two of you so long then? Derek scowled. Nothing but the fools we led on a chase throughout the village while you lot made your escape. It isn't easy evading capture when an entire village wants your head on a sharpened stick, he agreed with customary good humour. The old woman gasped in shock from her seat behind the mule, and for the first time Brock witnessed the McInnes twins blushing in shame from something they'd said. It's no matter now. Beatrice laughed, still shaky. Oh, and you'll be wanting this. She withdrew the dirk and handed it back to Derek. Ye made good use of it, so I see. He smiled. She took it for the compliment it was and blushed, nodding. Good work. He clasped Brock's hand. I hope this teaches ye a lesson, ye daft fool, he finished, glancing at the back of the old woman's head before the word he'd been ready to use slipped out. What lesson would that be then? Not to underestimate me, or what I'm able to understand. Another look at the pair, seated above them. We'll talk about it another time. After we've arrived home, I hope, Brock replied. Indeed, though perhaps we should discuss how to proceed. Derek and the deacon exchanged a meaningful look. Yes, Deacon Eddard agreed. It's unfortunate, but Francis and I cannot escort you all the way to Silith. Though a young woman should have a chaperone, the old woman grumbled, clearly offended at the idea of Beatrice travelling with three men. Naturally, the deacon agreed, obviously placating her. However, some matters can be overlooked in situations such as this. What shall we do? Beatrice asked, looking to Brock for answers. Answers he did not have. We can take you to the next village and be back to Thrushwood before dusk, Deacon Eddard reasoned. So long as we are not missed, it should be all right. I doubt anyone would connect our absence and your disappearance. We could acquire horses there, Brock mused. 
But what if someone were to get word of a nobleman in search of three Scots and a red-headed lass travelling together? We'll go ahead of you, Hugh suggested, patting his horse's neck. They've done quite a bit of riding today, but they could manage a little speed, I think. Aye, and we'll reach Silleth in time to prepare the ship for sailing. If all goes well, we should be ready by the time you get there. Would you really be able to make such good time? Beatrice asked, looking less than convinced of this. Derek nodded. Aye, we don't need to sleep much, and could always trade the horses out at some point, whenever we pass a stable with an owner willing to trade. We could be there late tomorrow night, if we start out now. Judging from the sun's position almost overhead, that would give them nearly a day and a half, Brock observed. We'll do our best to meet you there the following morning then, he announced. You think we could? Beatrice asked, chewing her lip. He shrugged, smiling in the hopes of reassuring her. Do we have a choice? Chapter 23 You should wait here, Deacon Eddard decided, handing off the reins to Francis before descending from the seat. It may go easier for me to procure horses than it would for you. Brock all but growled. So it's all throughout England that Scots are hated then? Beatrice winced for him. The deacon merely blinked. You're wearing a blood-stained tunic, my son. And there is still a wound on the back of your head. Brock's embarrassment was evident, as they watched the deacon cross the road on his way to speak with the owner of a large stable just outside the village. I feel a right fool for that, he muttered. No one could blame you, Beatrice tried to soothe him. You're tired and hurt, and haven't been treated well by my countrymen. He snorted. Nor by you at first. You didn't like the looks of me or my companions. She flinched at the memory, and at the way he insisted on bringing it back to her attention. Ock, I'm sorry. He chuckled. I shouldn't mention it. Thank you. After all, I've no desire to feel your slap again, he added, a devilish gleam in his eye. Francis twisted in the seat, looking down at the two of them. You slapped him, she asked. I'm afraid I did, Beatrice admitted, the back of her neck suddenly hot and prickly as the old woman stared with a shrewd look in her eye. Good, Francis decided, turning away again. Some lads need a bit of sense knocked into them. Beatrice bit her lip to hold back a burst of laughter. It had been a strange day indeed. The reminder of the wound on Brock's head stirred the memory of what Derek had loaded into the cart, a bag full of treatments which Sarah had put together for the men prior to their departure. She found it in the straw, opening it to reveal an array of bottles and vials. I have to apply a poultice, she said, examining the back of Brock's head with a sense of dread. There hadn't been time in the woods for either of the other men to help. They'd needed to be on their way. She poured water over the wound, carefully parting his brown hair before doing so. I do wish your hair was shorter, she muttered. You sound like my mother. She was right then. And perhaps you shouldn't be so sharp-tongued when I'm about to put my fingers to a cut on the back of your head. She did what she could, applying the strange-smelling mixture until it appeared to cover the entire injured area. Derek had warned her to look out for signs of infection, as Brock had spent the night in a filthy barn after being hit on the back of his head. What would happen if he became ill? What would she do? Her hands trembled as she put the contents of the bag to right. The deacon returned, leading two sturdy-looking geldings by their reins. They pranced eagerly, sniffing at his garments and whinnying. I believe I procured the best two animals in all the stable. He smiled. The owner is clearly a man of faith. He was happy to let me have them, in exchange for the promise of prayer on his behalf. Nothing more than that? Beatrice asked, awed. Brock didn't look as he believed it, but Deacon Eddard's head bobbed up and down in confirmation of this tale. She wasn't certain whether he was being completely truthful, something which would never have crossed her mind before witnessing just how skilled a liar he was that very day, or if he was merely avoiding Brock's efforts to repay him. Regardless of his motivation, his actions made her heart swell with affection and gratitude. You had best be on your way, he advised, his eyes shifting back and forth. 
Guo tends to travel quickly, even from one village to the next along the main road. You'll want to outrun news of your escape. Aye, we will that, Brock agreed, climbing down from the cart before offering his assistance to Beatrice. She warmed all over when his hands landed on her waist, his strong arms lifting her as though she weighed nothing. Francis's shrewd gaze nearly burned a hole in the back of her head at this show of familiarity, but she pretended not to notice. I don't know how to thank you, Beatrice murmured, taking the deacon's hands in her own. You've done so much for me. Not just today or yesterday. All my life. I could never repay you. His gentle smile was as familiar to her as anything else. My child, I am not asking for repayment. All is as it should be. So long as you are safe and away from that which would cause you strife, I am confident that all I've done was done in service to God. There is little more I can hope to do in this life. She smiled through her tears, giving in to the impulsive desire to throw her arms around his shoulders. Thank you, thank you. Be safe in your journey home. I'm a man of God. He chuckled, looking pleased, if not slightly embarrassed, as he pulled away. None would dare harm me nor Francis. And I'm certain she could take on all comers, he added with another chuckle, lowering his voice to avoid her sharp ears. For a woman of her advanced age, it seemed nothing got past her. The lady herself, handed Beatrice her bundle of belongings. I've added the food from the basket, she explained. Be sure you eat it now. Thank you. How generous. Sure enough, the scent of fresh bread and sweet cakes rose from inside the tight bedspread. Francis glanced at Brock, who was speaking quietly with the deacon. Be careful, she warned. Francis. You've known me my entire life. Do you believe I would do anything to bring shame to myself? Or that I would trust someone who didn't deserve my trust? The old woman's mouth nearly disappeared when she pressed her already thin lips together, but she nodded before long. True. And the deacon trusts him, which I suppose says much for his character. She didn't appear convinced, however. Be on your way now, Deacon Eddard urged, offering her a hand up as she mounted the light brown glistening horse. He seemed gentle, sweet but spirited, and fairly danced with eagerness to be on his way. As though he knew they were about to have an adventure together. Come lass, Brock murmured leading the way. We still have several hours of travel possible before darkness falls. She swallowed hard, looking over her shoulder and waving once more as they departed. The deacon brought the cart around in a wide circle, beginning the journey back to Thrushwood. Her heart was heavy, as she sent up a silent prayer that all would be well when they returned. They were both too good to suffer for what they'd done. What is it, lass? Brock asked, slowing his pace so the two of them might ride abreast. You look as though something's upset you. A sharp barking laugh erupted from her. I cannot imagine what it might be. Perhaps the way we escaped the village. Or how I'll never see my home again. Or the fear in my heart over what might happen, if Randall should find out the deacon spirited us out of Thrushwood under his nose. Brock didn't look offended, in fact he seemed to take much of what she said in stride, no matter the ill humor with which she said it. That's natural, I suppose. I fear for them as well. We can only hope Randall will be too concerned with finding out where we went to remember having crossed paths with him. Or that he'd assume a deacon wouldn't be involved in such a plan. She squared her shoulders, knowing there was little she could do about what happened in Thrushwood. She was heading on to a new life. Of course. We can only hope. And she did. She did most fervently. It was only mid-afternoon then, the longer days of late spring giving them more than enough time to distance themselves from Thrushwood. She took a deep breath, hoping to clear her head and rouse herself somewhat. Two straight nights spent without sleep were beginning to take their toll, it was one thing when they were excited, barely escaping their enemy, but another after the excitement had eased. I've never been this far from Thrushwood in my life, she admitted, taking in the sight of the foothills up ahead. They were thickly forested, but the road they travelled appeared to cut its way through those trees. A single brown line in the middle of so much green. Really? Brock sounded impressed with this. 
I suppose you had already been around the world by the time you reached my age. She chuckled. Perhaps not the entire world, lass, but I had seen a thing or two. He rubbed the back of his neck, shrugging. Ock, when you have a home life worth staying home for, there's no reason to travel as I did. You didn't have a good life? I know others had worse, he amended. Derek and Hugh, their father was a brute. They ran off as young men, determined to be rid of him. Sarah and Heather, I told you of them. You spoke of Sarah, she replied searching through her sleepy foggy brain. I don't think you ever spoke of Heather. They're sisters, he explained. I first made their acquaintance after they'd wed the laird and his brother, but before they came under the protection of the Duncan clan, they were terribly ill-used by a brutish stepfather. She shivered, rubbing one hand against the other arm to soothe the goose flesh which had sprung up there. One thing she had never suffered, and she was grateful for it. Even so. I wouldn't say that I had a loving home life, she murmured. Not after my father's passing. He clicked his tongue against his teeth. Och lass I could sew my own mouth shut at times. There's a reason I so often stay silent, I can't seem to avoid saying the wrong things. She merely smiled. No need to feel sorry for saying what you did. I had forgotten how lonely things were for you and your sister, he murmured, still apologetic. I must admit I thought she was daft when we first met. Beatrice laughed, nearly to the point of needing to bring the horse to a halt. Yes well, I've sometimes held the same opinion. Beatrice blinked, not understanding what Brock had just announced. Outdoors. I lass. You wish for me to sleep outdoors. As though saying it again, would make it easier to understand. I. What did you think we would be doing? Spending the night at an inn of course. The way he spoke, as though she were adult for assuming something which to her seemed like common sense. I've never spent the night out of doors, I think I should warn you. Not that it matters, he muttered. They were both short-tempered, and had grown increasingly so over the course of the long ride. Not only had she never left Thrushwood prior to that day, but she had never ridden for so long at a stretch. Her thighs and backside ached terribly, along with her shoulders and back after sitting for so long in the saddle. What she craved more than anything was a soft bed. It wouldn't even have to be soft. A simple bed would do. Indoors. With a pillow and blankets. Instead, Brock led the way as they left the road and followed the sound of running water. The sun was on the descent, glowing red and orange and gold, painting the countryside and crowning the treetops. They were majestic in the sunset. It all was. Had it not been for her terrible mood, she might have enjoyed it. Where are we going? she asked. I don't know the name, he grumbled. We're going to the water. We need to drink, as do the horses, and I need to bathe. She was glad he was ahead of her, unable to see the way her face burned. He was going to bathe? Not in front of her, she hoped. You're being silly and childish, she chided herself. Even at the point of exhaustion, which she was at that moment, there was still a voice in her head to direct her. He wouldn't have her watch. He'd maintain whatever privacy he could. As would she, since she was also in need of a bath and a clean kirtle after the long day they'd passed. It was the least bit of comfort she had to look forward to, as her night would be passed in the open air, under the starry sky. The thought pleased her slightly when she imagined the prospect as such, then again, she'd likely fall straight to sleep before she had the chance to look at a single star. There had been several instances on the road, when she'd nearly nodded off in the middle of the ride. The mere smattering of trees which she'd observed from the road became full-fledged woods the farther they rode. The sounds of animals, deer, squirrels, rabbits were almost as soothing to her as a lullaby. She recognized them, knew them. You all right back there, lass? Brock asked as his black gelding led the way. Yes? I don't want to turn around to find you asleep and falling from the saddle. I said I was all right, she snapped. Why did he insist on speaking to her that way? One moment he was kind and thoughtful, the next he treated her as though she were no better than an infant. Rather than glaring at the back of his head, 
She looked down at the ground and picked out the flowers she knew. Toadstools grew at the bases of the trees, telling her they were closer than ever to water which moistened the rich soil. The sun's golden rays fought to display themselves between the trees, sending beams shooting down to the floor of the woods. It was a reminder to her that God was all around, and she need not be afraid. Though she would never have shared her thoughts on the matter with Brock, afraid he would think her daft as he put it. He hardly seemed the God-fearing type and would likely laugh to himself if not aloud. There. He came to a halt, pointing ahead. She could hear it, louder than ever, the rushing of a stream. The sound was like music to her ears. Suddenly she was terribly thirsty, and felt unbearably soiled. He led them onward, to a clearing several dozen feet from a bend in the stream. From where she sat, her back against the trunk of a rough bark tree, she couldn't see past the bend thanks to the thick growth of bramble and flowering bushes which grew along the banks. Do you wish to refresh yourself? he asked, taking the horses in hand. She smiled to herself at his attempt to be discreet. I do. Do it then, while I tend the horses. You won't watch, she asked. Do you truly believe I would watch, lass? He shot her a disgruntled look. No. Still she hesitated, and he took notice. Beatrice. He rarely said her name, choosing to refer to her as lass instead, and she took notice. I forget at times that you've not known many men, or many people at all. That's true. There was much more to it, but she was far too tired to explain. And he didn't need to know. It seemed as though her sister had already told him enough. Not everyone wishes to take advantage of you, lass. I know that. Thank you. She rose with a groan, her body having already stiffened after only a few minutes on the ground. His sigh was heavy, that of a man who considered himself greatly put upon. Don't wander too far away, was all he replied. I'll call to ye, to be certain you're safe. She only nodded, too tired to speak much any more. Perhaps it wouldn't matter where they slept after all. She could easily have fallen asleep against the tree if Brock hadn't suggested she bathe. The soil was soft and fragrant on the bank of the stream. Would things smell the same in Scotland? A silly question, of course. And yet her imagination wandered as she removed her shoes, her stockings. She untied the corners of the bedspread, moving the food Francis had packed off to the side before retrieving the soap she had brought along. It would be a wise idea to dunk her kirtle in the stream too, she thought as she removed it. Goose flesh spread over her arms once she was down to nothing more than her underdress, a quick glance over her shoulder told her Brock was nowhere around. What else did she expect? Her mother's teachings had made a deeper impression than she'd guessed, or so it seemed. Nothing he'd done had given her any reason to doubt his sincerity. And yet there she was, behaving as though he were no better than Randall himself. She drew a deep breath, gathering her courage before stepping to the cool running water. She'd bathe with the thin underdress on, she decided unwilling to shed every stitch of clothing even if she trusted her traveling companion. There was still something vaguely sinful, at least in her mind about being nude in the open. She worked quickly, relishing the sensation of clean water running over her legs, squatting so that it might come up past her waist. There were rocks all around her, one of which she leaned against to keep her balance. The stream rushed over the rocks as it had for years, wearing them smooth. Once she was clean except for her hair, she unwound her braid and tipped her head forward, allowing her hair to dangle into the water. Her hand slipped from the slick rock. She fell forward, face first, too quickly to catch her balance or even cry out. One moment she was crouching in the stream, and the next she was scrambling for purchase, the water sweeping her away as her hands shot out for something to hold on to. Panic took over the air rushing from her lungs and leaving her desperate for a breath of air. She must not breathe in. She had to get her hands and knees under her, somehow, and get her head above water. Every instinct she possessed forced her to draw a breath. She would die if she didn't take a breath. She had to breathe. Something grabbed her around the wrist, pulling hard, twisting until she was certain the bones would snap. But she was out of the water, sputtering and coughing with her hair plastered to her face. Lass. 
What happened? I didn't think you could swim. Brock. He'd saved her from drowning. She used her other hand, the one he was not holding, to peel the hair from her face and open her eyes. They were not very far from where she'd opened the bedspread. It had felt as though she'd been underwater for much longer, that the current had taken her much farther. It must have been the effect of panic, of the desperate need to take a breath. She hadn't been in the water for very long at all. Thank you, she sputtered still breathing hard. I slipped. So I can see, he grumbled. I heard a splash and called out for ye. Good thing I was close enough to reach you quickly. Yes, she whispered. Good thing. It only occurred to her in that moment that she wore nothing but a soaked underdress which clung to her otherwise naked body. She wrenched her wrist from his hand and crossed her arms over her chest. Please, I need a moment to dress. He cleared his throat, she was looking away, ashamed, or else she might have been able to tell from his expression what was going on in his mind. What must he think of her? I'll wait for you by the fire I built, he offered. It might grow chill during the night, and both of us drying out. She only nodded. There was little else she could bring herself to do. Chapter 24 She'd had a close call, to be sure. Brock reminded himself how shaken she must feel when she returned to the camp he'd set up for them. You can rest there, he advised, pointing to the saddle he'd propped up against a birch. It's not as good as a pillow, but it's better under the head than the hard earth. Thank you, she murmured, not meeting his eyes. And there is plenty of food which Francis packed for us. Bread and cakes. His stomach rumbled in appreciation. Aye. Ye had better take what ye want now while I'm washing, or else you'll risk my eating all of it when I get back. He tried to sound cheerful, but it didn't seem to matter to her just then. Her modesty had been grievously injured, much more so than her body. He spied a few scrapes on her hands, which she'd likely earned while trying to gain a hold of the rocks beneath the rushing water. Otherwise, she appeared to be in fine shape. There was a deeper pain than the physical, he knew. His heart went out to her, even as his irritation stirred. Why did she have to be so hard-headed? This was the same lass who'd rushed into the barn with a dirk tucked into her garter, ready to free him and ride off on a horse which wasn't hers. And yet the fact that he'd made out the shape of her body caused her such terrible pain. He couldn't make sense of it. I'll go now, he said, spying the last of the sun's rays as the glowing ball sank beneath the horizon in a blaze of colour, wishing to finish before it grew dark. Rest here. She merely nodded, sitting on the saddle blanket which he'd spread before the tree. What a strange lass. Like two different people in one body. She could be brave, almost recklessly so. She could stand up for herself against strangers. She could take great risks to save a stranger. And yet she had all but closed up on him. She wouldn't meet his gaze. Well, she had the right idea about at least one thing, whether or not she had intended to do so. He washed his tunic and trousers in the stream, crouching on the bank before submerging himself in the cool water. It was rather slick in spots. No wonder she'd fallen in. He finished quickly, careful to keep his head dry so as to not disturb the poultice, that plus the tincture had provided great relief, and shook out his wet clothing before putting it back on. It would dry quickly enough while he sat before the fire. How would she behave when he returned? Would she continue avoiding him? As though they had meant nothing to each other thus far. He could almost feel the touch of her hand on his, as they'd hidden in the cart covered with straw. That very morning, he'd looked into her eyes and all but fallen under her spell. If given the chance, he would have declared his love for her then and there. How had everything changed so suddenly? He didn't get the chance to ask, for she was fast asleep when he found her. She'd drawn half of the blanket over herself and was curled into a ball, as though even in sleep she felt the need to protect herself. Sleep then, he whispered, daring to reach out and stroke the hair which seemed to glow in the light from the fire. At least he could touch her in that simple way while she was asleep. By the time they awoke, it was already well past dawn and into the morning. Brock opened his eyes first, 
jumping in surprise when he realized he'd slept for hours and left them both vulnerable as a result. He hadn't intended to do so, had only wished to rest lightly for a short while. It seemed his body had other ideas. Everything looked as it should, they'd gotten lucky. The fire had died out long since, and the horses chewed on grass around the base of the trees to which he'd tied off their reins. Even the remnants of the old woman's cakes waited to be eaten. He'd saved what he could, knowing they'd both be hungry once they woke, and fairly certain the lass wouldn't take well to the idea of freshly skinned rabbit to break her fast. It appeared as though she hadn't moved an inch during the night, still curled into a ball on her right side facing him. The blanket was still drawn up around her chin, as he'd been sure to leave it before closing his eyes, and the sounds of her soft snoring were as steady as they'd been hours earlier. Beatrice. He covered the glowing remnants of the fire with dirt, stamping it down with his foot. Beatrice. It's time to move on. She stirred, letting out a groan of dismay. He bit back a smile. What? It's morning already. I didn't hear, she paused to let out a yawn, the rooster. She thought she was still on the farm. We're halfway to Silithlas. No longer in Thrushwood. She sat upright, eyes wide, hair a tangled mess about her face. She'd fallen asleep before it was dry, and it had stuck itself to her cheek, reminding him of the way she'd looked when he pulled her from the stream, in fact. It's late, she breathed. Not so very late, but we'd best be on our way and ride at a stately pace if we hope to reach Silith tonight. Yes, of course. She sprang to her feet. What can I do? He chuckled softly. You can rest and eat what's left of the cakes. I was sure to leave some. Oh. Some of the frantic energy drained from her face as she looked down at the pile of sweets. Thank you. Did you really think I would leave you to go hungry in the morning? He picked up the blankets, shaking them free of dirt and leaves. We can always stop for something to eat around midday if you wish. Only if you think it's a wise idea, she murmured, chewing daintily. And I wish to apologize for my behavior last night. I was very tired. I hadn't slept in two nights. You hadn't? She shook her head when he looked at her over his shoulder. No. So much has happened in so short a time, hasn't it? The day before you arrived at the farm, Deacon Eddard had informed me of my impending marriage. I see. That would be enough to rob anyone of their sleep. And the next night, I spent at the manor house. I knew he'd. She trailed off, staring out toward the stream. I knew he'd taken you. I couldn't sleep, knowing that. He cleared his throat, suddenly unsure of himself. What could he say to thank her for what she'd done? What could possibly express his gratitude? I suppose it was a blessing, some divine inspiration which led me to visit the manor house when I did, she suggested. If I hadn't, I would never have known you were there. I, while Hugh and Derek believed me to be on my way to Silith. Why did they believe that? she asked, wiping her hands on the cloth which Francis had used to wrap the food. They never told me. He clenched his teeth, knowing she deserved an answer but wishing just the same to avoid giving it. I told them I was going to take you to Silith. I wrote a letter, explaining why I was going to do it. Neither of them agreed with me, of course, when I suggested we kidnap you. Silence descended between them, and he turned away to check his horse's saddle to avoid having to look at her. She deserved the truth, didn't she? Though perhaps he should have kept it to himself until they reached the ship. At first he thought she was weeping. He turned with a sinking heart, dreading what he was about to face. Instead, to his surprise, she was doubled over in laughter. You were going to kidnap me. To take me away. A fresh burst of laughter and she doubled even further. I don't know what's so funny about that lass. You. Oh goodness. I'm sorry. She laughed, waving her hands, losing her breath. It's just that so much has happened and. It isn't funny, not really. Why am I laughing? He shook his head as she continued to giggle helplessly, tears streaming down her cheeks. I honestly do not know. It took several minutes for her to get herself under control, 
and even then, a small burst of laughter would erupt now and again. I'm sorry, she said again, struggling to compose herself. Truly. I understand why you wanted to do it, of course. It's only that I can hardly imagine you managing to kidnap me and keep me quiet. HMPH. He turned away again. You're right. I don't know how I would have managed that part. She truly was the strangest lass. Chapter 25 It was dark by the time the first of Silith's cottages came into view. Beatrice blessed the sight, her thighs aching as much as they ever had after riding nearly straight through the day. They'd only stopped for the sake of answering nature's call, and had once stopped at a baker's for fresh meat pies. Those had given her the strength to go on, along with the thought that she was closer to her sister all the time. She had asked question after question about Marjorie throughout the day, whatever came to mind. It was something to do, something other than riding in silence and admiring the scenery. Not that it wasn't beautiful, or worthy of admiration. She'd never seen such beauty, such lushness. Was this what the rest of the world was like? Back in Thrushwood, she had often spent hours seated at the window once the day's work was done. She had stared off at the horizon, admiring the passing of the seasons. The majesty of an untouched snowfall, the very trees appearing as though they'd turned to snow and ice. The glory of autumn's blaze of colors, almost obscene in their utterly shameless display. As though the very leaves were proud of their beauty. She had waited, holding her breath, as baby birds pushed their way out of fragile shells. She'd laughed to herself, while watching squirrels frolicking, jumping from tree to tree as they chased one another. She'd admired butterflies as they'd hovered over the fragrant roses which grew alongside the stone wall, separating church ground from the road beyond, fluttering their delicate wings. She'd still never seen anything like what surrounded her on the road to Silith. And it extended without end in all directions. That was the most surprising bit. How far do you think it goes, she'd asked at one point more of herself than of Brock. On and on for leagues beyond us, he'd replied in a voice which revealed more than he might have known. He was just as awed by it as she, though he'd seen so much more than she had. She wondered about him then. He'd spoken of an unhappy life, which had sent him out into the world. Funny how hers had left her in a world even smaller, as though she had crumbled in on herself somehow. It was enough to make her think again about the baby birds she'd watched, pecking their way out of shells in order to begin a life. She'd never considered before just how brave those birds were, even if they didn't know it. To leave the only home they'd ever known, even though it was too cramped for them to live in any longer. There were still untold dangers outside the shell. And they, they freed themselves. No one could do it for them, she'd learned at a young age. They had to do it on their own. She had to do it on her own, even if they had received a bit of help. She might not have ever left her little shell, if they hadn't come for her. The scent of sea air hit her nose, not long after they'd passed the first cottage on the outskirts of Silith. She wrinkled it in response, it wasn't an unpleasant smell so much as an unfamiliar one. Silith Bay, Brock announced, chuckling at her reaction. You'll grow used to the scent of sea air in time, lass. Once we've reached Kirkordy, you'll wonder how you ever lived without it in your lungs. He sounded proud and happy. The way he loved the sea was evident. She supposed it was the sort of thing that had to be born in a person, the way a love of animals was born in some and not in others. It wasn't the kind of love that could be taught or learned. How long have you been sailing? she asked. All my life, it seems. My father was a fisherman, and he used to take me out on his boat before I was hardly old enough to walk. He used to laugh, and tell me of the way I'd squall and scream to get him to take me out with him. I couldn't speak, mind ye, but I could be certain that he understood me. She laughed. I suppose there was nothing else you could do with your life then. Nothing else would suit you. I. And now that I'll have the run of McInnes shipping, I'll be able to go back to it. Beatrice frowned, then wondered why she did. What difference did it make to her, what he did for a living? A man had to have an occupation, and running a shipping company was just as valuable a vocation as any. 
but it wasn't the sort of vocation a man held when he had a wife and a family. It wasn't the sort of thing a man did when he intended to marry someday. What did it matter? Why did she ache so? He had no understanding of what went on in her thoughts, so he expected her to be excited when he pointed to a ship far off in the distance. There she is, he whispered, his excitement growing all the time. Like a little boy. She wished he didn't stir her affection so. Will we set out tonight? she asked, hoping against hope that they would continue the journey and he'd be too busy as the ship's captain to spend much time with her. It would be easier that way. Nay, he replied, and her hopes sank further than they already had. We'll wait until morning, since this is an unfamiliar harbor and I'll want to have full sight of everything around us. I see. We'll spend the night in an inn, if it makes you feel better. He grinned. His mood had vastly improved indeed. Or I can row us out to the ship. I'm certain Hugh and Derek are waiting out there for our arrival. Her cheeks flushed at the thought of sharing a ship with three men who had no sailing to do, no activity to keep them occupied. Then again, Brock hadn't so much as laid a finger on her in the night. Once again, the stories and warnings of her mother had worked their way into her mind. In the end, she decided that a bed would be preferable to anything awaiting on the ship. I would prefer the inn tonight, if it is all the same. If it isn't too great an expense. It won't be. We didn't pay for use of the horses, after all. She didn't say another word as they rode deep into the village, which reminded her of Thrushwood in many ways, but was vastly different in others. There were far more inns and taverns, and women in striped hoods stepped into at least two of the stone buildings they passed. Who are they? Beatrice asked, taking note of the hoods. Do you really want to know, lass? When she raised her eyebrows in silent question, he sighed. Let's say they wear those hoods to let others know how they earn their living. And those buildings they stepped into are the houses in which they work. She discerned the truth from the tone of his voice and the careful way he spoke. So they were the sorts of women he had once killed a man for in an attempt to protect. She'd never seen one of them in person before and was surprised to find that they didn't look any different from her. What had she expected? Up ahead is the inn where we spent the night before heading to Thrushwood, he explained. Marjorie spent the night there as well, and told us about it. It's a very clean, pleasant place. You'll like it. Will you stay there too? He shook his head. I'll row out to the ship. I've been fairly bursting to see it, and to speak with the others. I see. I will come back for you at dawn, he promised. I will be ready. Even she heard how sad she sounded. So did he. What is it lass? What's the matter? We got away, we'll be setting sail in the morning. You'll be with your sister again in a week or ten days. Isn't that happy news? He was trying to cheer her, and she knew it should make her smile. She felt as though she wanted to cry instead. It is. She smiled making sure to sound light and glad. I would do well to get a good night's sleep I think. I've never ridden this long at a stretch before. I'm simply overtired. We'll see to finding you a room then. He tapped the horse's ribs with his heels and it picked up speed. She had no choice but to follow suit. Did he know the attention he attracted simply by riding down the street on which the inn was located? As she was behind him, she had the chance to watch heads turn as he passed. He was a foreigner, through and through, his dress and his manner too rough to pass as English. It made little sense to her, since as a harbour village, Silleth would naturally be full of foreigners at all times. There was simply something about the Scottish which her countrymen disliked. Even detested. And she'd risked her freedom, perhaps even her life, in order to free him. What would the men stumbling out of one of the village's many taverns, blustery and red-cheeked from drink, think, if they knew a simple farm girl was willing to go so far? The innkeeper was a very jolly man, who seemed happy simply to be alive. You've returned, he rejoiced when she entered with Brock beside her. I as promised, Brock replied, shaking the man's thick hand. 
Will you have a room available for the lass? I'll be spending the night on the ship, out beyond the harbor. The innkeeper's beady yet kind eyes fell on her. Of course, of course, we would be happy to have a nice young lady with us this evening. My wife will show you the way to your room, my dear. Thank you. She looked up at Brock, uncertain of how to part ways. I will take the horses to the stable, and we'll meet you here first thing in the morning, he promised. Good night then. She felt strangely hollow inside, as the equally portly, equally jovial wife of the innkeeper led her up a flight of wood plank stairs and down a narrow hall to a small, yet clean and comfortable room. The window faced the street, and when she was alone, Beatrice looked out to the activity below. After a few minutes, she spied Brock walking the horses past the inn. From above, he might have been anyone at all. She swung the window closed, latching it firmly to shut out the activity just outside. The room was as clean and pleasant as promised, and she liked to believe her sister had spent the night there on her way to Kirkcordy. What had she thought when she'd first learned she hadn't sailed to the east coast of England? It was sheer luck and providence which had brought her to Derek's attention, otherwise, Beatrice reflected, she might have come to an unhappy end. The memory of the women in striped hoods came back to her. It was a sobering thought. Best to get some sleep, she whispered. A habit she'd picked up without noticing, it was only then at that very moment that she realized she'd fallen into talking to herself during Marjorie's absence. She'd have to break herself of it, since she wouldn't be alone anymore. But she wouldn't be with Brock, either. She sat on the bed with a thud. So that was it. She'd finally come to the heart of why she felt so uncertain, so empty in spite of the new adventure ahead of her. He would go on to an adventure of his own, once they reached the Duncans and her sister. All along, she'd assumed he would be part of her new life. What a silly assumption. She'd never thought to ask if he lived in the shadow of the manor house, if he was part of the clan as her sister had become. She hadn't understood until then, the direction her heart had travelled, while she was too busy trying to escape with their lives to notice. She had fallen in love with him. She had never been in love before. Naturally, she dreamed of it. She and Marjorie had spent hours giggling together over what falling in love with feel like. How dashing and brave and handsome the men they'd give their hearts to would be. Brock was handsome and brave and even dashing. But he didn't love her. He wanted his life on the sea. The way his entire demeanor had changed when he spied the ship waiting for them. The way he'd spoken of his lifelong love of sailing. There was no question what he'd do once they returned. And she would never ask him to change himself. He'd be unhappy the rest of his days. She knew what it was to put herself aside for the sake of another, and wouldn't put anyone she loved through that. There was a soft knock at the door, and her heart leapt when she realized she hadn't brought the bundle of clothing up with her. He must have found it, and decided to bring it back for her. She might have the chance to thank him for saving her in the stream at least, before the two of them no longer had any time to speak privately. As she opened the door, she knew what she would say. The sight of the man who stood before her rendered all of it useless. Randall smiled his teeth flashing. What took you so long to get here? Chapter 26 The horses were being cared for, and Brock waved the chance to collect payment for them. I must give you something in return, the owner of the stable insisted when he saw the pair of geldings Brock brought him. Nay, after all, the horse you gave me unfortunately is back in the village to which I travelled. I didn't return it to you, as we'd agreed. The man waved a hand, chuckling. It's nothing. Your countrymen returned theirs as agreed, and I'm coming out ahead in the end. These are two excellent replacements. It didn't feel right, accepting money for something he hadn't paid for. If there was a way to send the proceeds off to Deacon Eddard, he would have, but he couldn't imagine a situation in which the silver wouldn't be stolen. The stable owner had certainly experienced a change of heart, Brock noted with a smile, as he untied the packs from his horse's saddle before handing them over. The knotted bedspread caught his eye, and he realized Beatrice wouldn't have her things with her overnight. 
Returning them would at least mean the possibility of seeing her again, if only for a few moments. Something had changed between them, something he couldn't quite place. She had seemed defeated when they parted ways, something beyond the fatigue she had tried to use as an excuse. As though a wall had appeared, one which he could see through but could not get through. Why it mattered so much that the lass be happy, he couldn't explain. She was unpredictable, temperamental, stubborn as a mule. He would be well rid of her once it was time for them to part ways. And for the first time in his life, the thought of parting ways with a woman gave him pause. He hadn't thought it possible before then. He'd always held himself above getting entangled with a woman, adding a new set of problems and trials to a life with trials of its own. There was the question of his vocation as well. The memory of Angus McGuinness always stayed in the back of his memory, a reminder of the folly of marrying a woman he would so rarely spend time with. It wouldn't be fair to the lass either, making it necessary for her to be alone again. Several days from her sister, days of hard travel over rough landscape. The ride from Thrushwood to Sillith had been easy in comparison, even when they'd ridden through the hills. It would be too cruel to ask her to make a sacrifice such as that. Was he entertaining the idea of wedding the lass? By the time he arrived at the inn, he was more mixed up than he'd ever thought possible. So mixed up, he nearly didn't notice the change in the innkeeper's demeanour. The man was no longer laughing. He wasn't even smiling when Brock approached him, the gathered bedspread under one arm. Brock eyed him up and down, his memory going back to the over-friendly stable owner. He had changed too since the last time they'd met. And the man who owned the inn had been his laughing, jovial self when they had arranged Beatrice's lodging. Something was very wrong. Where is she? he asked, dispensing with the niceties when his instincts warned him his lass was in danger. Because she was his lass, his and his alone, no matter what anyone else believed. The man's eyes cut to the door. He paid me, he blubbered, hands near his face as though he feared Brock would strike him. He said she stole something from him, and he was coming to settle accounts. Threatened me when I refused. Brock didn't need to ask who the man was. Where did he take her? The man pointed out the door, toward the harbour. Said something about settling accounts on the ship. I didn't find out what he meant. No matter. I know what he meant. He dashed out into the night, cutting across the busy street and down a narrow alley which led to the harbour. Beatrice had stolen from Randall. She had stolen his prize. The man he had waited seven years to kill. The man he believed would be on board the ship by then. He must have paid the stable owner too, after inquiring whether Brock had been in. No wonder he'd been so pleasant. There was almost no activity in the harbour, along the docks which stretched out into the water. Brock squinted, looking out across the bay to where the ship was waiting. There was a rowboat which had nearly reached the vessel. He ducked behind a stack of wooden crates when he saw it, wanting to avoid the chance that Randall or the rower caught sight of him. They were going to board in hopes that he would be there. Randall would likely try to barter Beatrice's life for his. Only in the end he would kill her too. Brock was certain of it. With that in mind, he darted across the dock to the nearest rowboat and jumped inside, taking the oars in both hands and rowing as hard as he ever had. The three of them, Randall, his man, and Beatrice, were aboard the ship by the time he'd made it halfway there. If the bastard had been smart, he would have brought a second man along to keep watch. Then again, he expected his victim to be aboard. He believed he was smarter than all of them, that he had the element of surprise on his side. How surprised he would be when he found he'd arrived early. Rage flowed through Brock's veins as he worked, the oars cutting through the dark water faster and faster the more enraged he became. If Randall dared harm her. He allowed the boat to glide the rest of the way to the ship, and its rope ladder which hung over the side, hoping to avoid notice if he moved quietly. With the dirk between his teeth, he climbed hand over hand until he'd nearly reached the deck, waiting with breath held to listen for the sound of footsteps or voices. I said, where is he? Randall sounded nearly frantic, unable to believe he'd been bested. 
They were on the deck then, closer to the bow, while he was at the stern. He dared raise his head just enough to look through the openings between the rail's wooden posts. Randall stood with his back to Brock, with Derek in front of him and Hugh to his right. Also to his right were the man he'd brought along for the task and Beatrice, held tight to the man's chest. The way she stood, frozen, told him there was like as not a blade at her throat. The look on Hugh's face confirmed his fears. Both he and his brother had been taken by surprise, it was clear. Brock wondered if either of them were armed, believing as they likely had that they were out of harm's way. They could easily have left all weapons below deck. He isn't here, Derek explained, hands held in front of him with palms facing out. He hasn't arrived on the ship. Lies. Randall barked. He left this one at the inn and was overheard stating he'd come from the ship in the morning. He was coming here. He must have arrived by now. Why are you concealing him from me? Search the ship if you like, Derek replied, his tone even. You won't find him. He never arrived. Perhaps he stopped in the village for something to eat or drink, Hugh suggested. As he spoke his eyes travelled the breadth of the deck and fell on Brock, to his credit he registered no surprise or recognition. He did, however, keep talking. Diversion, Brock realised. There's no reason for you to hold a knife to the lass's throat, he continued. She's done nothing to deserve this. She only wished to travel to her sister's new home, so the two of them could be together. Nothing more. She did nothing to harm you. More lies, Randall spat. He tossed his cape back over one shoulder to reveal the short sword at his hip, and his hand caressed the hilt. The sight of it made Brock's blood run cold. She helped him escape, Randall continued. There were witnesses. The moment I heard of this, I knew there was nothing to do but follow you. Everyone knew you were on your way to Silith. And he'd managed to reach the harbour village before he and Beatrice because they'd slept so late, Brock realised. A man obsessed might even ride through the night, foregoing sleep in order to get what he wanted. Vengeance in this case. He had to end it, and fast, before something terrible happened. In a burst of movement he hauled himself up and over the deck rail, taking the dirk in one hand the moment his feet touched the polished wooden planks. Derek's eyes shifted in his direction, catching Randall's attention. The man spun, a sick triumphant smile stretching his lips. From the corner of his eye, Brock noticed Hugh throw himself at the man who held Beatrice captive. She screamed and ducked out of the way while the two of them tussled. Hugh fell back, one hand to his shoulder as blood poured between his fingers. The attacker raised his arm as if to strike another blow. Derek let out a strangled cry and flung himself at the man, the two of them falling to the deck in a flurry of fists and kicking feet. The dirk the man had been holding skittered across the deck. Brock returned his focus to Randall, who withdrew the sword from its sheath. No. Beatrice screamed, moving as though to run toward them. Stay back. Brock barked, holding up his free hand to signal her to stop. Do not come any closer, lass. I'll do whatever you want, she shrieked, and he knew she wasn't speaking to him. Instead, she was offering herself to Randall. She'd do anything he wanted, so long as he'd leave the rest alone. Randall's scornful laugh told them what he thought of this. As though you're the most important concern now, he sneered, never taking his eyes from Brock's. You need not offer yourself to me, girl. I'll have you, sure enough, with or without your permission. The satisfaction I get from you will be all the sweeter, knowing I took you from him. Brock snarled, thrusting the dirk in Randall's direction, causing him to fall back a step. He advanced on him again, not expecting to make contact but wishing to throw the man off balance. To his right, the fighting continued, with Derek reaching for the dirk which had fallen from the stranger's hand. Hugh scrambled for it, a little uneven due to loss of blood, but he reached the weapon and tossed it to his brother. Brock heard a strangled cry of pain as the blade slid home. It was enough to catch Randall's eye, enough to distract him so Brock could lunge forward. But his reflexes were sharper than Brock had imagined, for within the blink of an eye he had recovered and swung the sword in a wide arc. Brock felt the sting first, a sharp burning pain. After that, 
the rush of warmth as blood pooled over his skin and soaked into his tunic. He staggered backward a few steps, his back hitting the railing. Beatrice's screams and protests rang in his ears as he raised a foot and kicked out, catching an advancing Randall mid-torso and sending him reeling back, arms pinwheeling wildly. It gave him enough time to get his feet under him, though he swayed slightly. He didn't dare look down to see how severe the wound was, but judging from Beatrice's broken cries it was hideous and perhaps even mortal. Come at me, he roared, Dirk at the ready, feet planted at shoulder width. I'll split you in half. Randall threatened, holding the bloodied sword high as he rushed ahead. Brock knew he had one thing on his side, a sense of calm. In contrast, Randall was nearly frantic, bloodlust overtaking his good sense. Everything before him seemed to sharpen and slow down, every moment stretching into eternity. The way the moon glinted off the sword, off Randall's golden hair. The crazed look in his eyes as he rushed ahead, his gait wide and unsteady, skill and grace tossed aside in favor of brute violence. He brought the sword down, arcing sideways as though he wished to remove Brock's head from his shoulders. His mouth opened in a scream of crazed rage as he swung wide and unbalanced. Brock ducked, avoiding the blade by mere inches, he felt the rush of air above his head, and thrust the dirk forward and up into Randall's undefended side. It slid between the ribs, like a warm knife sliding into butter. The man gasped, his back arching, his head falling back. Brock forced the dirk upward, farther into the lung, and blood bubbled from Randall's mouth along with a faint cry. He collapsed at Brock's feet, the sword clattering beside him, his eyes already glazing over. The last thing Brock heard before darkness overtook him was the sound of Beatrice calling his name. Chapter 27 Beatrice turned her head to the side, but she still heard the sound of the bodies hitting the water when Hugh and Derek worked together to throw them overboard. They'd both been injured and similarly. Hugh's shoulder was slashed, but she'd helped him clean the wound and had heeded his instructions in treating it. He had clearly learned a lot from Sarah. She'd bandaged it, feeling clumsy in spite of his assurances to the contrary. Derek had shed no blood, but there was bruising all along his shoulder and upper arm. I wrenched it pretty well. He chuckled in an attempt to hide his pain. He could move it, meaning there was no break but the muscles were all torn. He fashioned a sling which Beatrice helped him slide around the arm, holding it steady. It had taken a dose of one of Sarah's pain-relieving tinctures to even allow that slight amount of motion. They were lucky to have two young men aboard who could manage the heavy labor necessary to man the ship, young men who'd come in with them and were dedicated to the men who paid their wages. We can trust them to remain silent, Derek assured her. They're no strangers to the rougher side of life. It was cold comfort to Beatrice, who couldn't seem to shake off the shock and horror of what she'd witnessed. Two men were dead, had died before her very eyes. Men who'd intended to hurt her. To kill her, even. Who had roughly, callously pulled her from her room at the inn, and all but dragged her to the rowboat, then onto the ship. No one had come to her aid, though she had been certain of witnesses all along the way. Randall was a nobleman, after all. He dressed like one too. None of them would have dared defy him, or even question the way he treated her. Things might have ended far differently. She went below deck after watching the clumsy makeshift burial at sea, having satisfied the need to watch Randall slip beneath the waves. Though she'd witnessed his death, had watched him breathe his last, there had still been the desire to make certain he'd never come back to hurt her. What did that mean? What did it say about her? Would she go to hell for being glad he was dead and gone? Did it matter? She wasn't certain of anything anymore. No, that wasn't true. As she descended the ladder which led to the lower decks, she reflected on the one thing she knew for certain. The man she loved waited for her, his eyes slightly glassy, though she knew it was a result of the tincture she'd given him earlier in the hopes of relieving his pain. It isn't that bad really, he'd insisted. A scratch. Yes a scratch. One which extended from just below his left shoulder to the center of his chest, then curved down to his navel. A scratch which had caused him to lose enough blood that he'd lost consciousness moments after Randall died. She'd believed Brock to be dead too. 
and in that instant, she'd wanted to die with him. She loved him. It was as simple as that, if such a thing could be simple. It's done, she announced in a quiet voice sitting beside his cot. He looked at the ceiling, sighing. Good riddance. I feel so much guilt for believing the same thing, she confessed. But I can't help myself. Nor should you, he murmured. The hand closest to her slid across the straw-filled tick mattress and onto her lap, where her hands rested. She turned one hand over to clasp his. You did nothing wrong, she whispered. Killing him, I mean. It was necessary. I, he replied. I didn't feel that way about the first one of course. I wasn't protecting myself that night. You were trying to protect another, she reminded him. Which is noble. Would you feel that way if I were a stranger? A brutish Scot. Her cheeks colored, as she remembered her original impression of him. If I knew the truth of what happened, yes. I would. What if I told you I enjoyed it at the time, he asked. I didn't need to beat the man, as I did. I could have stopped. Should have stopped. He was no longer a threat to the lass. But I simply couldn't help myself. I've never been able to help myself, when it comes to men who harm women. What sort of man is that? And yet, what sort of man beats another man to death? She drew a long, shaky breath. You did what you felt had to be done. When I look at the man Randall was and think of how his nephew might have been, knowing what he was really, seeing what he did to that girl, I can understand it. And so could Deacon Eddard. He told me so. Brock chuckled. I wondered why he was so keen to help me. And how you found out about it. He thought I should know. I'm glad he told me. The knowing of it. He looked out the small round porthole above the cot, where stars seemed to choke the sky. Knowing it didn't make you hate me. Hate you? How could I ever hate you? I know how you were raised. With religion and such. Does it seem as though I hate you? She tightened her hold on his hand. Do you think I would have raced out to the Randall house on horseback to free you from that barn if I hated you? Or that I would have traveled alone with you if I hated you, or was frightened of you. His eyes met hers, and she thought she'd never seen him look so glad even when they escaped detection in that straw-filled cart. I don't know that I could have borne your hating me, lass. Suddenly it was as if all the air left the room. She could no longer breathe. Did he notice how her palm grew slick with perspiration? He had to, for he released it. Only to reach for her. To stroke her cheek with the backs of his fingers. Her eyes drifted down to his torso, which was bare except for the bandages which she'd wrapped around it. In spite of the injury he'd suffered, in spite of its ugliness, she had thrilled at the feeling of him beneath her hands. She rested one palm on his chest, careful of the wound beneath the bandage. I believe I know your heart, she whispered, wishing she could think of something better to say. Something which would suit the strength of emotion which seemed to boil in her core. I know how good it is, how true. I've known it since the first, since you came to the house and were so kind to me. Though you held a sword, he whispered, tucking a strand of hair behind her ear. I remember thinking how magnificent you were. You did, she asked, giggling softly as her heart beat faster than ever. I lass. The most beautiful, wonderful thing I'd ever seen. I believe. He held her chin in his hand, letting his fingers run over the curve of her jaw. I believe I loved you then. That very day. You love me, she breathed a lump in her throat. I. I love you most terribly. I know I'm not the sort of man you want to hear speaking those words but. I love you. The words poured out without her thinking them, as though it was her heart speaking for her. Using the hand cupping her chin, he drew her face closer. She leaned down, as he was unable to come to her, and allowed him to pull her in for a soft, gentle kiss. She had never been kissed before, had nothing to compare it to. But what could be compared to the burst of sensation which raced through her, until she tingled to the tips of her toes and fingers? What could be better than the warmth coming from him, the firm smoothness of his lips against hers? 
the way his hand curled at the back of her neck, holding her closer. And her hand moving up to his shoulder, clutching at the bulging muscles there. Was this passion, the heat which swept over her which made her tremble so? Was that what seemed to pull a soft sigh from the back of her throat, was it what made her want more? He pulled back, taking a shaky breath as he did. It might be for the best I'm injured lass. He chuckled, his voice deeper than normal. I might not be able to control myself. She opened her eyes finding his so close to hers. I would never agree with you otherwise but perhaps you're right. Because she wasn't certain she'd be able to control her passion either. Chapter 28 Beatrice worried more than once during the journey over land that they would never reach the highlands. Once they did, she was certain they'd never reach the Duncan Manor House. The fact that she'd ever considered the flat smooth ride to Silleth difficult was laughable. Especially when she slid from her mare at the end of the day and groaned in discomfort from the considerable saddle sores she'd developed. Brock always expressed sympathy. So did the others, though she noticed more than once the way they appeared to be holding back laughter whenever Brock offered to help her from the saddle. She finally couldn't help but ask what they found so amusing. Ask Brock, Derek replied snorting. She turned to him, in time to note the way he glared at his friend. He's remembering the discomfort I suffered during my first stretch of long riding lass. He finds it funny that I struggled so. As if you wouldn't laugh at my expense. Derek chuckled. She saw nothing funny about it. This was the way the men lived, riding out every day to survey the land and make certain there were no threats from rival clans or wild animals encroaching on Duncan territory. How did they manage it? And injured at that, though it looked as though all of the men were recovering well. Hugh brushed off the wound to his shoulder, as though it were nothing more serious than the bite from a bug. The same for Derek, who managed to ride masterfully even with one arm in a sling. They were downright cheerful, as though they took pride in getting hurt. Perhaps they did. Those wounds were a reminder of how brave they'd been. The same was true of Brock. The items which Sarah had provided seemed to be helping with healing, and to ease the pain, a relief for Beatrice, who worried for him night and day, but to a stranger, it would never be evident that the man bore a slashing wound across his chest and torso. Only from time to time did he wince when he moved a certain way, perhaps forgetting his limited abilities. When he did, Beatrice's head would immediately snap around in his direction, and he would offer a smile of reassurance. Even if that smile was sometimes tight, sometimes pained, she would remind herself that he was a man who did not wish to be hovered over. He did not enjoy having others hover over him, any more than she enjoyed when people did it to her. What do you think of the Highlands, Beatrice? Derek sounded jubilant, his excitement having grown the closer they came to arriving home. It wasn't because he felt particularly attached to the Duncans, though he did naturally, but because of her sister and the baby. He loved her so. Anyone could see it, could hear it. More than once had Hugh or Derek been moved to ask him to slow his horse whenever he'd ridden too far ahead. As though he couldn't hold himself back. In spite of the heaviness in her chest when she considered her future with Brock, or whether there would be one at all, she always smiled to herself when Derek's love made itself evident. Marjorie had found a good, honest, strong man who adored her. What more could she want for her sister? If only her own fate were so neatly cinched. There it is. When Derek used his good arm to point to the mountain rising in the distance, and the house which sat nestled against the side of it. There's Ben Nevis, and before it sits the manor house. A manor house? She gasped, wondering if she were only imagining what had revealed itself in the distance. A castle more like. It was lovely, far more impressive than the house which Randall had called home, and even more so thanks to the mountain which towered over it. The effect was stunning, awe-inspiring, and it reminded her just how small she was in comparison. She admired the turrets which rose high over the ground, allowing lookouts to watch for threats from all directions. Were one of Philip Duncan's men looking out for them? Would they spy the band of travellers from a distance? It was still early morning, 
the castle-like manor house coming into view once the four of them had slowly crested an almost improbably steep hill. They would make it to that mountain, and the manor house which sat in its shadows before the end of the day certainly. Her hands tingled when she realized she would be with her sister before the sun set. When she looked to Derek, she saw the same excitement written on his rugged face. Are you glad, lass? Brock's voice was soft, the question meant only for her ears. Glad to be finished with the riding? Yes? She grinned. I will not regret staying in the same place for more than a day at a time, either. He did not share her mirth. It hasn't all been bad, has it? No, it hadn't. The hours they'd spent talking quietly in the firelight, sometimes speaking of nothing important at all. Talking for the sake of talking, for the sake of being together. Their hands clasped beneath a blanket outside the reach of prying eyes. Not that Hugh or Derek weren't gentlemen, turning their backs to the fire when they settled in for the night. Giving them some measure of privacy. They exchanged a long look, the McInnes twins riding ahead of them, once again, pretending they didn't know what was happening behind their backs. I've enjoyed many parts of the journey, she murmured, admiring the way the sun seemed to form a glowing haze around his head as it rose behind him. She would remember that moment always, along with so many others. She would carry it in her heart, and reflect on it whenever she longed for him. The longing would ease with time. She need only wait for enough of her life to pass, until she would forget the way his kiss made her heart race. Until the pressure of his hand on hers faded in her memory, to nothing more than a vague remembrance of fierce, blazing happiness. At least she'd had that happiness. So many never had the chance to feel it at all. By the time the sun reached the midpoint of its journey across the sky, they were greeted by a band of riders. Judging by the nearly identical smiles on the faces of the men around her, she felt confident that they were friends rather than foes. One of the riders was a young woman with light blonde hair. Beatrice was surprised to find a woman riding with the men, but not after Hugh took off at a trot to greet her. Soon, she was on the ground and running for him, jumping into his arms the moment he dismounted. Dalla. Brock chuckled. His wife. Her eyes stung as she watched the touching reunion, gladness and a sense of envy fighting for control. Envy was a sin she knew, but there was no stopping its tug on her. I'm glad to meet you. Dalla beamed once she was finally disentangled from her husband's arms, reaching Beatrice's side. We've already made preparations for you, and your sister is fairly bursting with excitement. When the lookout spotted you, she tried to get out of bed to greet you but Sarah ordered her back. How is she? Derek asked. Just fine. Healthy, though still ill throughout the day. But Sarah is confident all is progressing well. He exchanged a look with Beatrice, whose heart swelled with anticipation. They didn't need to say a word in order for the other to understand what they had in mind. Yeah, he cried out, spurring his horse to a gallop which Beatrice's mare matched. The two of them rode abreast until they reached the manor house, far ahead of the others. She felt as though she was flying all the way. Come, he gasped, all but running to the door after leaving the saddle. She hardly felt the pain in her thighs and rear any more as she followed, barely noticing the inside of the house as she ran up the stairs at his heels. He looked guilty when they came to a stop at one of the many doors which lined both sides of a long corridor. Would you mind giving us just a minute, he asked, his hand on the leather latch. Of course not, she whispered patting his shoulder. The least she could do after what he'd done for her was to allow him a little privacy. He hurried into the room, and the sounds of Marjorie's muffled, happy cries greeted her ears moments later. She felt as though she might burst from her skin, so anxious was she to have her reunion. Is she with you? That familiar voice, and the hope in it. The knowing that her sister had missed her just as much as she'd been missed, that she was just as eager for them to be together again. Tears sprang to Beatrice's eyes. She couldn't stay away any longer, no matter whether or not Derek wished to spend more time alone with his wife. They had all the time in the world to be together, and he'd had her all this long time, while Beatrice could only yearn for Marjorie and question whether she'd survived. She tiptoed into the room, 
peering around the doorway to the large carved wooden bed with its many pillows against which her sister rested. Marjorie, she whispered, almost unable to believe what she saw. It was her. It was really her, at last. Loved, cared for, looked after. Beatrice. Marjorie held out her arms, sobs racking her by the time the two of them fell against each other. It was the fulfillment of her heart's greatest desire, one she'd held on to ever since the day Marjorie first left home. Watching her walk down the road so resolute, her head held high and her shoulders thrown back as she'd marched toward the future. Ever since that morning, she had wished for them to be together again. She had Derek to thank for this moment. And Hugh. And Brock. I thought I'd never see you again, Beatrice wept, kissing her sister's damp cheeks before wrapping her in a hug. I was so afraid for you. I missed you so terribly. You were the only reason I didn't give up when things looked darkest, Marjorie whispered, burying her face in Beatrice's neck. I wanted so much for you, for both of us. It looks as though you found it. She was laughing when she pulled away, holding her sister's face in her hands. It's so good to see you my dearest. I have much to tell you. I have much to tell you. Beatrice laughed through her tears. I'm sorry I couldn't come with them. Oh my darling. Derek lingered in one corner of the room, and Beatrice exchanged a knowing look with him. It's likely for the best you didn't. Why? Marjorie shot Derek a frightened look. What happened? Are Hugh and Brock well? Are they here with you? I lass, Derek murmured. All is well. You've nothing to worry about. We can talk all about it, Beatrice assured her, holding her hands. And you can tell me why you never wrote to me, to at least let me know you were alive. Marjorie's sigh was almost comically loud. I knew you were going to bring that up. Why shouldn't I? I was all but ready to mourn your passing sister. I wanted to send word, but we had a lot of trouble at first. And so did we. Beatrice argued. But I would have found a way ease your mind. Derek cleared his throat. Perhaps I should leave the two of you alone, he suggested, easing his way from the room. One of you at a time is difficult enough. Together? You may be too much for me. They had passed much of the day together, Beatrice lying beside Marjorie in the large bed, while they poured their hearts out to each other, and caught up on what the other had been through. It was like being girls again. Warm fresh air flowed in through the open windows, bringing with it the scent of heather and pine. The sky beyond seemed to be made of soft lamb's wool, the clouds wispy and light. Marjorie was able to lie in bed and admire that sky, and the proud majestic Grampian Mountains in the distance. It was a beautiful land, to be sure. Just the sort of place she'd always imagined them living one day. And so, Beatrice finished whispering as she came to the end of the tale, that was that. He's no longer a threat to anyone, and I suppose the family name will die with him. Between us, I do not believe the world will be the worse for it. My goodness. Marjorie's fingers laced with Beatrice's squeezing tight. You could have been killed. I wasn't, remember? Do not upset yourself over much. I'm here with you now. And you had adventures of your own and dangers. That I had. She giggled softly then sighed. Perhaps we spent so much of our lives doing nothing more than sitting by mother's bed, an entire lifetime's worth of adventure caught up to us at once. It was as good an explanation as any, Beatrice supposed. Who would have imagined it? Would you have? Marjorie asked. Beatrice chuckled. I can't say that I would have. The next time I long for adventure, I believe I'll be a bit more specific in what I wish for. There are all sorts of adventures, after all. One in which I don't fear for my life would be a start. I. Marjorie giggled. I. You sound like a Scot already. I suppose it's inevitable. Wait and see. You'll be calling women lasses before long. I don't know about that. Beatrice sighed, began playing with the ends of Marjorie's hair, winding and unwinding the long braid which lay coiled over the pillows. 
Keen as always, her sister took note of the change in her voice. What is it? Why do you sound so sad of a sudden? A soft smile touched the corners of her mouth. You know, it's been a long time since anyone asked of my troubles. I told them to Cecil time and again. I cried against his neck and soaked his mane when I felt worst. He was wonderful to talk to. But you know what he never did. Speak back. Only to ask questions which make me uncomfortable. Beatrice nodded. I'm sorry, I only wondered. It's not your fault. I would ask you the same if I saw you suddenly look disappointed or sad. Marjorie waited a long time, while silence spread over the chambers, and the only sound was that of the birds singing beneath the open window and the laughter of manor house workers outside. How different it was from Randall's manor, Beatrice noted. Everyone sounded happy, glad to be there, glad to be at their work. From what she'd seen already, Philip Duncan was a far different and better man and laird. Beatrice's mouth didn't seem to want to open in order to explain her feelings. To do so would mean to admit a great many things she did not feel comfortable admitting. But this was her sister, the one person she'd always been able to bear her heart to. Regardless of where they were or Marjorie's condition, that would never change. I'm glad to be here, Beatrice whispered still working and unworking the braid which sat between them. Truly I am. I couldn't have imagined anything as wonderful as this, it's far beyond my dreams and I've had a long time in which to dream. I know what you mean. Something changed in me while making the journey here I suppose. She dropped the braid, frustrated with herself for being unable to speak the full truth. I'm uncertain what it is I want to do, or where it is I want to live. I have a lovely house in the village outside the manor house, Marjorie was quick to point out and I'm certain Philip would allow you to live there as well. You would never need to be far from me again. I don't want to be far from you. A soft sound came from her mouth. Ah? I think I'm beginning to see. What do you think you're beginning to see? Beatrice asked, irritation plain in her voice. That you don't know if you want to stay nearby or elsewhere. That you might be happier somewhere else. Dearest. She craned her neck, searching for Beatrice's eyes, and wouldn't continue until their gaze is locked. Go wherever you wish to go. With whomever you wish to go. Beatrice stiffened, surprised. Marjorie chuckled. Do you know how you sound when you speak of him? When you told me the story of what happened to bring you here, he was your hero. Your champion. You put yourself in great danger to free him from Randall. He placed himself in danger to rescue you as well. It's only natural that you care for Brock. I certainly never expected to. Does he care for you? Beatrice blushed. I see. Her sister giggled, wrapping her arms around one of Beatrice's and resting her head on her shoulder. How exciting for you. He doesn't want a wife. Did he tell you this? She shook her head. No. He doesn't have to. What makes you think he doesn't then? If he hasn't spoken the words? He wants the sort of life he had before. With Derek, while they work together. You ought to see him on the ship, she explained, her voice wistful when she remembered. He looked so dashing. Proud. Thrilled. I could never take him from that, and he would never want to leave it. Why does it have to be one way or another? Why can't it be both ways? You always were an optimist, Beatrice murmured, resting her head against her sister's. It's the reason you arrived here, because you were an optimist about your chances of success. Yes, Marjorie whispered. And look where it got me. Perhaps I make better sense than you think. Chapter 29 What do you plan to do then? Philip and Jake looked to Brock, expectation on their faces. You won't be with us much longer, I wager, knowing how eager you were to get back to your business concerns, the laird added. Aye, that is true. Brock waited until Sarah finished examining the healing wound across his chest and down his torso. It still stung from time to time but over a week had passed since Randall had opened him up. 
You'll be all right. It looks as though you were well cared for. Was it his imagination, or was she smiling in a knowing fashion? What did she know? I was, he confirmed, sliding the tunic back down until he was covered. And I got lucky. The man was too enthused over the idea of killing me to put any real force behind his strike. He might have been intent on dragging things out, come to think of it. You served him well, Jake muttered, his eyes dark. Aye. He deserved what he got, Philip added. I do believe you should spend at least a few days with us, Sarah advised. Rest. Regain your strength after such a long journey. You'll have another few days of hard riding ahead of you before reaching Kirkordy, after all. She was smiling again in that knowing way. Who had told her whatever it was she'd heard? He knew she'd already treated Hugh's shoulder, which appeared to have healed as well as his own wound had, as well as Derek. I have quite a bit I need to tend to, he counted. Yes. I know you do. She all but winked as she left the room, humming to herself. Women. What was that about? Jake asked, looking to his brother. Philip merely shrugged, looking as lost as the others. If there's one thing I've learned about my wife it's not to ask such questions. It was a beautiful day, the morning after their arrival. Brock had spent much of the previous day resting, as per Sarah's strict orders. Resting and waiting for her. Looking for her. It made sense that Beatrice would spend all the time she could with Marjorie, who he hadn't yet seen since returning. It wasn't his place to interrupt, especially when the two of them had so much to talk about. He'd heard laughter coming from down the corridor more than once and was glad. Though in his heart, he wanted to be the one to make her laugh that way. There was still a sadness about her, the same sadness he'd seen back in Silleth before he'd left her at the inn. As though a wall existed between them. Even though he'd declared his love for her, though they'd spent countless hours talking quietly the way he'd seen his friends do with their wives, even though he'd kissed her and held her in his arms, the wall was still present. The sadness still in her eyes, in her voice. He knew not the words to use nor how to ask what it was that made her sad. It had been difficult enough to express his love, and then he'd been certain he was falling short, that he sounded daft and clumsy. How could he bring himself to ask her why she seemed to pull away from him, when he couldn't find a way to tell her that she was his entire world? He finally understood what he'd never understood before. His friends seemed happy, besotted with their brides. He'd only thought he knew why they seemed to forget the things which had once mattered more than anything. Especially Derek. Not that he'd do what Derek did. He wouldn't give up being active in the shipping business. He had loved it before he loved her. It was all he knew, the only thing he'd ever done. How could he hope to provide for a wife without a way to make his living? But if she didn't wish to be part of his life, of that life? Was that what upset her so? He splashed his face with water from the basin in his chambers and put on a clean tunic and trousers. It was a relief having clean clothing at his disposal, and to look forward to the morning meal prepared by the cook. Even so, he was eager to be on his way. To start building something for himself. It would be nothing without her. She was all that was on his mind as he walked down the stairs. Perhaps they would cross paths that morning, she had to eat sometime. She wasn't downstairs, though Dalla and Heather were. They greeted him happily, cheerfully. Heather looked him up and down. You're looking well. We had a fright when Beatrice described how you'd been wounded. Beatrice had spoken with all of them, it seemed. Everyone but him. He looked about himself. Have you seen her this morning? he asked, hoping to sound as though it mattered little. Did Heather know her smile was so like her sister's? She finished her meal early and was going out for a walk when I came down. Suddenly, he didn't care so much for eating. His stomach tied itself in knots. He told himself the lasses weren't laughing behind him as he walked away, but it wasn't true. It seemed everyone knew there was something between them and found it amusing. Was this how the others felt when they'd first fallen in love? As though everyone around them whispered and chuckled to each other. The slightest questions suddenly had deeper meaning. 
There were more important things to consider, he reminded himself, as he stepped out into the fresh morning air. Such as what he would say to the lass if he managed to catch up to her. Chapter 30 It was a fine morning. The sort of morning which made her feel glad to be alive. So many fresh, fragrant scents overwhelmed her as she walked along the edge of the lake, her shoes and stockings in one hand so she might enjoy the fresh rich soil and the dew-dampened grass beneath her feet. She didn't know such richness, such fragrance existed until reaching the Grampians. She had once wondered about the trees which grew in the woods between the farm and the church, how old they were and how much they'd seen. They were mere twigs, compared to the majesty of the pines which grew on either side of the valley in which she strolled. She settled herself at the edge of the lake, carefully arranging her skirts before sinking into the thick, lush grass which seemed to extend endlessly in all directions. Frogs sang all around her, their voices overlapping in a joyful noise which brought a smile to her lips. Before her sat the lake, clear and smooth as glass. Only the occasional bubbling of a fish, as it reached the surface, disturbed the water. Otherwise, there wasn't so much as a hint of breeze to cause a ripple. She picked up a small stone and tossed it in, watching in fascination as ripples extended from the place where the stone went under. Another, then another, the ripples sometimes hitting each other and causing a new set of tiny waves to form. She might have sat there for hours watching, but for the sound of approaching footsteps. Her back was to the house, leaving her unable to see who'd come from inside, but there was only one man who would take the trouble to seek her out. He slowed down, as though he was uncertain whether or not to join her. She wasn't entirely certain whether she wanted him to, either. Every moment spent with him was joy which would only result in pain later, after they parted. It would only make the pain worse if they sat together there, watching the tiny bubbles appear on the surface of the water. And yet she yearned for him more than she would have believed possible before meeting him. Just his nearness would be enough, sitting beside her. She needed nothing more. And so much more, all at once. More than just his love for the moment, right then and there. She needed him always, wanted the assurance that he wouldn't forget her at the earliest opportunity. Do you wish to be left alone, lass? Would you mind company? She smiled, still facing away from him. His voice was a gentle rumble. Please. The morning is far too beautiful not to be enjoyed. When he sat beside her, she continued looking out at the lake. Isn't it beautiful, she murmured. The few billowing clouds which passed above reflected in the water, as though the sky had come down to earth. I've seen more beautiful than this. Where, she asked, almost daring him to come up with an answer. He smiled. Seated beside me for one. She'd fallen into his trap, and couldn't help but laugh in spite of herself. Well done. It's true lass. I wouldn't say it if it weren't. Thank you. She looked away, cheeks flushing. He stared at her, as though trying to commit her to memory. Because he knew they'd be parting ways. How is your sister? She beamed, her heart lightening. Wonderful. Not feeling very well sometimes, but wonderful. We talked late into the night. I heard you laughing from time to time. It was good to hear. Have I thanked you for bringing me here? Truly. You don't need to. But I want to. Thank you. If it weren't for you, we would never have seen each other again. It was so much less than she wanted to say, but she wouldn't embarrass him. She wouldn't leave unhappy, uncomfortable memories between them. You're welcome. I would do it again. She smirked. Again? Truly? Why not? It meant meeting you, lass. And making you happy. He shrugged as though it were the most natural thing in the world. Didn't he know he was breaking her heart? She turned away, a lump in her throat. What is it? he demanded, an edge in his voice now. Tell me. Why do you turn away? Do you wish we had never meant anything to each other? Don't you? she asked, standing and gathering her things. I'm sure there are plenty of things which need your attention before you leave. Things more important than me. 
You should get to them. Is that what you're thinking? He followed her as she hurried off, still barefooted. That I'm eager to get away from ye? Well? Aren't you? Please if that's the case I beg you to go. Leave me alone. Her voice broke, emotion overtaking her, and she turned her ankle on a stone in her haste to get away. It sent her sprawling. Beatrice. Beatrice lass. He caught up to her, helping her sit up. She grimaced when he touched the ankle she twisted. Why do you insist on making things difficult for yourself? He asked, sighing. I would appreciate it if you would keep your opinions silent, she replied with all the dignity she could muster. It did little, as tears spilled onto her cheeks. He sat again, facing her. Why do you think I plan to leave you behind? What gave you that idea? She blinked hard, striving to clear the blurry image his face had become. She had to see if he was sincere. He sounded as though he might be, but she hardly wanted to believe it. You never said you wouldn't, she pointed out. I did say I love you, did I not? She nodded. So? Is that not enough? Her mouth fell open, when she managed to close it she shook her head. No. That's not enough. What is enough then? What do you need to hear? A laugh burst from her throat. I don't know. A good beginning, might be for you to tell me you don't intend to leave me behind and forget me. I do not intend to leave you behind and forget you. What is your intention then? He rubbed the back of his neck, a rueful smile breaking over his face. Hardly the way I wanted to do this lass, but perhaps it's for the best. I don't know how to speak of these things, and now I see it's gotten to the point where you misunderstood my intentions. Which are what? His words came out in a rush. To marry ye lass. If you'll have me. To ask ye to come with me to Kirkordy, and help make a home and a business together. Her mouth fell open once again. It was as if the entire world had stopped spinning, and everything went still and clear. She could see every hair on his head, every bit of stubble on his cheeks. The needles of the pine trees far off behind him. She felt every blade of grass beneath her hands. Everything. He wanted to marry her. He wanted her to come with him. The only thing which kept me from asking was the not knowing how you'd feel about such an arrangement, living apart when I had to sail with a shipment, being alone when my work was busiest. I should have found out, rather than telling myself a lass would never want to live that sort of life. You don't know the sort of life I want to live, she whispered. Which is exactly what I'm trying to say, he reminded her. I'm terribly awkward, unknowing of how to speak to a lass about the things which are most important. I'm sorry lass. I should have known that was what upset you so. You want to marry me. She had to say it out loud, had to prove to herself that it was true. He rose to his knees, moving closer. I lass. I wish for ye to be my wife. I canna imagine life without ye. I can't imagine it without you either, she admitted. He took her face in his hands and kissed her, and she kissed him back as hard as she could. How was it possible to be so happy? She wasn't certain how much more she could take. You know, he whispered once the kiss was finished, their faces still close. It's a good thing, for there will be something waiting for you in Kirkordy before long. I'm not certain how I would get it here, though I would certainly have tried if needed. What? She smiled, thinking how bold it was for him to make such arrangements without having asked her to marry him. A certain friend of yours who I knew you would miss. He stroked her hair, her cheek. Deacon Eddard promised to arrange things on his end, and I gave him as much as I believed it would cost to carry the animal on the next ship to Kirkordy. The animal? She pulled back, eyes darting over his face in an effort to find the meaning she hoped for. Cecil. Is it Cecil? He laughed heartily. I lass. I thought you'd want a horse of your own, and I was certain none other would do. He can live a life of leisure, if you wish. Whatever you prefer. I didn't want you two to be apart. She let out a gusty sob, 
throwing her arms about his neck and burying her face in his shoulder as she wept in gratitude and joy and disbelief. He chuckled close to her ear, his breath tickling her skin. I take it you're coming with me then, when I leave? She could always come back in time for the baby's birth, and Marjorie could visit, once she was strong enough to travel. They had discussed it the night before, and decided it was time for both of them to begin lives of their own, even if it meant being apart. Beatrice nodded, craning her neck to look up at the man she loved. I. I'm coming with you, my love. And I'll be your wife, and be proud to be your wife. He laughed, wrapping his strong arms around her waist. A fair attempt. I'll have you talking like a Scot before long, lass. Wait and see. She would gladly wait and see, even if it took the rest of her life. I hope you've enjoyed this latest production. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.